Translation for simultaneous translation into Spanish is available at the bottom of the screen under interpretation. And I believe I've made all the board members co-hosts, but I'll go through and if I missed you, I will get you. And then key staff who are presenting tonight are also um, uh, co-hosts so they can share their screens if they need to. All right, well then I will call the board meeting to order at 5.01 p.m. Uh, we have all seven board members present. I do not see any of our student board members here tonight. Sarah, you can correct me if I am mistaken, but I just see our seven um, elected board members here. So I will ask everybody if they choose to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, place your hand over your heart, repeat after me. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the Republic. Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice, and justice for all. Thank you all very much. Um, it's the roll call that is our pledge, approval of the agenda. Before I ask for a motion to approve the agenda, I will repeat what Dr. Moore just said. Um, the good students at Roosevelt need a little more rehearsal time before they present uh, their, their presentation for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. birthday celebration. So we will reschedule that for February. So that being taken off the agenda, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? Richard? So moved. Second by Craig. Any other comments on the agenda? Wonder, we'll do a quick roll call vote. Uh, Craig? That's a yes, thumbs up. Maria? Is uh, approval of agenda, Maria? Just a thumbs up. Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Richard? Yes. Keith? Just thumbs up. Jennifer? Yes. Lori? Yes. And I'm a yes. The agenda is approved with that one modification. Wonderful. Which brings us to consent. Does anybody have anything from consent? It's a very short consent, but does anybody have anything they need to pull um, from consent? Seeing nothing, I will ask for a motion to approve consent as submitted. Second, first motion by Richard. There is one public comment for consent. Okay, so we'll do our motion and then we can do our public comment. So uh, we have a motion by Richard, we have a second by Craig, and now we will move to public comment. Thank you, Sarah. So Lori, can you introduce the public comment? You no, know, I could if I was- <laughs> If we can find it. Here, hold on a second. Uh, you know what, Sarah, could you just, since I don't have it- Sure, uh, right? the public comment request I was sending uh, submitted by Nikki Kohlhoff. So let me find. Okay, here we go. I've got it up now. Okay, so uh, she's the only speaker. So Nikki Kohlhoff, you'll have three minutes to address the board on item D1I. I guess we could have just pulled this one, but it's a short, short yeah. calendar. Okay, yeah, I'm just hoping that the board will ask staff what this is for before voting on it. Um, it says $70,000 to the bond advisor. So what you all and we the public need to know before it's approved is, is this for another issuance of the current bond? And oh, it, it's an extension of the contract through June 30, 2022, which aligns with an election cycle. So is this paying them um, to extend their current contract to issue bonds under the current bond from 2018 or the prior ones? Um, does it in any way allow the district to work with them on a future bond? Um, and so what is it for? Um, and if it's a current issuance, what is the issuance for? What projects is it paying for? I'm not sure how you guys could vote for that without knowing the answers to those questions. Thanks. Thank you. Um, can I ask, uh, so uh, Melody Kennedy, uh, could you uh, provide the guidance for that uh, comment? Sure, no problem. Good evening, board. Um, this is um, with the ISOM advisors and um, the folks that help us with all of our COPs and what have you. It's really um, an extension of what we were doing for the bonds or for the COP and the selling of the bonds in the past and anything that, that will go between now and June 30th of 2021. So it's, 
it's kind of business as usual, um, helping us take care of the things that we normally take care of. Um, some of the things that they're continuing to do is is um, doing our filings and reportings for us to, to the county assessors and to the state of California and what have you. Terrific. Are there any further questions for staff concerning consent? Seeing none, I'll ask for a roll call to approve consent. Uh, Craig. That's a thumbs up. Maria. Yes. Yes. Uh, Richard. Yes. Keith. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Lori. Yes. And I'm a yes. So consent is moved seven unanimously, which brings us to our study session. And I assume I will introduce Dr. Drotti, who will introduce Dr. Mora, but I'll let you guys take it away. Thank you. Dr. Mora will take over from here and then I'm a, I'm a detail end of the presentation, so. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Drotti. Good evening, board president, members of the board, Dr. Drotti, cabinet and guests. Um, this evening, we are coming before you to provide an update on the implementation of our project-based learning action plan. That is a response to our interests to address the learning and interest needs of our students. We are doing this through um, the identification of multiple um, ways of implementing project-based learning within our existing practice. And we know that through doing this, we are creating more meaningful, relevant, and real world experiences through the incorporation of project-based learning. So tonight's presentation, um, we are going to provide an example of the synergy that has taken place within our learning community. The synergy that um, started with an idea, that started with our superintendents um, committee on project-based learning that really was grounded on, on our commitment to um, minimize and ultimately eliminate the opportunity and the, the opportunity and engagement gap that we've identified. And all of these teams came together with that clear focus, that common focus of creating learning opportunities to engage our students in more authentic and thoughtful and meaningful, relevant um, learning experiences. So our teams this evening highlight how we can work together to address the instructional strategies, redesign our curriculum, partner with the industry and community, and really leverage the ability and the opportunity to redesign our facilities and our physical environment to authentically engage and invigorate not only our students, but also our staff. So for me, it is a great pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Devon Smith, our learning and innovation coordinator, as well as our um, SAMO High personalized project-based learning pathway team, Ms. Jessica Risch and Ms. Nicole Nicodemus, and also our SAMO High leadership team, Dr. Shelton and Ms. Lauren Polly Sheehan, who are here to be able to share with all of you the work that is currently happening and the design that is taking place around the, the various programs that we want to bring to and expand at our main campus. So with that, I hand it over to Dr. Smith, who will then continue, continue with this conversation. Hello, everyone. Um, greetings to President Keene and to all of the board, to Dr. Jotty and to his cabinet and all listening in. I'm going to be sharing my screen now. Hopefully, we can all see that. Okay. Fantastic. Um, thank you, Dr. Mora, for your introduction. Um, again, my name is Dr. Devon Smith and I coordinate learning and innovation for the district. I am so happy, so proud to be part of this work. And um, as Dr. Moore mentioned, we have a great team uh, to present some um, updates on what is happening in the world of project-based learning, specifically uh, with our PPL, PPBL pathway and our academies. I wanna begin just by uh, reminding us that in 2016, our district hired Dr. Pedro Nagera to conduct a report 
a study on the district's practices and to uh, address and reduce racial and socioeconomic disparities. Dr. Nagara provided a report to the board. And in this report, he stated that for over 20 years, the district has undertaken a number of initiatives to address and reduce racial and socioeconomic disparities in student achievement. However, for a variety of reasons, none of these efforts had produced disparate or had reduced disparities in student achievement or produced significant or sustainable improvements in academic outcomes. And so from there, in response, our superintendent led the effort for the district to expand its vision uh, through this common message. And rooted in the district's mission are PBL, PBL initiatives and programs and activities all seek to ultimately create these three things, college and career ready students through highly engaging, relevant and real world instruction, socially responsive students through community-based projects and academically rigorous opportunities that call for students to ideate, analyze, synthesize, fail fast, reflect and then revise, and then collaborate to address real world problems. And then we come to our um, four project-based learning tenets. So three years ago, the board gave direction for the implementation of our project-based learning outlined in what we now call these four PBL tenants. And these tenants boil down to four things, uh, a district-wide effort to train teachers in PBL, which has been going great, um, and to focus also on restructuring and the support of our career technical education program, also known as CTE. And then the creation of high-tech integrated instructional labs which we uh, commonly refer to as the capstone program, but most recently we will know them as our academies. And then uh, finally, our SAMO High personalized project-based learning pathway, which is located at the Obama Center. That is currently in its two year, in its second year, excuse me. And tonight, our study session will be focused on tenets three and four. So our intention is to return at a later date and we will present happily on tenants one and two. Um, so we will now begin with um, our uh, PPBL pathway. And to remind us, we're gonna be hearing from that pathway, which is a program of SAMO High and also our SAMO High Academies. So regarding our PPBL pathway, again, our personalized project-based learning pathway, it's in, its, it's in the direct fulfillment of the board's uh, direction from three years ago. And we theorize that this program, when it's fully mature, will deepen students' learning, lower the numbers on the main campus at Samo High, provide a district center of excellence in PBL instruction, and become a model for other districts that may desire to create similar pathways. So we are joined tonight by Jessica Risch, principal, and Nicole Nicodemus, the vice principal of Samo High's personalized project-based learning pathway. And they will uh, highlight the dynamic instruction that is occurring there um, at the pathway, highlights from the first semester, recruiting strategies and progress, and also implementation plans. So I turn it over now to Jessica Risch. Thank you, Devon. Good evening, board members, superintendents, cabinet, and public audience. Thank you, board members and district audience office for dedicating your precious time and supporting our students during their individual presentations of learning, also called POLs, at the end of first semester. Uh, we appreciated your reflections at the end of the late night December board meeting about the powerful learning experiences you felt you witnessed for teenagers during these POLs. And thank you for welcoming us back tonight to share about our three semesters and growing with Samuel High's personalized project-based learning pathway also known as PPBL. As Devon shared, Nicole Nicodemus and I are the co-administrators of PPBL, and we're excited to highlight tonight student and staff examples of the positive impact of blending student-initiated learning through interest projects, as well as teacher-designed interdisciplinary curricular projects, all supported by community mentors and guest experts all with an embedded social emotional curriculum. So as you requested, we will also give updates tonight on the recruitment process for the 21-22 school year 
where we look forward to having ninth, 10th and 11th graders at PPBL. And here's a two minute video created as a student parent administrator collaborative project, just one part of our recruitment process. Take a listen. President Barack Obama once said, when we don't pay close attention to the decisions made by our leaders, when we fail to educate ourselves about the major issues of the day, when we choose not to make our voices and opinions heard, that's when democracy breaks down. That's when power is abused. That's when the most extreme voices in our society fill the void that we leave. President Obama challenges us all to learn and speak up. Located on the Michelle and Barack Obama Center for Inquiry and Exploration at Lincoln and Ocean Park, we are the students of Samuel High's personalized project-based learning pathway. And we are working on real world problems to learn about and take action on behalf of the environment and social injustices. Do, learn, thrive. That's the PPBL motto. We learn through hands-on experiences. We use materials to deepen our knowledge, skills, and understanding. We build models, create art, and craft installations for public exhibitions of our group projects. We also host individual presentations of learning at the end of each semester. Learning through interests and internships is a core component of our pathway. What are you curious about? Explore your passions through personal interest projects. Join us in growing career and college skills, getting course credit, and building a network of professionals. As President Obama says, change will not occur if we wait for other persons or some other time. We are the ones we have been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. Join us. Apply today. So starting this week, you will find PPBL student and parent short video postings on social media as part of our campaign to reach out to prospective students. And listen to what Zoe and Ella two of our Pathway students have to say about why PPBL works for them. PPBL matters to me because it really helped me get self-motivated and even though I wasn't the best. Um, last semester, this semester, uh, it's really helped me and especially since my teachers accept late work that's helped me like feel better and not super overwhelmed um i also just really love the people there um so the balances between PBBL and SAMO have actually been really cool. I actually really like it because I can have PPBL for like half of the day and then PE and ceramics the rest of the day. And I think it's actually really nice and I really like it. And yeah. I'm sorry, Jessica, you're muted. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> On this slide, you can see the variety of live Zoom events, emails, and social media testimonials that are designed to reach all families in our Santa Monica Malibu feeder middle schools, as well as residents who are currently attending charter schools, private schools, or are homeschooling. Uh, so we served on a city school charter panel. They ended eighth grade looking at um, options for high school. We have um, presented to all of SMASH already. Jams is coming up and emails have gone to all Malibu Middle School, Lincoln Middle School, Jams and SMASH eighth graders. 
We've had a couple of our virtual Q&A sessions and two more to come. I'm gonna talk about those in just a minute. Next week will be part of the Samo High experience. And then if you go to the website, um, you will see branded brochures, a longer promotional video than what you saw tonight and some other um, featured current pieces. And please follow us on social media um, at those two sites. During our first two years of our pathway, we've brought new SMM USD enrollment by students who are Santa Monica and Malibu residents, but they were attending a variety of West LA uh, charter schools or private schools during middle school. Our enrollment goal for the 21-22 school year is 100 ninth graders. We're in the middle of a pandemic. It's been going on a while. We know this impacts recruitment efforts. And as the understanding of our program grows, we're very hopeful we will reach our enrollment goals. At a minimum for next year, we expect 50 new students. 50 students would still allow us to um, expand creatively the implementation of our program. And we're very fortunate that our current PPBL teachers each have multiple single subject credentials that provide flexibility in our schedule. Uh, we personalize each Q&A session by having a different panel each time. So current students, parents, and staff rotate at each of those Q&A sessions, sharing something that we think works well at PPBL through our lens. And then we answer the pre-submitted questions that come from prospective families when they register for the Zoom Q&A, as well as questions that they pose during the session. In addition, if you want to hear PPBL information through the lens of and narration by PPBL students, there's a slide deck for you posted on our website. Want to hear PPBL information through the lens of and narration by our staff? There's a slide deck for you. We created 13 minute recorded slide decks uh, posted on our website that go over the frequently asked questions. We are a pathway dedicated to multiple learning modalities and we're doing our best in this pandemic virtual only mode uh, to provide multiple modalities for prospective families to learn about the PPBL pathway. Uh, we shared last year's uh, PPBL in-person fall semester, as well as our virtual spring semester instruction and learning highlights with you uh, during our summer presentation to the board. Now Nicole is going to share uh, instruction and learning highlights from this fall's distance learning experience. Thank you, Jessica. Um, it's a joy that I get to highlight this year's learning at PPBL. As you may recall, we launched our first year in 2019 with an immigration project to address social issues that were prevalent in the, in the news at that time. This school year, as a means to develop relationships and build community, we launched with the Social Inequities Project. Through hours of collaboration, our teachers co-taught both the ninth and 10th grade and developed a framework for students to self-select a social inequity that mattered to them while teaching students about COVID through science and math lessons, determining credible sources with media literacy lessons, and how to develop a solution to address the problem. Some of our students were even able to take action on their solution. Two of our PPBL ninth grade students, Gabby and Rowan, sewed and distributed masks for hospitals and as they have a passion for the ukulele and singing, created an original song. Let's take a listen. DJ Smith, you'd be so kind. It seems so long ago when we were free to go be with our friends and family We were told to stay inside Be six feet apart at all times Because if we do COVID will be gone so that's actually a three minute song that definitely goes through safety precautions and things that you should do in order to stay safe um, during these uh, during the pandemic. But 
I can go on and on about this project, but I also want to share student voice. So um, let's hear from Milana about her experience. Uh, my favorite project from the fall semester was probably the very first one, how COVID affected people and their lives. My project was about mental health and it was very interesting to learn and make. I've learned a lot about mental health and how it's affected by the COVID. It is important to know since a lot of people go through this and they are hurting inside. But it's okay to not be okay. And if you are not okay, you are gonna go through this. So in addition to our larger um, interdisciplinary project, many projects happen in all of our content areas. The application of whatever standards students are building mastery on then gets applied to a real world context. For now, I will highlight two of the math mini projects. So in Algebra 1, students completed a project for linear relationships videoing and mapping a walk to a destination. They recreated their journey onto a distance versus time graph and found the equations for each section of their journey. In Algebra 2, students completed a project on determining the equation of the arch of their own foot and understanding the purpose and needs of running and walking based on their own foot. So as some of you were able to witness during our POLs or our presentations of learning in December, you heard highlights from virtual mentorships that happened even during distant learning. Students explored mentorships in a wide range of student-driven interests, including organic farming, screenwriting, youth docent at the Autry Museum, animal-friendly architecture, painting techniques, and educating students with visual impairments. Learning Through Interest, or LTI for short, is the new course the board approved last summer that can be offered at all SMUSD high school programs. While it's one of my favorite elements of our, pro our pathway to talk about, it's more powerful for you to hear about it directly from our students. PPL is important to me because hopefully by the end of um, my time at PPL, I'll have um, some mentorships and experiences under my belt that I can put on my college application that will help me get into better colleges, as well as I'm very excited to go use the campus when we're allowed to go to school, because I heard it's a very great new campus that allows you to do many different things than you wouldn't be able to do in regular school. And I'm very excited for the experiences I hope I can have in the PBL course. Yeah, that, that's why PBL is important. PBL matters to me because it gives all the students the sort of freedom to do what they'd actually like to do professionally in life a little bit earlier and to make sure that it's actually what they want to do. And if it is, they get a head start. And if there isn't, then they can totally just try something else. It also gives us like a safety net to fall back on if any of our endeavors didn't come out the way we expected or they didn't work the way we wanted them to, we have somewhere to go and a support system. Um, yeah. PBBL really matters to me because um, it lets me do a lot of the stuff that I want to do um, and I can do it on, I can explore my interests on school time um, and I can get support so I can seek out people who know what they're doing um, and then also just kind of experiment with what I like to do um, and how I can achieve my goals in the future um, and that sort of thing. And you get a lot of support from the teachers um, and the administration uh, to kind of achieve your goals and push past your boundaries. Hello. Um, first off, why is PPL? I don't know. Um, I think honestly because it gives me a really great idea of um, what my career path is going to look like. And how it might affect me. Um, it overall just it shows me what my life might be, which can be very exciting. So in our chemistry classes, students were able to take a deep dive into the application of nuclear chemistry by self-selecting an area of nuclear chemistry that interested them. Students then conducted research 
formed a position and created an essay, a pamphlet, a video, or wrote an op-ed for their argument for or against the use of the nuclear chemistry selected. In our science courses, students continue to conduct lab experiments at home, like our ninth grade students, our biology students growing sourdough to understand and measure the impact of variables on the fermentation process. They also made bread from their experiment. Um, we hope the student testimonials you've seen and heard tonight show the reflective element of our learning. Here is a student video from PPBL ninth grader Angelina, who reminds us of the power of student agency and hands-on experiences within their learning. And we hope it gives you a smile thinking about a positive trend that spread during the time of quarantine. A project from the fall semester that I really enjoyed was the sourdough project in biology because it was really hands-on and we got to have control of the whole process and make our own bread. Like we got to change a variable and I changed a type of flour and we got to see how that altered the taste or how it cooked, the texture. It was just really hands-on and I really enjoyed that part. Thank you for hosting us tonight to update you about how we are informing and welcoming prospective PPBL families, as well as to share with you current highlights um, that hold true to our PPBL pathway philosophy with virtual learning practices for now. We know there will be a Q&A at the end of the presentation tonight. So back to you, Dr. Smith. Thank you so much, Jessica and Nicole for your uh, presentation. Um, we are now going to transition over to um, our, uh, our next presentation about the academy. So like the PPBL pathway, the Samo High academies are in direct fulfillment of the board's direction from three years ago. And we prioritize that this program, when it's mature, will deepen students learning through integrated instruction, leverage real world experiences through local industry, leverage local expertise through a capstone learning experience and along with CTE, provide multiple entrance and exit points for our students. So we are joined tonight by Dr. Antonio Shelton, who is the principal of Samo High and Lauren Polly Sheehan, who is O-House principal of Samo High and uh, coordinates CTE and career programs there. Um, they will be reporting on the innovative instructional design of the academies, the uh, implementation plan, and also share current process or progress. So I'm gonna stop sharing because Dr. Shelton will be sharing uh, his presentation directly. So we'll transition over to Dr. Shelton. Good evening, everyone. I'm just gonna set this up real quick. We're gonna start off this evening, Lauren and I are gonna start off this evening just to share with you a little bit about everything that has happened so far on our campus. If you are seeing the screen that I am seeing right now, hopefully you are. Can I get some nods out there? Everybody's good? All right. So um, on this screen, you see a big hole, but that hole is no longer, if you have uh, driven along uh, the freeway, you now see a beautiful building and Along with that beautiful building, we will have an entrance that will commemorate some of the past that we have had here on campus. So looking west, looking east, you see how we will enter our campus. And I'm speaking to this because I want everybody to walk with me through a little journey here. This evening, we would like to start off by saying thank you uh, for providing our, our campus with a beautiful new space for learning. Also, a space that will incorporate what will be known as Freedom Walk. If you just look at that picture and imagine that this is opened up, no longer will there be a green uh, fence there, but this will be where our, camp our students will be entering campus and we will call this area Freedom Walk. Along Freedom Walk, you will see a series of flags uh, representing a diverse group of people um, along with some quotes on, on the poles, as the light poles, as you walk down Freedom Walk. And these are just some of the poles uh, with the people that will be hanging from them, just to commemorate what has been our history. At one point, we had a wall called the Peace Wall. 
Um, and that wall is no longer there. But we want to commemorate not only the wall, but the tree as well that's there. Um, and how do we go about doing that is making this entire space that was once the Science Quad Freedom Walk. Here are a series of pictures and quotes that you will see when you enter our campus to ensure that we uh, continue with what our past um, and, and bridge our past with our present. Um, we think it's important um, as you enter our campus, you will see how we have continued to bridge our past with our present by creating a walk way to incorporate leaders and the peace wall. And I'm just sharing a couple of the pictures that you will see as you walk. And here we come to the area where the peace, the tree, which we believe is important and has, we have kept the tree. Uh, where the green fence is now, the peace wall was there. What we're going to do is we're going to, here's a rendition of the peace wall. You can see a little bit of the picture of the wall within um, this commemorative, um, uh, I, I, I can't even tell you the name of it right now, but there will be a somewhat of a plaque. As you come on our campus, we have these about seven to eight foot tall uh, Samuel High direction um, stations. We will add another one and I will write something that talks about our past and how it's connected to our present and the importance of the peace wall and the tree and why um, this area is important to Samo High. And here's just a rendition of what that will look like for our future. Um, so that is just the beginning of what everything will have look like here on our campus. As we begin to talk about the new and the old, I, I must say there are a couple of things that we have to connect to ensure that we have a smooth transition. Um, you'll see here today, uh, here are a couple of pictures that set the stage for why we believe it's important not only uh, to have uh, allow kids to exercise their freedom of education and emphasize the importance of their voice, but also to look at their needs as far as learning is concerned and creating an atmosphere, an educational atmosphere that has space to support this learning, this instruction and this collaboration. And when we look at these current spaces, one of them is an English class in our history building. The other is at our digital design classroom um, in uh, our history building. And in these current spaces, they don't necessarily accommodate our students. They don't necessarily give them, as we talked about the freedom that you walk in on, uh, uh, on Freedom Walk, that's not the freedom that we experience in these classrooms currently. Um, we believe the infrastructure for the digital design, for example, um, is not there. Um, when we look at our film classroom currently, um, here's a picture of that. Uh, currently our students not only um, try to work in this space, but they also try to film in this, this same space. Um, and when they wanna do a production, they go to City TV to do that production. That is not done here on campus. And as you look at that, we wanna create and have a space where our kids can be innovative, creative and productive as well as being collaborative. And it's difficult to do so in a space that looks like this. But what we wanna do is create a new space. We wanna have a space where our, our kids, we don't create limits for them, that they're able to move around freely that they're able to engage in conversation and produce high level items that will be able to uh, take them to the next level uh, in their educational experience. And how do we do this? We believe that we can do this through the academies and also the new space that we're getting. We're not trying to recreate the wheel. What we're doing is growing and enhancing the programming that we already have here on our campus through the academies. I'm gonna show you a video um, that Lauren and I uh, prepared so that you can see what we're talking about as far as the academies are concerned. Hello, I'm Dr. Sheldon, principal here at Samo High. Samo High is a very diverse school community with many different learning needs to be addressed. We have all the same issues like everyone. Lauren, I can't see the time. video. Strive to build strong instructional programming to address the needs of our students. By offering students options, they can see that what they are learning is relevant beyond the walls of our high school. 
and this is key when trying to engage students. Can you not see the, the video? Yeah, no, we, we just see, see we see you. <laughs> yeah. oh, it, it's the video, it's the video. But we don't, we only see you and yeah, it's still. It's editing choice, they're gonna get to it's it. Yeah, right yeah. This is, the is, is the video a slide that says Sam High Academy program with a picture of you or is there an actual video video? That's, that's the video. Okay. Let's, let's see, let's see if, if, if everything's okay. Sorry. Now we talked in the beginning of it, okay? Dr. Shelton, have we lost the audio? No, I was muted. Maybe oh. that's the reason. Oh, okay. Okay. You want to try this again? <laughs> Programming to address the needs of our students by offering students options, they can see that what they are learning is relevant beyond the walls of our high school. And this is key when trying to engage students in learning. It is our goal to be innovative within a large comprehensive high school, such as Samo High. I want to support the integration of academies that will allow students to gain experiences in law, government, and public policy, Project Lead the Way Engineering and Computer Science, Business, Media Arts, and Health and Wellness. In these academies, students will move through curriculum as a group. The academies will prepare students for college and career. The academies will also share with students the academic and technical abilities to succeed in college. The academies create an engaging curriculum where students apply academics to real world issues and situations through project based learning, internships and job shadowing. The academies will place value on life skills, teaching students to work collaboratively think critically, and solve problems, which is as important as teaching them academic knowledge. I believe the academies will improve student achievement and provide equal access. We will allow admission of all students, regardless of their academic ability. All students will have access to the academies beginning in their 11th grade school year. Students collaborate with community mentors to complete projects centered around a yearly theme and publicly present their projects through showcase events. The academy program builds on students' interests by offering hands-on, relevant, real-world experiences to produce college and career-ready graduates. It is important that we build partnerships with our community and the resources within our community. It is important also that we work with each of our employers, mentors, and post-secondary institutions to create a successful implementation of the academies within our exploration building. Hello, I'm Lauren Polly Sheehan, House Principal at Santa Monica High School. Here is what the academies will look like in practice. Each academy concentration has an English teacher, a marketing teacher, and an academy content teacher. Standards are met for each subject. English standards are taught in research, writing, public speaking, and nonfiction reading. Student activities include selection of nonfiction thematic reading, presenting to a public audience, developing a marketing campaign, and creating a business plan. The Academy program will select a theme each year. Let's look at an example. A yearly theme could be climate change. In the engineering and computer science Academy, students will examine the essential question, how can the engineering design process solve problems in our world? They'll write a research paper on alternative energy challenges and potential in politics. Student project teams might develop themes on how to power a cell phone with a solar battery, how to program a thermostat to draw the least amount of energy. Students in the media arts We'll look at the essential question, 
how we communicate, relate, and appreciate our world through the arts. Their research paper might be, could climate change lead to the end of life on Earth? And student project teams will develop Santa Monica's Inconvenient Truth documentary film, produce a podcast about ways to reduce carbon footprint, produce a coffee table book with beauty and destruction of our South Bay. In the Health and Wellness Academy, students will analyze the essential question, what affects human health? The health and wellness students will work on the effects of global warming on the people of California. Student project teams could start a recycling program in the cafeteria. Sponsor incentive programs with local businesses to offer discounts to patrons who walk or bike to school or work. And do research on what are the best sunscreens to use. Students in the Law, Government, and Public Policy Academy will establish the essential question, what is the role of government? Law and public policy students will write and advocate for climate regulations. They might develop a district policy on reduction of paper in the school district by reducing the purchase of paper textbooks. Or students could work with a local nonprofit lobbying for carbon reduction regulations. Each year, Students will participate in academy festivals. Students will develop a project in teams within their academy. There will be days each grading period with cross academy progress reports and collaborations. Community and employer mentors will work with students at intervals throughout the semester to have a reality check. And there will be a festival at the end of the year featuring the student project. There will be work-based and apprenticeship model opportunities for students as well. Students in the junior year will complete group projects. And in their senior year, students may choose individual projects with a community mentor in a client-based setting or a work experience in an apprenticeship setting. We are excited to see all of the things that come through our SAMO High Academy program. Hello, my name is Brianna Snyder, and I'm a teacher at Santa Monica High School. I teach two sections of Project Lead the Way, PLTW Engineering. One section of the engineering course focuses on circuitry, and the second in the engineering course focuses on a capstone class, which the students get to research a real-world problem and ultimately design and develop a solution. Students in the class present their solution to a panel of experts and get feedback from potential investors. In the past, students in this fourth year senior class have also competed in the Invention Challenge hosted by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory every year. The students in this class have competed against 80 other local high schools and have even gotten first place. This past year, I've also been fortunate enough to be on one of the committees for the phase three planning for the new exploration building, which will house all the future academies. I am overjoyed and thrilled because the Project Lead the Way engineering program will have the opportunity to be one of the exploration building academies. In this planning committee, I've worked with other district members, architects, and other teachers to design a building that is truly advanced a building that we feel will truly elevate learning for all students. The plans for this building have me excited. Despite all of the hardships we have faced during this global pandemic, I am really excited about where education is going and how we are shaping this at Samo High. I know that the exploration building will truly allow students to explore learning in a non-traditional way. This building will foster a place for students to be creative and ultimately, this building will create a safe place for students to collaborate. The potential for this new building is truly endless. I am so excited for the phase three planning, and I can't wait to see what this building will ultimately allow for students in the future. But I wanted to also make it known how truly excited I am as a teacher at Santa Monica High School for this new building. I believe that this new building will allow education at Samo High to change for the better. 
I hope you enjoyed your experience with us as we shared our excitement about the Exploration Building and the academies that will be housed in this beautiful space. This is just the beginning of what I hope will be a success story for students who choose to explore and participate in this innovative and collaborative learning environment. Thank you for sharing your time with us as we embark on this wonderful educational journey to build a strong academic and robust program for all students. I hope to see you and your student as we fully implement all four academies in our new facility. Bye. 2024. So Lauren and I want to, or Miss Polly Sheehan, I'm sorry, Lauren, we want to share with you, how do we get to this point of choosing these specific uh, programs? So Lauren. Good evening, members of the board, Superintendent Dottie and community stakeholders. I am excited to get to share a bit about our academies program at Samo High. It has such great potential and we are thrilled to be on the threshold of entering this new building and new inspirational space for learning. The students in the fall of 2019 were surveyed, both our freshman seminar students and in our Naviance student exit surveys to select from 15 industry sectors, the areas in which they found the most interest for future careers. Based on that student input, we selected these choices for the academies, engineering and computer science, the media arts, law, government and public policy, health and wellness. A number of our students also expressed specific interest in becoming their own entrepreneurs. And so as a component of the Academies program, we will infuse business management and marketing across the board within all of the Academy programs so that students can use the skills in entrepreneurship as they become the inventors, the publishers, the politicians that will infuse that learning in their career pathway. How does it work? Lauren, is this me or you? I can jump in with that. Go ahead. So uh, we will have students engaging in some block time of, of learning. And there will be three teachers within a flexible block that will work in a project-based setting, infusing the curriculum and standards in three different areas, English, their content-specific academy, and business, which is kind of a bonus for our students in that they will be gaining the course credit in three areas while distinctly working toward the standards in three. So in many ways, it is working more deeply but they also are getting a three for two <laughs> uh, when it comes to their graduation credits. This also opens up perhaps more space within the student's schedule to explore other areas of interest and other elective programs. Students will also have the opportunity to participate in co-curricular and extracurricular activities related to their academy program. Some of the examples of those optional enrichment activities might include mock trial, the robotics club, street law, model United Nations, photo club, running with speakers, our film club, 
health occupations, student associations, and a very thriving DECA club, which we have had on hiatus for the last year. And we're excited to bring back to SAMO High with the academies program. And, and I know that some people have, uh, have concerns around conflicts that may arise, you know, um, and that will happen. Um, kids will have to make decisions or choices, but the big piece of this is, as with everything, we have worked with, for instance, in engineering. Every year we have conflict between music or, or an art class. And what we've tried to do is we work with the teacher. Um, we work with the, both teachers to figure out how does the student take on both of these opportunities. And in that process of working out things, it happens for the student. Um, there are times when it doesn't, but the majority of the time it does. And we wanna continue to offer these opportunities and expand these opportunities for all of our students. Um, some areas are specific for certain students, but what we wanna do is have an opportunity that our kids that are right in the middle that may not necessarily, they may not be the sports kids or they may not be the music kids, but they're the kid that they come to school every day and they're trying to find the niche. They're trying to find the piece that just makes them who they are or makes them want to be something in, in a particular area. So we want to get that kid that um, is in the middle of the road that may not have this love or found this love. And we want to have them enrolled in these opportunities. Not saying that we don't want kids that are in music or are in the arts or in uh, athletics, but we want to make sure that this school that we have here is providing opportunities for all of our kids. And how do we do this? We do this, one of the avenues is through the academies. And I believe that this will help our kids to stay uh, alert, stay focused uh, and want to thrive. What we have found through our readings and our research is that when a kid gets connected to something like an academy, it makes them want to be a part of school even more so. Um, they want to thrive, they graduate, they continue their education beyond high school. Uh, they enroll in community college, they enroll in a four-year school. So the opportunities are endless. As, as Jessica and Nicole shared, you're allowing kids to open their minds uh, to, to get engaged in real world experiences with real people who are outside of our school who can come in to mentor them through the process, through the engagement and collaborate, collaborative experience uh, to ensure that they are successful. So that's our academy. Um, and we know that questions will come up and we'll try to answer those questions to the best of our ability. So thank you for this time. Thank you so much, Dr. Shelton. Thank you, Ms. Polly Sheehan. And um, I can definitely say I, I would represent many that if I had um, these types of programs and these types of inspirational spaces, I would have been inspired and a lot more focused on college and career and would have saved a lot of money in student loans. Um, I wanna pass it on to Dr. Drotty right now and thank you all for your time. Dr. Drotty. Yes, uh, Devon, if you can go back to the Pedro Nogueira slide for me. And I was sure, to sure thing. Do that a little bit. Give me a moment here to pull that up. Sorry about that. Great job, uh, um, Jessica, Nicole, uh, Antonio, and Lauren. Uh, thank you for uh, the, the presentation there. Uh, it's, it's coming along pretty well, like we, <laughs> like we thought. Uh, uh, so I, I'm going to speak to just. Uh, just a reminder of why why I think this this direction is necessary, and I think something you all charged me with when I first when we first got here, which is which is really um, making learning accessible to all. Okay, making learning accessible to all, and um, uh, I happen to be a, I have the advantage of, of being in several different districts, so I've seen a lot. And, and whether it be in Santa Barbara and Fresno and so many different places, you, you'll notice a lot of the field trips we took are places where I've been <laughs> uh, to showcase a, a lot of this work. Uh, but it was, it was crystal clear to me what needed to happen um, uh, with our education. Uh, when the board said, to, uh, asked me to uh, we need to address the engagement and achievement gap. 
that we needed to make sure that uh, students are able to see themselves and others in a socially just way and, and create a, a create a socially just world and a more democratic world. And also uh, to just make sure that uh, we are able to embrace the 21st century. And it was very clear to me what needed to happen. And, and, th and that is the reason why we went to uh, all these different uh, uh, places to visit school schools that are that are um, uh, uh, actualizing this. I just want to remind everybody that the board member we have two new board members and and uh, uh, new ones. But I, and but uh, I wish the community would have went with us to some of these field trips and saw what we saw out there. So I'm gonna try my best to just to describe uh, what we saw when you when we went to Dust Bubbles High School. It looked at the Engineering Academy. I think everybody was overwhelmed with what students were able to produce. The mechatronics projects that Stanford uh, professors and students are envious of. We went to Fresno where students were creating documentaries around issues of equity, whether it be about gentrification issues taking place and who that impacted, who didn't impact. That in incorporated economics, history of who has access to, to money from the banks who didn't, that went into redlining and so on, where students are able to better understand how the systems work and how sometimes they can marginalize other communities and, and not others, where so so they can then develop agency about uh, in, in enforcing change. Uh, we, we witnessed uh, students talking about uh, um, uh, issues of uh, health, issues of depression, where students were in front of uh, uh, lawyers, doctors, and so on, talking about what they learned in terms of mental illness and how that impacted them and what they, and then recommendations to the adults that adults probably never considered. But as students learn about themselves and their peers about these issues, they, uh, they created agency and it really, it, it created an opportunity for them to see themselves as an adults. Not everyone in a community has access to lawyers where they can just take courses in a isolated way where you take English in isolation. You take political science in isolation. You take history in isolation and somehow some way bring it together so that way you can learn to be a lawyer, a civil rights lawyer or a, a real estate lawyer. Not everybody has that access. Um, uh, and not everybody has access to, you know, my, my degree was in biochemistry. It wasn't until my last years where I was able to incorporate biology with, with chemistry, with everything else that the science does. It, it, so yeah, certainly I did well in solving the equations of chemistry, but that's not, that, that, that wasn't applied chemistry to do something else. It wasn't. So how, how do you align that with pharmacy and everything else that's taking place and some of the work that we saw in the Obama Center? Who's going to who's gonna take the student and say, this is how all these pieces connect, right? Uh, universally struggle with that those issues as well. So what they try to do is rely on internships. And a lot of times internships come from access, how people have access to people that can give you an internship for you to actually learn some of the skills that you're learning uh, in academia, in the books, to something uh, relevant that they can actually apply. What we're talking about doing is creating that opportunity for our students at, 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 while they are still with us on campus. So that way they create that sense of agency. They can create, they can help problem solve. And then uh, um, if everything aligns right, they are taking those skills and agency to something bigger and greater. Uh, so, uh, so that way they can, um, uh, be, become more uh, as efficient as possible, become productive, uh, uh, take the direction where they want to go. So that's why this is important. Um, we talk about the social justice standards. You cannot teach that in isolation without current issues. Okay. Certainly we can sit there and read all about Martin Luther King and Michael Max and Cesar Chavez and understand the dates and all that. And, uh, but what does it got to do with solving the current issues right now that we're dealing with uh, around issues of social justice? We have to incorporate those discrete skills, social justice standards, academic standards, 
into ideas and concepts that students can touch and play with, manipulate and apply. And, and the way that's done is through a project-based approach. Okay, They're through a project-based approach. So, um, and I, I put, I wanted to highlight this slide because I, I know change is hard, uh, change is difficult, but if we continue to do what we've always done, this is what we're gonna end up with. I mean, in 20 years, you'll be talking about the same thing over and over and over. Okay, you'll be talking about the same things over and over and over. Because the missing link here is not more of the same. Okay, it's, 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 it's re-envisioning what we're doing. As Devon, you can stop sharing. I'll just, uh, I'll just, I'll just conclude. Uh, so we have to re-envision what we're doing. Um, there are a lot of people upset about some of the changes we're making to physical plant. But these, I get it. Uh, I, I, I totally get it. There's, there's, you know, people have great memories. People have great experiences uh, at some of these facilities and all that. Uh, we understand that, but we're not talking about making the school worse or the situation worse. We're talking about making it better. So that way the people 10, 15, 20 years from now can come and say, my God, I was walking around this. I remember being in that facility, creating this, coming up with this idea. And all of a sudden I, I wanna go back and ex express to students and people that uh, in this building over here, this classroom here, I did this with these particular teachers and this, this is why who I am right now. Okay, we want then those memories will come because we will provide opportunities for those students to exist. So I hope uh, as and uh, this is more than not, not to but this is for the community that's listening out there. Um, if we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to get the same results. And this is from the CEO of the organization that's charged responsible to uh, to, to, to take everybody through this journey and ultimately responsible to, for the outcomes. Um, but, but I would tell you, if we, if we, if I, we just continue to feed the same formula, it's not going to work. I would, I'm going to tell you that now it's not going to work. So we, 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 we have to take the leap and change and honor people. And that's what Dr. Shelton talked about honoring the past. Uh, but we're not talking about making Samuel worse or making Malibu high worse. We're talking about making it better. Or, or, or any of the schools that uh, we're dealing with. So I just want to kind of leave with that um, uh, because I know there the, uh, I've been listening to the conversation in the community and and and, uh, and th this thing isn't going to make Santa Monica worse. It's going to make Santa Monica better. Okay, it's going to make the whole city of Santa Monica better. But that said, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Keen, I'll I'll let you take over from here. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Drotty. Um, we do have, I think, nine speakers. Before we get to the speakers, I'll ask the board if there's any clarifying questions. If there aren't clarifying questions, we'll hear from our speakers and then we'll go to board comment, board member comment. Anything clarifying we need to get to pressing? Yes, Maria? Uh, just a clarification, because I know that you talked about a, a um, two, three class uh, block schedule and you talked about the three areas, English, what is it, the academy, emphasis and business marketing. Um, so that, that would mean, let's say, if you, if it was a two or three block schedule, then the other remaining, what, three, uh, three um, periods would be then lending itself to your math, your science, or how is that set up then throughout the week? Is yes. That, that's correct. So students will attend all of their regular graduation requirements in the other areas, as well as their chosen electives. One of the uh, choices that they will have in the academies will be infusing English, business, and their academy choice. And let me just ask whether if, well, I, maybe I'm already getting into the discussion. Okay, that's all, I'll leave it there and I'll bring it up later. Okay. Thanks, Maria. So why don't we turn this over to Board Vice President Lieberman. We'll hear from our members of the public and then we can get to board discussion. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, we have nine speakers, eight of whom will get three minutes each. And then the ninth one who signed in after the item had started, consistent with our rules, will have one minute. Um, the first three speakers are Jimena Del Pozo, followed by Molly Leg or Log, and then Michonne Herman.
Hi, oh, there we are. Hi, my name is Jimena del Pozo. Um, I'm here today speaking to you guys as a parent of a student who attends PPBL. Um, my daughter is a ninth grader. This is her first year there. And I wanted just to share my experience about um, how the school has really um, blossomed my child's learning. So one of the things that I appreciate most about this setup and the way that PPBL works is the freedom of communication and the interest and relationships that my daughter has been able to form with her teachers and staff there. She's completely new to the school. She didn't have any relationships with any of the teachers there yet. And as a parent, that was obviously a concern and a worry that I had. Um, I also really like the collaboration with myself and the staff that whenever there's issues to resolve, the attitude is extremely um, welcoming and understanding and collaborative. When we face any challenges, they, we face them together. I've seen my daughter grow in an, in an incredible way in just one semester. She, um, you know, she, she is more independent. She has developed interests um, that she did not have last year. And she is um, uh, appreciating not only working with the teachers, but she's very involved working with the other students, which is a lot to say during our distance learning model which is a struggle I think for all of us as parents and, and kids. Uh, I feel really comfortable that the teachers are getting to know my child as, an, as a person, as a whole person, and not just as a person in one of their subject areas. Um, I was really impressed by the collaboration that I saw with um, in the beginning of the semester when they developed their individual learning plans and then how she very independently took that to fruition and presented you know, a 20 minute presentation on a variety of things that I had no idea she was thinking about and, you know, and working on. It was really impressive. I was extremely proud. I think the program also allows for such creativity and really helps children turn inward, which is something that sometimes in our society we don't do enough of. Um, that can only happen with the kind of patience and mentoring that I've seen at the school. Um, it's allowed my daughter to take risks that she hasn't taken in the past and expand certain parts of her that that were like a little visible, but the teachers really saw that and said, hey, you know, maybe you would want to do this. And she's like, okay, I'll try it. So for me, it's been a wonderful experience to see the, the field, the community at this at this school, and also to see the academic rigor that my daughter is experiencing as it is not at all um, diminished by this particular model. Thank Speaker you so much. Up. Thank you. Uh, next is Molly, followed by, I'm sorry, let me get the rest of you ready, Mishan Herman and then Andrea Purcell. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good evening to everybody. I appreciate your time. Um, to the board, Dr. Jotty and staff, thank you for your commitment to improving our district's already exceptional education. I will take my time to talk about project-based learning as I firmly believe that PBL will engage and inspire every student in our district. I know we're talking about high school right now, but it reaches down to kindergarten and before. Not only will it enrich those students who are doing well, but inspire those who have been struggling for any one of the many reasons that challenge our children. You may ask how I can be so confident about this. I see it happening at Sam High's PBL pathway where my son is a current 10th grader. Even during the hurdles of distance learning, I see him forging new connections, challenging himself and staying engaged in his learning. As a 10th grader, he's able to work on his independent project or his LTI, where he is interviewing local experts as well as connecting with people internationally. So although he does have, we all have our distance learning hurdles, he's actually able to stretch a little further and connect with people. Maybe he wouldn't have been able or wouldn't have been as open um, via, you know, just internationally. 
PBL staff are an extraordinary team connecting all our students to the world around them, showing that they can make a difference now and as they make their way in the future. My son connects with his, his advisor constantly. Their relationship is that of collaborators for his future self. The teachers and administrators are always accessible and deeply interested in his point of view. This team is meeting each learner where they are and supplying a trampoline, maybe, for them to propel into their future. This is why my daughter and current eighth grader is excited for the opportunity to call PPBL her home next year. And not to be left out, my fifth grader is already looking forward to it. Though PB, PBL may be new to our district in name, this approach to learning is not experimental and not at all new. Many of our district teachers are already applying what they can in their classrooms. Schools across the nation and the world have already embraced this future ready approach. In fact, one of our local schools, New Roads, who embraces P PBL as well, just watched their alumni, Amanda Gorman, as an inaugural poet. Oh, wow. <laughs> she was incredible. <laughs> I task our district with not only allowing the Samo High PPBL Pathway students this engaged, relevant, and rigorous education, but please bring it to as many students in as many ways as quickly as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mishan Herman uh, followed by Andrea Purcell and then Jean Kaneko. Kaneko. Okay, thank you board members, Dr. Durati and Dr. Mora and all of the PPBL staff for giving all Santa Monica students the opportunity for such an amazing forward thinking pathway. Our daughter is a freshman this year at PPB PPBL. She's always been known as a shy, quiet kid. What's been so great for Livia this year is that she's being seen as a leader by her peers and her teachers. This is something that she's never experienced before. She's being forced to speak up and work with others. She's gained so much confidence through working in groups and learning how to use her voice. And she and everyone else has learned that she has a lot of important and insightful information to share. She was even chosen as an academic student of the semester. Don't get me wrong, she's still shy and a bit quiet, but the smaller class size and group work has made all of this possible. Because they work so closely together, she has very real relationships with each of her teachers. They really know her and she loves this and she loves them. We feel like we are getting a private high school experience, but in a public high school setting, and we couldn't be happier with our experience. I encourage everyone to attend a PPBL information session to learn about how amazing this program really is. I would love for our district to do, to do more to help publicize PPBL because I don't think enough people know about it and know it's available to their high schoolers or what it's all about. I think all students could truly benefit from project-based learning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Misha. Uh, Andrea Purcell, followed by Jean Kaneko, and then Stephanie Cup. Hello, good evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak from a parent perspective about the work being done uh, both at PPBL and at the main campus to connect my two students' interests and their learning to real world work. Um, I have one student who's enrolled as a 10th grader at PPBL Pathway and the other is enrolled as a ninth grader in programs only at the main campus. So I'm able to see sort of the perspective from um, both experiences from both my students. Um, as a family, I know that we were really grateful for um, to have options with in the district when we were considering which high schools our, our kids would be the best would be the best fit for our um, kids and we feel like we made the right decision for both of them of course they were involved in that as well I'm really excited about these conversations um, and the associated action around innovation um, even during this time of challenge for our community and for the world so I really commend you all for engaging in this 
Um, I hear a lot about the project-based learning aspect of the pathway and the work that Dr. Shelton and his staff are doing or proposing for the main campus. And I think that's been talked about and said, I really wanna call out what I find the most valuable as a parent, um, which is the personalization aspect, um, the structures that really allow my children um, agency and all of our kids agency in driving their own education. Um, as an educator who believes you know, that our schools have a central role to play in addressing issues of inequity and racism in our community, um, I think an important first step is respecting each student's interests as valuable, as worthy of credit, as worthy of celebration, um, and supporting them in doing so. Um, so in doing this kind of work, we're respecting um, the student's right to be who they are and not we, who we expect them to become. Um, I also think that by linking student authentic interests to real world work and to mentors who share our students' passions, we're supporting their growth as engaged and productive citizens and building social capital, which as Dr. Drotty talked about earlier, is definitely an equity issue. Um, so in its second year of implementation, PPBL specifically, and as you grow the academies at SAMO High, um, I see Jessica and Nicole, the PPBL staff, and I hear the conversations on the main campus of, of SAMO High, really taking what you've learned and known through this whole process um, and adapting it in response to the students that, that you serve um, and to our community. And I just wanted to come here tonight to say that I appreciate your work. I'm really looking forward to seeing how all of this evolves. Um, I appreciate the support of the, of the board. Um, and I believe that we really have the opportunity to build on the innovative practice that has emerged during distance learning towards something better, um, towards something more inclusive of all of the students in our community. I'm very excited to be part of a community that values that kind of work. And I encourage you all to continue your support of um, all of these efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, Stephanie, C no, sorry, Jean Kaneko, then Stephanie Cup, and then Esther Hickman. Hi, good evening, um, board members, Dr. Dwadi. Um, uh, my name is Jean Kaneko, and I'm a parent of a 10th grader at the PPBL Pathway. And thanks to the board's approval, I am also a consultant to Olympic High School and Samo High CTE teachers. I have a master's degree in educational leadership from a network of schools that have been doing PBL for over 20 years with a focus on supporting engaging effective real world learning for all students, especially those of us who are neurodiverse. I also hold CTE credentials in five areas due to my very long work experience, which makes me feel very old. Um, so as an older parent with an only child, my family has the privilege of being able to go anywhere for my son's education. And as such, we were about to move to Northern California when the pathway was announced within days. I have studied many different approaches to learning all around the world. I have studied and visited innovative schools all around the world. Um, we have attended as a family private schools in LA and I have worked as an educator in private schools in LA. I chose PPBL for my son, volunteered all of last year to create an innovation lab that I funded and equipped for free and continue to volunteer in different capacities now. Why do I do this? Because I have seen the capabilities of young people brought out to the real world that can be hidden under report cards with leather grades. I have seen students who have never seen themselves as successful learners take the leadership to teach other students. I have seen true equitable opportunities provided by teachers for all students. If you wanna know more about these, email me and I can share. I love sharing information that I've seen. I have seen students who have never get, been given the opportunity to fail and grow in safe environments do things they never could have imagined. As a volunteer, I have seen students who have worked their way through the thick cloud of teen self-doubt to confidence. I saw this a couple of days ago. I was on TikTok trying to understand teens and one of my um, one of the students posted their first video on YouTube that she has been trying to post for four years but could not do to do due to the lack of her confidence. I literally felt like I'd birthed a second child at that moment. Um, I have seen a student who was failing all academic classes teach other students how to use a new t-shirt t-shirt printing technology that he had struggled through and had redone the same document at least 20 times. 
swearing the entire time, but now is a total professional at it. Um, now, and this year he was awarded the most improved student and he is a renewed academic success. Other students have spent three hours every week trying to get a large cutting machine to work so that they can build a garden structure that can be installed in food deserts all around Los Angeles, especially in these um, hard times. And all this with only six months in person learning prior to COVID on the Olympic campus. Only because six time is up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Stephanie Cup, Esther Hickman, and Nikki Kohlhoff. And then Joan Krennic will have one minute to finish off the speakers on this item. Hey, uh, I'm Stephanie Cup, and um, my son Yoshen is a ninth grader at PPBL. And um, just like the other parents uh, that have spoken before me, um, I've just been so impressed um, with this school. Uh, Yoshen has an IEP and he has some learning challenges. And so we really wanted to have a school where um, he wasn't going to be pushed in one direction or another, that he had options and um, that they were working with him um, to succeed based on his interests and his own abilities. And I feel like um, we have definitely found that in PPBL. Um, they are sensitive to his learning needs while also challenging him and pushing him to do better and to be better. Um, I work at a university and um, I just wanted to focus in on two things that um, I feel are amazing um, that he is getting in a high school setting that many of us only got uh, once we reach college or career. Um, so the first is um, that the subjects are connected to the real world and to each other. So just like in the real world where we um, experience something like COVID um, and then all of um, life is connected to that, our social world, um, our scientific world, research, what we're writing and reading. Um, they're doing that in PPBL. And um, like they showed in the video, Yoshen's uh, COVID project was focused on um, the racial inequalities um, that are faced um, by COVID patients and the um, different outcomes. And he was able to interview his cousin who's a public health officer in North Carolina and write about it and research. And um, I mean, that's amazing for an incoming ninth grader. That was his first project. Um, the other thing is that the kids um, set up their independent learning plans right from the start. And so they look at what are their interests um, and they set goals um, and they reevaluate those goals. And if they achieve them, great. If not, they go back to the drawing table and they reevaluate and they rewrite. Um, that's something we all need to be doing. That's something I need to be doing um, every day. And so that's really exciting that they are getting that um, life skill so early on. And I, um, if I can flip my screen, I've never done this before on Zoom, but Yoshan gave me permission to share his, I don't know if you guys can see it, but his project that he's working on currently, they're doing vision boards. And so his, he's zooming in on Yoshen and he has his, he's created a zoom screen and he just, he's able to write down like his, one of his goals is to get better at math, to study more. Another one is get better at technology. Um, he wants to build a PC. So he talks about that and he wants to learn welding and he wants to be an electrician. So he's able to talk about the things that really interest him and then explore, how do I get there? Um, the speaker's time is up. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have two more speakers for three minutes and I, I missed one on the late speaker. So there'll be two late speakers, Esther Hickman and then Nikki Kohlhoff. Hi, good evening. My name is Esther Hickman and I um, am a resident and alumni. And it's really wonderful to hear um, about more about PPBL and the implementation of the career academies. And it was especially wonderful to hear the testimonials from parents. And um, one thing that seems so consistent is 
the student teacher relationships and um, the passionate environments. And that is, um, sounds like something that will, a wonderful change that will um, benefit students. Um, I know that staff spoke and uh, addressed the need of learning spaces earlier in the presentation and people having fear of change. And, um, and one of the um, teachers spoke to so much excitement over new buildings and new infrastructures and, um, and that's all really wonderful. Um, I just wanted to question that uh, career academies and project-based learning, there's not really a requirement that it has to be in brand new development. It can be done in historic conversions and adaptive reuse. And for anybody who hasn't seen, Mario Fonda Bernardi, a revered local architect and planning commissioner, submitted an adaptive reuse plan earlier today to the board. And um, it, I don't think it's been distributed to everybody, but it really gives a visual example of adaptive reuse and how huge learning spaces and um, all the square footage you need could be achieved. And one of the things that was so interesting in the ad, um, when uh, the ad for PBL or the Career Academy is that it said um, it would be a place where real world problems that deal with the environment and social justice could be addressed. And um, I do see this um, history building thing as a social justice situation because it impacts so many residents and taxpayers. Um, it is a historic preservation, um, losing the educational, the cultural, the inspirational opportunities um, for generations by not exploring it and by telling students and teachers and parents that things are impossible, which aren't, um, really isn't part of this wonderful educational process that you guys are bringing to life. So, um, so I, uh, if anybody wants to look at the plans, um, they can um, reach Mario or me. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Nikki Kohlhoff. I'm disabled. The it says the video is disabled. Can you see me? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, hold on, let me. Uh, first, it's it's really disappointing that PBL and the academies were combined into one item because it shows the short shrift given to public input on major topics like this that cost a lot of money. And then also there is the merging, even in the presentation. Uh, by Dr. Shelton um, and the house principal talking about facilities when that's really supposed to be the next topic. So hard to know what you guys are gonna do with this one, especially since there are no action items, it's just a study session. So I don't even know if you're gonna vote on anything or staff just keeps moving along however they want um, unless you tell them to stop, which seems to be how it works. Um, what I'm hearing is that everybody loves PBL because of the small class size, engaged teachers and meaningful material. I guess I don't understand why that's not our goal for everyone and why it's required to have to go to a different facility in order to accomplish that. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gerardi said the goal was 25 to one for kids. Why is that not our goal for the whole high school? It should not be the goal for one pathway. That is inequitable. Um, what does the program cost and how long are we going to try it at a separate location? The first year, only 43 kids showed up. Now we have 74. Dr. Gerardi said last year before this enrollment, although we didn't meet our first year's goal of enrolling 109th graders, we're confident that we'll hit our goal in the future. If for some unforeseen reason we do not reach our enrollment goals, we will reconsider the program. That does not appear to be happening. He also said the program was cost neutral, but we've never seen a budget. I mean, we have a parent saying that they actually made a lab all by themselves and self-funded it. I don't know that most would agree that that's an equitable way to fund our schools in a public school district either. I've made PRA requests for budgets and have 
never been given the site budget for the PBL program. We're deficit spending. We need to know how much these things cost, even if they sound nice. With respect to the career academies, these may be viable concepts as well, but they don't need new buildings. I reached out to a group of teachers and asked about that specifically. <clears throat> One said, I'm a career and technical educator at a career academy. They work, but what they don't need is new facilities. Another one said our electronics lab was updated and outfitted with P Project Lead the Way money, but nothing was torn down and rebuilt. Another comment that uh, new facilities are uh, rare because it's easy to repurpose existing facilities like my current lab. Um, we don't have any special facilities. I don't think they are needed. No need for a building and you don't need a new building for it. And then about the courtroom, no law academy I know of has one. So we're we don't need to go in that direction, but we haven't answered the logistics. What is the goal? Is it more college? Is it more career? Are any employers involved? Have the arrangements been made with SMC? Where, when are we gonna partner with them and what facilities do we get to use with our bond money? How many Let's students are expected? Up. How will it impact existing you, Nikki. houses? Thank you very much. What is the class size? Thank we have you. no logistics discussions, none. And how can we move forward with a $70 Thank million you. Dollar project? You know, your time is up. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have two final speakers, each with one minute. That would be Joan Krennic and then Wendy Dembo. I'll talk fast. Over my 20 plus years as a parent at SMMUSD, I've often heard the, of the importance of trying to meet every student where they are. These programs do that. Students have different learning styles and many students do not thrive under a traditional learning model. To promote equity and excellence in our schools, it's your obligation to provide these students with alternative learning models. To promote equity through engagement. These new programs and spaces will allow involved students to be innovative and creative in a space that enhances their academic success. And importantly, research has shown that project-based learning models promote collaboration and exposure to real world experiences, which better prepares all our students to be college and career ready. These innovative programs and facilities will certainly distinguish and elevate Santa Monica High School. The new exploration building that will house the academies is exciting and forward thinking. To stop it now to look at adaptive reuse of a building that would have to be gutted and completely changed would likely result in a multi-year delay. Move forward with phase three now. We want our fab this fabulous new exploration building and gym to be available to our students as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know. Wendy Dembo, Sarah, maybe you can find her. Um, hi, I just want to thank you. I, um, as I've said before, I went to an alternative school in the 70s. I'm very excited about project based learning. Mm -hmm. But um, what I'm excited about is not a few kids having classes with. Um, one teacher, 15 kids with one teacher. I'm excited about all kids having the opportunity in all schools to have project-based learning. Um, and, as a, and in terms of the career pathways, um, I don't know if in marketing, there's um, a product market fit. That's an analysis or study or when your product meets the needs of your target market. Um, you, there, if you never develop a product without figuring out if it's the right for your users, members, or customers. And I wonder um, and if that's what's going to happen with the PBL and the certificate programs. Um, I know they're great ideas, but if people aren't excited about taking these classes or following these programs, then I'm not sure it's a great use of money, especially if you're intending to build an entirely new building. The speaker's time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, th I think that concludes our speakers for this item. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Lori. And thank you for our speakers for, uh, for sharing their opinions tonight. I will uh, open it up to the board to, for comments, questions. I have Richard already on the speakers list. Is there anybody else who would like to join the speakers list while I'm looking out at pictures? I see Maria and Craig and Lori. Okay, so we'll go from there and then Jennifer. <coughs> Thanks, John. Um, I want to um, thank also John, the speakers for their comments tonight. Um, 
as everyone knows, my colleagues know how excited I am about this program, even though I do get tongue tied still with that extra, the PPBL and getting that there. But um, I'm so grateful um, Dr. to your team for staying so close uh, um, to the direction uh, that the board has given. And I want to right out of the gate say, as one board member, I am all in, right? Is that what uh, I'm completely in? Um, a couple of things I wanted to just reiterate with my time and John, I promise only to speak once on this item. Um, I, I so appreciated Dr. Drotti, Dr. Mora's um, laying the, the, the kind of the, well, what am I trying to say? Uh, Dr. Mora, you framed it nicely before you handed it off to, um, to your peers, our peers in the presentation tonight. And I just want to take my moment to emphasize that or to put the exclamation points on that about the importance of this effort at closing the particular gaps that we see in our district. And um, I've asked Dr. Moore, and I'm so thrilled every, that she's heard me and not, for, not that you have to hear me, but that you are truly committed to this, that when we read Dr. Nogueira's report, when we see the various gaps, when we talk about what equity means, when we hear what Dr. Drotti said as he was kind of tying up the report that, you know, there's been so much that we've attempted and we haven't been successful at narrowing those gaps. And we have the data and the research from persons who are experts in the field and identifying um, the joy that comes in a, in a different way of learning. I'm not gonna use the word alternative, I'm gonna say different way of learning and meeting the kids where they are. So. I just would encourage you, Dr. Drotti, to make sure that everywhere we go when this goes on the road, and Dr. Shelton did a wonderful job too, just making it known to the community that this is the work of closing the achievement gap, the engagement gap, the opportunity gap. And I, I kind of sometimes, sometimes people laugh at me when I talk about the joy of education, but finding that spark for the kids. And, and we want that for every child. And when I think about what equity means, I want to make sure that like that we we never lose sight of you know defining equity in the 21st century. And Maria is great at doing this for us and our board. It's some of our students need different things from us, right? You have to have a toolbox that is full with many different tools. And I am so committed by way of the uh, the research, the data, the science that's gone into this that this I believe is a powerful tool to close those gaps where we have fallen short before. So I am full steam ahead as one board member and wanted to more, uh, make sure I point that. So um, thank you to Dr. Drotti, Dr. Mora for the framing of it. Um, I really appreciate uh, the good work that's happening um, on the Sam Hohai campus with regards to the uh, developing and the building of the academies. And I just wanna to say to Dr. Shelton, you're a superstar from, from my perspective. The, the work that's happening there and how you stay the course and you're able to avoid the distractions and, and, and the kind of the challenges that are being, the falsehoods, the, the, the lies that are put forth and, and kind of what we're after. And, and I'm, I'm taking some inspiration from Joe Biden and others and saying, look, when we see a lie, when we see a mischaracterization, we name it, we speak the truth. Truth has power here. And this board is committed to the closing of these gaps. We have a principal at Sam High. We have principals throughout our entire district who are devoted to this. This is the, the, the passion and why they're in education. And I just wanna say, thank you. Um, now pertaining to the academies, you know, I, uh, in, in, my, in my, my day job, I'm so fortunate to work with uh, Professor Sherry Davis and she and I are the co-directors of the Public Policy Institute at Santa Monica College. And we tell our students, right, we have to tell them what public policy is and people are like, what the heck is that? And it seems to not be passionate about it until they learn about it. So you can only imagine how excited I was to see that you're saying some students might have identified public policy. And sir, uh, the government part and the engagement part doesn't surprise me at all with our students in this district and young people in general, because I truly believe that they are the, the great hope for us um, in our democracy, small society. But I do wanna say that 
uh, and Maria is like a key person on our board, I, I would like to think that I am one too, at least in making a connection to the public policy and the connection to the Santa Monica College and what could happen there. Because Santa Monica College, um, and I think Dr. Shelton, you know this, uh, Dr. Smith knows this, that um, it's the only California community college program that has a uh, uh, AA degree in public policy. And, um, and Dr. Drotty knows that after we, well, when we were able to go to one of our CSBA programs in person way back, we learned of a particular district, I'm always forgetting that Dr. Moore knows which one it is, that many of the students are graduating with their AA degrees, but at the same time, they're graduating with high school. Is it Monrovia? I can't remember what it is, but um, that, um, but I thought, oh my gosh, when I heard that and as a potential of one of the academies that we would see, I thought, this is like a dream come true for many of us who are uh, lifelong learners and truly committed to education in our in our in our district in our community. I thought, wow, well, through concurrent enrollment, through uh, dual enrollment, through the opportunities, what what it could mean for um, for students um, if they were to choose he, she, they were to choose that particular pathway. So I, this just I just want to share a bit of excitement there. And then lastly, to kind of close it out, I want to um, say that. Um, John and Lori and myself were so fortunate, and, and I think I mentioned this in my board comments before, but I want staff to hear it. Um, we had the benefit of touring the, the new building, the facility uh, recently with Carrie and Steve, and I was just blown away um, by way of what spaces there are, how they can be used, and just hearing the, the freedom, just, the idea about moving forward and, and our district's willingness to embrace uh, improved ways of teaching, utilizing space for teaching. Uh, I'm just really excited about this. Um, and so thank you, Dr. Drotty and your entire team. Um, I encourage my peers who haven't yet seen the where the building is at this moment um, to go over there and do that. And Dr. Drotty, I had suggested on our little tour, you weren't there with us, but um, maybe we have a public meeting actually where we um, walk the facilities together, uh, both at o Obama Center, Samuel High, Malibu High. We had done that when Sandy Lyon was our superintendent. We only did it once, sadly, but uh, and the public joined us. It was truly a public meeting so that we could see what kind of uh, resources we have in facilities. And then there was this talk that took place about our curricular um, endeavors and our hopes and aspirations here. So thank you for listening. John, I promise I'll keep quiet. That's my one turnaround uh, the field here, but uh, I am one board member all in. Thank you. And thank you, Jessica and, and Nicole and everybody who's working so hard, Dr. Smith, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, TJ. Um, uh, Maria, Craig, Lori, Jennifer. Yes. Well, thank, thank you, everybody. It, it was a great, great um, presentation. Thank you uh, to all the doctors, Roddy, Maura, Smith, um, to Jessica, Nicole, and all the teachers, I think, all the faculty that really make up the PBL there at, you know, at the Obama Center, and those teachers that, in a sense, aren't labeled as PBL, but continue to do that type of work at, at Samo High, even without them being recognized as PBL teachers, but they're doing a great job. You know, I thank you, Dr. Drati, for, for really clarifying that piece because, you know, for me, I've driven that and I've asked you so many times in terms of the clarification regarding um, the Noguera report and what does that mean? And I think you, you defined it well tonight. Um, the report was an engagement of many people in the community and it left us with a lot of questions still to be answered and to set up a work plan. Unfortunately, by the time um, you know, we were ready to get, go to that direction, Sandy Lyon left and here comes Dr. Drotty. But I know that when we were hiring him, we took, this is one of the big key th issues that, um, that we, we asked them that if you're gonna come, this is what we're, the expectations are high. And in this community, you know, they're very high and, we're, and very demanding sometimes, too much, I think. But I think you, you answered it in, in the respect that we cannot continue, and that was Dr. Noguera's main point, we couldn't continue doing the same old, same old presentation. It's almost like we were saying, we're gonna make this round, what is it, what is it? You, a round thing in a pig hole or whatever it's called, a round in a square. 
and we're gonna make it fit and maybe we'll shave the, 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 the square so it can be round or maybe we tried so many. I was here 20 years and we tried so many programs. We, we, we evaluated programs, we did everything and we would always come up with maybe an inch that some kids would make be successful, some others, but not really. You're never, we're never, like Dr. Darty said, we're never gonna really respond to any of our needs of all of, all of our kids, not just a few, but all of our kids in this district unless we, we, we are creative in moving forward and you know, a program that's gonna be responsive to all the kids at wherever level they are. And Richard, I'm a little different from you in that, and I, could, I do agree with you, but for me, it's not a matter of, of um, the gaps, filling the gaps, but for me, it's the creating of the opportunities for these kids, of creating you know, opportunity building, of making sure that our students who come in get the best that they can um, while they're here at, in, in our great district you know, pre-K through 12. And um, one of the key things that I know uh, uh, that some of the parents are very hesitant and I don't think they quite understand and believe and understand. Hey, Maria, somehow you went on mute. mute. Maria, you went on mute. Oh, I keep, I know I, I have to not, I'm getting too expressive here in my computer. Um, but sometimes it's, it, it's not a matter of a career versus college. It's one and the same. I don't think parents understand it's one and the same. It's one and the same. The kids are getting a pretty good education, a rigorous education as they're developing their own view of what they would potentially maybe want to do as a career. You know, and, and we always do everything so backward. We're always trying to move our kids to a college and then maybe a major. And the last thing people think about is a career when you're grad graduating from college, a little too late. I think we really have to in the high school work with our students to understand maybe potential, not, you know, they might not necessarily believe or, or come up with one career, maybe potential careers that they might be interested in looking at so that once they leave us, they, they've done a little exploration through our PBBL you know, courses, through our academies, and they find something they wanna pursue. And with that comes a, the selection of perhaps a major, potential major or majors. Now majors are so creative as they were like in our generation that you were a history major, set. You were a, you were a arts major, me a history major and that's it. And if you wanted a minor, you got a minor in art. That's not what it is anymore, folks. When you go to college, everything, you create your own major and, and you can be as creative as you want. Um, and, and I think I think we have to be open to that. And, and for me, after being on the you know, school board for 20 years, after you know having been educated in the way in the last century, that um, we have to look and be open enough to see. And and, and this I know hard, change is hard, but it's it's a good change. I don't know why uh, parents won't under, can't understand. It's a great change. It's a great change because um, the kids will be the students will be hopefully developing themselves to be creative, innovative thinkers, to be able to solve issues. It wasn't like when, I remember when, when I first started um, at Santa Monica College and we were trying to develop these dual, dual enrollment courses because that's what I do, I work, I, I am a court, I'm a project manager for workforce and economic development at Santa Monica College. So we were trying to develop dual enrollment courses for a high school or, you know, to offer there at the high school. And one of the key things we kept using was, well, kids, students, you know, let your, you know, find your passion, let it, let the passion drive you until somebody finally clarified to me, what do you mean find your passion? What do they know? They're only in high school. They might not have reached any point in their lives at this, in their time of their lives to make a decision on what they would want to do. Like, did you? And I'm thinking, no, I guess I really didn't get to that point until I got to high school and to college. That's, and, and towards the end of college. So for us, here's an opportunity to be able to change the dynamics of that so that um, the kids are, like what PBL says, you, you find their passion is not find it, but it's like selecting a problem in this world that you think, like they said, you think you would want to solve with the research and, and, and what you're going to be doing and learning, you, you're going to create that answer for you. And perhaps that answer is going to be something that, that involves you and, and and pulls you in because that could potentially you're creating your own career for the future. Your response to, to this problem, this world or local, whatever it may be, may be your potential work, you know, your potential career for the future. And you know, I didn't believe that until I saw, 
what we do and, and what some of our students at the community college level have done to get themselves um, you know, educated and have moved on and have gotten, some of them not even their AA or BA degrees, but have set what they call stackable certificates that have created their, a work environment for themselves or just um, a basis for them, uh, for them to be work, what is it? Um, uh, they create their own ability to find their jobs and employable, there you go. They're more employable. And especially now um, with what, we ha what happened to us when the world crashed in March and you being able to have a great foundation, educational foundation that you can pivot from there. That all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the world, the world doesn't fall on you, but that you're able to create um, a means of reinventing yourself because you have the means to do it. You've got the education to do it, to find another, you know, another career or, or, or another way to be able to find a job and become employed. So there's a lot of, lot of, you know, a lot of the educational process that many of us are used to from the 20th century that we think is going to pertain to now. Well, they're not valid anymore. They're not valid anymore. So we have to be, you know, we have to be open. And, you know, me of all persons, I mean, I just turned 64. And, and for me, it's like, I, I'm going to go back, you know, I'm, I'm taking, I, I'm going to go back and take some courses to be able to pivot. I'll finish my, 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 you know, my grants here at the college and I'm going to move on and create, reinvent myself again. Why not? You know, it's, so there's a lot of things there that students just ha can be, re are resilient and they will learn, but we have to just, you know, change the scenario, change the narrative of how we, we approach education in these days, because it's not going to be, it's not, it's not the same as it was. Um, but for me, most importantly, is that, that this, I think if we can get most of the students and, 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 and oh, I, I got my thought back. And I, and I, it, I'm thankful for the parents that came tonight from PBL, from all this, um, the, the students who have found success in, 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 um, yet, at the Obama Center at their school, at the PBBL school. And um, especially for those students that maybe in a larger comprehensive high school, they would not have achieved or they would not have you know, got, you know, been able to find their voice, but they're finding it there. So I think we have to be open for, for all students. You know, and despite the socioeconomic of kids, I think we have to go beyond that and really give everybody the opportunities to be able to engage and find who, who they want to be without us telling them. And parents, I'll be the first one I'm, that I did it, you know, I did it with my first one <laughs> in terms of telling me, this is what you're going to do. And it failed. Um, my daughter who did it something differently where she decided to do, you know, the arts and going to film. And I'm thinking like, ah, you're, you know, it's their life. It's what they want to do. And they find, their, they find themselves in it. Because at, my, my, at one point I find myself saying, wouldn't it be great to be able to, whether you're the, your, your own boss or you work for somebody else, that you enjoy what you're doing as your job. And it's, you'll always be successful because you enjoy what you're doing rather than being forced to do something you don't wanna do. So anyway, that, I'll leave it at that, but I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Shelton. Oh, you're the other doctor I forgot. The other Dr. Shelton um, that, uh, thank you for the academies. And you know, I think you were give, you were able. Thank you for being able to define the areas, because at one point we had the, you know we had set it up many years before you even came here. There were there were houses, and we just created the houses to be able to be able to, as a as a you know as a basis to be able to support our students, because you had more call, more counselors, you had you know more one on one supposed teachers. Well, like it, like anything, it was a great twentieth century idea, and it moves on. And you have to reinvent it and create and make it better. So the creation of the buildings that people are so negative about, there was these again were buildings that were going to be built for, not necessarily academies, but were going to be to to house the houses. But now we're giving it not more validity by saying they're academies, by giving them more of a structure, more of a base, more of a strength for where our I think our students are going to be able to fit in really nicely in in those academies at the high school. The, the only thing I, and this is my head at Santa Monica, the only thing I will say is that the, now um, the, the state of California and the governor is really looking at um, being able to, to support and educate our children's 
again, not to go to college, but to find the career that you're going to be able to find a job at the end of your, of your education to be able to support the state of California, to make California the top state it is, or the number five, or I forget what, what number we are in the world, you know, nation in the world. But in order for us to do that, our, our workforce has to be that strong. So if anything, I think us going through this process of the academies and, and, and getting them re ready for career and college is setting us up for, um, you know, supporting the state of, great state of California in terms of getting us over this hump, this financial hump that this pandemic has, and especially here in the city of Santa Monica, the, the, that this pandemic has put us in. But anyway, thank you. And, um, you know, I know I know over talk, but anyway, this is my passion. I really love to see, this is my passion. And like Richard said, he has a public institute idea with workforce and, and the future of the way we, we take our kids and let us help, you know, the college is there, we're the partners. And even like somebody mentioned, um, Amanda from, from um, was it New Roads? Well, we can also have those collaborations with the, even the private schools, you know, and dealing with, you know, um, with professional development with our with their teachers and ours, and making and sharing the best practices for everybody. Because at the end of the day, it's the future of the kids, regardless of whether they go to private or. or, or, or I hope they stay with us and and stay with us here at SM, MUSD. Anyway, thank you. Great, thank you, Maria. Um, Craig, Lori, Jennifer. Um, thanks to everybody who brought this to us tonight, um, staff, um, teachers, the kids, the parents, um, all the leaders that put this together, the principals. Um, there's clear evolution, there's clear power. Um, we can feel the wheels turning, we can feel the progress, we can feel the reality um, filling into what was a, a dream for us, a plan, a, a vision. Um, I think we shouldn't make a mistake in thinking this is optional, that this is strange, that this isn't the real world. This, what we're doing, is the real world. What schools have done for 200 years has been growing obsolete at a ferocious pace. You know, they did uh, research in the 1990s to see how much education has changed since the 1890s. I think it was USC. And the, the conclusion was shocking, not because they said it hadn't changed much, that education from 1890 to 1990 hadn't changed much. The shocking conclusion was it hadn't changed at all. And the world has changed a hell of a lot since 1990. So anybody who thinks we can stay where we are is out of their minds. Um, anybody who thinks that's a service to the kids is out of their minds. You know, Ben uses the blockbuster example that, oh, the video store is great, it's great, it's great. And then suddenly, no blockbuster. Nope, every single store is done. VCRs are done. The whole freaking thing is done. And then Netflix came along and then that part of Netflix business is done. I'm like the only guy on the planet who still gets DVDs from Netflix. Now it's all virtual. So the world is changing at a very different pace than education is changing and, and training our kids to be the very best uh, workforce members in 1895 is just not a service to them. Um, we talk about, um, well, let's talk about equity for a second. Um, we have a commitment to closing the achievement gap. And this district has tried really hard and people all across the country have tried really hard for a long time. And that achievement gap is incredibly intractable. And I think one of the major reasons is you can't solve it with a deficit model. It's like trying to fix your diet by taking vitamin B or something. The way you fix your diet is you eat spinach and you eat vegetables and you eat fruit and you eat healthy food. What we're trying to do is not just 
pound grammar into a kid's head and then pound history into a kid's head. This is all about creating engagement and relevance. And those are the buzzwords we say over and over and over again. And at some level, I think some people roll their eyes when we say them, but try this experiment. What if we said our plan was to teach kids in an unengaging, irrelevant way? What do you think about that idea? Well, guess what? That's what the school, public schools, that's what conventional schools have been doing for 150 years in this country. And it was never designed to be relevant or engaging. It was designed to turn farmers into factory workers and soldiers. That's what it was designed for. And guess what? That's not how soldiers fight anymore. And we don't have much in the way of factories anymore. So the whole thing is bankrupt. And it's all about en engagement and relevance and whole food education. And this deficit model is crap. And who wants to be on the receiving end of a deficit model? And what does that say? And how does that help the kids we're trying to help most by approaching them in this way? The new way is to let them succeed and give them the opportunity and show them the ability to be themselves in a powerful way in the world. And that's what this is all about. That's what the board committed to three years ago. That's what's rolling out here in the various forms, whether it's PPBL, whether it's more project-based learning in the classroom, all of the initiatives we've authorized, whether it's specific capstone courses or just getting more project-based learning in regular classes. That's the triumvirate we put in place. That's what we're working on. They all feed off of each other because PPBL is the laboratory. Those classes are a kind of execution. And then we use all that to change every single class we teach. And that's the board's vision. It's absolutely right. It will take time, it will evolve. And one of the other things about the modern world is companies don't succeed. You start a company and you say, we're gonna go from A to B. That's not how companies succeed. You go, you fund yourself well enough and a vision enough so you can keep evolving so that you find the sweet spot and find the sweet spot and pretty soon you've gotten to someplace great. But you don't get there by saying we're going from A to B and you do that. That's just not how the modern world works. So this is gonna keep evolving and we're gonna keep moving forward. So what I wanna say is I wanna echo what Richard said, I wanna echo what Maria said. This is a third board member all in on this. And the, this has also got to include that we're gonna keep evolving forward. We're not gonna suddenly look up and go, oh, sorry, just kidding, we're gonna go back to drill and kill. No, we will keep evolving this. And there's lots of great conversations to have about maybe this will work better than that and we'll move forward and it's gonna keep moving forward, but it's gonna keep moving forward. I am absolutely committed so long as I'm on this board to keep this moving forward and evolving in the spirit of it, the intention of it moving forward. And that is the only decent thing to do for the kids under our charge. It is the only decent thing to do for particularly the kids we're most trying to help in closing that achievement gap. And I got to tell you, the old, the old vision of this is a kind of dying privilege here. It's, it's a dying privilege. The future is not like that. The future is everybody having the opportunity to make their own way in the future, which is what we're providing. And every single child is going to have that opportunity, not from a deficit model, but from an open-hearted, open-minded, exploratory model. Um, I think I'll just say the last thing one more time. I am committed that this continues to evolve forward. That's what we need to do. You guys are doing great. Stay on that, keep doing it. Keep talking to us about how we can make it better that's the conversation we need to be having. How do we keep making this better? Because I'm committed, three of us so far are committed, keep it coming. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, Lori and then Jennifer. I'll try to be brief. I agree with much of what's been said. 
and I'm not going to nitpick and talk about the things I wouldn't quite frame the way my colleagues did, but generally I agree and I, I'm very supportive of what's been presented tonight. So I just want to add two additional thoughts. One is the parents who spoke tonight of uh, students who are at PPBL right now were incredible spokespeople for that program. And what it may, reminded me of is I feel like one of the challenges here is a marketing one. And we are educators, not marketers. And I don't think we've, um, I don't think we've landed on the right, the best way to market what PPBL has to offer. And one angle or one dimension of that is I think we've got to have a different name. I don't want to talk about that tonight, but calling something PPBL does not mean anything to almost any human being out there. So we've got to come up with a name that either describes what goes on there or doesn't describe it, but has a name. And then there's a little, um, whatever you call it, tagline that goes with it. But we've got to do something else. And again, I'm no expert in marketing, so I don't know what it is, but I know that that's a barrier, especially after I listen to those parents tonight. Um, my second point is one that I often make, and it's related to a point that Craig made, which is every time we talk about this, I say so many of the tenets that we talk about as part of project-based learning go with what one might call project-based learning, but they are also elements of good teaching, and they could go with any kind of good teaching, whether it's uh, more traditional or it's more current. And so I know just to name a few of those, um, relevant teaching, real life connections, alternative ways of assessing learning besides traditional tests, um, giving students agency in projects that they're doing. Those things, you don't have to have a full blown project-based learning curriculum which is great if we do, but even if you don't, those are all elements and there are more that I didn't mention that to me are, should be standard in virtually any classroom. I mean, that's what good teaching looks like. So I, I'm gonna stop there because I'm gonna have a lot more comments later and a lot of people have spoken in great detail here, but thank you to everyone who presented on, and that includes the speakers, um, uh, the public speakers, but Thank you so much for all of you who have put so much work into this presentation. And oh, I didn't talk about the academies at all, so I, I don't want to be dismissive of those. We just didn't have speakers um, for the most part about those. Those look incredibly exciting. I do think that those are definitely part of our future, and I'm excited about being in a school district that is this forward-looking. So thank you all. Thank you, Lori. Um, I've got Jennifer next. Keith, can I add you to the queue after Jennifer? Yes. Great. Okay. So Jennifer, then Keith. Oh, um, hi. So I also echo all of that stuff and Lori coming right before me and talking about um, PB, PB, PBBL. Um, I would um, echo that as well and thank everyone, um, our presenters and our speakers. Um, I I just find it, and obviously being new to this type of in of of, of um, board, uh, being a board member and 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 being a part of this part of it is different because I, I was just thinking that giving choices to kids is groundbreaking to me. I did not go to school having choices. I did not see, uh, frankly, I did not see my kids going to school having choices. A few choices here and there, and I saw it a little bit. And Dr. Shelton, I just have to thank you. Having flex time at the high school opened the most unbelievable world to my kids, to all the kids at Santa Monica High School, to have them take care of their needs, have their, and ha just have them get what they need. Um, and seeing that program be so incredibly successful opens up my mind to the unbelievable possibilities of what these kinds of choices bring to our high school. And I just think it is groundbreaking. I, I just think it's amazing that our district is willing to put this kind of hard work to make it happen and break the ground. I, I just think it's so essential. Um, and frankly, Dr. Shelton, I think you are groundbreaking. <laughs> um, 
So um, I also want to just sort of under, uh, understand this being sort of new to this, this high, this concept of CTE, to me, it's interesting because I just look at it as learning. I don't, uh, this whole sort of career path versus college path, it just seems like a whole bunch of learning to me. I, because, you know, I, I actually take this very seriously and maybe people don't agree with this, but my father always told me that you go to college to get educated not to get a job. And, and, I, and I understand that people have a lot of different needs and they feel a lot of different ways. And, and that's the way I, I grew up understanding it. And I can totally understand anybody else's concept of it, um, that it's different. But what I see about this program is, doesn't whatever path kids choose, it's not about, uh, it's not about what path they choose. It's about creating learning about how to learn, always how to learn. And it's just more of that. So I, I don't know how, as a high school, we distinguish the CTE versus whatever other path, whatever out of the normal path, the traditional path, the regular path, whatever that looks like. And so I, I do have a question about what the, where the distinction is there. Um, and I also um, um, have a question about, um, how we move forward, and I know that we are just going to keep moving forward and evolving um, about how we help our teachers move into this role that they're going to be taking on um, and what that looks like. And, um, and then I also have a little bit of a question about um, our district-wide PBL um, effort um, in making these choices for kids and how that permeates through um, our district. I, 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 do specifically like to me, elementary school already seems very project-based learning. We're creating these other types of project-based learning types of places in the high school and we have SMASH, but what happens on the other campuses? Um, and how, and, and the, I know that Mal, I know that there's some block classes, I know that they have, but how do we, um, how do we infuse um, this type of learning? And, um, and I'll just go back to that um, equity piece, meeting kids at their needs because um, and how equity and equality don't always meet, the, the ends don't always meet. Um, I think that that was about all I was thinking about. Well, so Jennifer, so if I hear you right, do you have questions that you wanna ask of Dr. Drawley and staff now, or would you like to, you're just putting that out there for future comment? I think I'm just- like? for future comment i'm sorry to sort of air my ignorant i'm airing my ignorance i'm airing my my historical my not historical knowledge my um and i think that they might be things that people are interested in knowing about um but not now and so no no need to address them at the moment so we have, uh, just to let you know we we have an entire you wouldn't know this but we have an entire schedule for you and keith to get you a <laughs> You guys are oriented, so you'll be busy the next spring. <laughs> yeah, to, to, to Jennifer's point, though, I, I I always find that if a board member has a question, it's probably something that members of our public have the same question. And the clear question I heard from you was, how is PBL being rolled out, not necessarily elementary school where you already pointed that, but how are we seeing that in other sites, including middle school? And I think Dr. Moore did have her hand up. Yeah, I don't know if it was for that. No, definitely. I was I was going to share that part of what we and, and, and Dr. Smith mentioned alluded to this briefly, but what we plan on doing is coming back to you to share um, tenants one and two. Tenant one focuses on the breadth of um, PBL implementation and support at all grade levels, right? Because yes, we want to make sure that we have this, the academies and we have our personalized project-based learning pathway, but even within our classrooms, right, at the high school, how can we incorporate more project-based learning experiences for students? How is it currently taking shape? And how are we building capacity for our teachers? So we have a plan in place for that. And that's been in place for quite some time since we initiated this work. So we've been training teachers and I'm sure Devon can step in and give just a little bit of information if, if um, 
board, board president um, gives us a little bit more time. And then CTE Pathways is the second tenant, right? So Dr. Devon, along with um, Ms. Polly Sheehan at Samuel High, and all of our CTE teachers have been working diligently to really take a closer look at our CTE Pathways, our courses, and create greater alignment and, um, and learn from what the rubric and what the criteria is around um, high quality and engaging CTE programs. So our teams, our teachers have been deeply involved in engaging in this work and our intention is to come to you to give you more, a more um, updated um, information on what's been taking place. But I can hand it over really quickly to Dr. Smith so he can give a little bit more about the, the professional development and then just CTE in a snapshot because I wanna honor the time that we have. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the question, Board Member Smith. Um, the PBL um, uh, number one initiative in terms of uh, the broad district-wide um, um, training of all the teachers that's been going well for, for the past, we started three years, two and a half years ago, excuse me. And we have to date uh, about 120 staff members, administrators and classroom teachers who have been trained. Now, during this COVID time, that's been very challenging, um, but we've still made do, um, but that has been uh, optional during this particular time because we don't wanna overwhelm the teachers who have a lot on their plate right now. And uh, we're being very sensitive to that. But I am there definitely to support. We have a whole network of teachers um, who are keeping it going. And so I'm definitely looking forward to presenting on that. And as far as CTE, especially uh, CTE, very, very passionate about learning and earning uh, while, while teachers, while, while students are in uh, their high school experience. So I am looking forward to it. I don't wanna take up much time right now, but. I acknowledge your question. I acknowledge that so many people don't understand what CTE is. As a matter of fact, some thought that it had to do with brain injury. And so I understand that. And so I'm definitely looking forward to cleaning that up. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. And thank you, Jennifer, for, for posing that question. Um, I'll go to Keith now for comments, board member comments. Great, thank you so much. Um, Initially, uh, I'd just like to say um, I appreciate um, the, um, the, the passion, the, the professionalism, and the, uh, the practice by uh, all the speakers, Dr. Drotty, uh, Dr. Mora, Dr. Shelton, um, uh, as well as the speakers from, from the Obama Center. Um, one of the things that was kind of clear to me in some of the remarks from uh, members were the clarity about making learning acceptable to all. And we can always talk about that through an equity lens, but just sit with that statement for a moment. Uh, and that really underscores the nature of a PBL uh, initiative as well as the academies. And so I'm excited to sort of see uh, those things continue to move uh, in that direction. Now, it's, it's clear that institutions that lead in research and innovation invest in their assets, and they invest in assets in people, and they invest in, in hard assets as well. And these assets drive transformative learning, and they drive uh, related uh, innovation and research and intellectual property uh, that comes with that. And that's what the district and leadership for the last number of years has set in place you know, at this time as we move forward. And there are examples of that, uh, whether it's you know, MIT Media Lab, whether it's the design school, the D school at Stanford, whether it's UCLA's Venture Lab or USC's Center for Computer System and Security, uh, and on and on and on. So the concept of not investing in that kind of infrastructure to move forward in that way, when you have examples of best practices of institutions that are doing that themselves, uh, it doesn't make sense to me in that way. And one would want to invest uh, the way that the best invest in their people. 
and I think that's what district leadership is moving forward, you know, with in that way. Now, one of the other things for me that's interesting as it relates to uh, the content or of uh, of an initiative is the output, and metrics sometimes can be very uh, banal, if you will. Um, however, uh, this evening, uh, it was really moved me to listen to these parents uh, speak of their children and the manner in which they did, for they know them uh, better than, than we. Uh, and to hear them talk about the self-determination, the, the self-agency, the independent thinking, uh, the exploration, uh, you know, the creation of the vision board, uh, the activity of working on a COVID, you know, uh, equity uh, initiative uh, as a young ninth grader. I mean, these are uh, amazing uh, experiences that uh, the student is sharing and that the parent is clearly uh, engaged with and happy to see occurring. And so those are our constituents, the teachers uh, themselves, the parents uh, and the students. And in this way, it was very empowering to hear them speak so positively uh, of, that, uh, of that programming. So I, uh, much like others described today, uh, am you know, fully uh, supportive uh, of the PBL program, uh, of the academies, uh, and in particular, uh, again, seeing the real world connectivity that's being uh, put forward with these programs, uh, allowing kids to explore, allowing kids to innovate, uh, allowing kids to look at potentially being entrepreneurs uh, and being their best selves. And so uh, I, can, I will continue to be fully supportive and uh, hope that we can continue to gain uh, additional uh, support uh, from community, community partners that are either private sector, uh, nonprofit or otherwise uh, to move these initiatives forward on behalf of the district and the district constituents. So, uh, so let's do that. Great, thank you, Keith. Um, and I will be the caboose, bring up the rear here tonight. Um, I would just like to talk briefly about the four year journey that I believe we've been on. And this is a four year journey since Dr. Drotty got here. It's a journey towards equity, um, not as a word, but as action. And if you look at all the pieces that have been put in place over the past four years, social justice framework, American cultures, ethnic studies, uh, resources into preschool, uh, expanding restorative justice, PBL, PPBL, CTE, talking about the academies. These are all aspects of what we are doing to drive engagement, um, to have opportunities for students that did not find opportunities in traditional education. Our schools work very well for certain students and they don't work well for others. It doesn't have to be one size fits all. We have the opportunity to show some flexibility. Dr. Shelton said it best. We are growing and enhancing existing programming. We are not building from scratch. We are building from existing programming based on student driven need. That's intrinsic, intrinsically motivated students. That's what we want. Um, so I'm really excited about these pieces that are put in place because we have people who, who talk Noguera, Noguera, Noguera. And then at the next sentence, they're saying, yeah, but you can't do that. What Noguera told us was put these in place it, it give nurture them and then let them grow. Don't change every two years. Um, there's a story that I was told back from a teacher that was the story that I'll never forget. He said it's the equivalent of going to a garden and planting radishes on Monday and then going out Tuesday afternoon and standing over the dirt and say, grow, damn it, because I'm having a dinner party tonight and I need to make a salad. It, it doesn't work that way. So I, I, I'm really, I see this and maybe because it's, I'm a board member and we need to communicate it better. I see the pieces being put into place. It's all part of this. Um, and we don't have to take away from anybody to add these things. No one is losing anything. We're trying to create more opportunity. Maybe your child will find a way to access things you never thought they'd want to access. 
This is not a binary decision where if we have that, you can't have this. These are the students we've talked about for decades. And they're not all socio disadvantaged. They don't, not all this, that, or the other. They are any student in our district who is not engaged in school. So I'm really excited by all this. I like it. Um, I like that we're allowing kids to fail. Let kids fail a little bit, not fail big, just fail a little and get back up. Um, and the last thing I'll say is I do think our families would be a whole lot happier. Look at what Dr. Shelton did with just blocks with that, with uh, flex time. Imagine what we're going to do when we create, when we get away from this arcane schedule that locks kids into six periods a day for 40 weeks a year. Just wait till we crack that thing and create opportunity and access for all these students. So that's what I've got to say. And I know Dr. Drotty wanted to close this topic. So we will let Dr. Drotty be the real caboose. But Dr. Uh, Dr. John, yes. Before you go to, to, to Dr. Drotty, can I just say oh, one thing? I know I said I wouldn't do this, but here goes. Um, there was a speaker who, I think it was Jean Kaneko who, who brought up uh, TikTok. And, uh, and we talked a lot about, but I'm an old guy who like, I go, I'm on that TikTok. I'm telling you, that is a powerful tool what the young people are using. So when just in, in the spirit of what, uh, what everyone, all of our peers have said, but particularly what Craig said, maybe we are communicating or marketing in, in, with old tools and we need some people to tell us what the most effective tools are in this current moment. And that TikTok appears to be pretty powerful with young people. So if we're looking to get the word out to the, to the kids, and we heard about the TikToks that were going on there at the Obama Center. I just want to put a, a word out for that. And then Dr. Jardy, please, pretty please, as soon as this COVID thing is over, can we get Keith and get Jen to go to CART and get them up on the tour that the rest of us have had? Thank you. Okay, Dr. Jardy, bring it home. Yeah, so uh, you guys covered it all. I think you summarized some of the stuff I was going to say, John. Uh, I'll talk about just three things, three, bu three bullet points here. I'm always sensitive to what people may read into just as we as we talk about issues and all that. Uh, I, want, I want to make sure, particularly for my Malibu families out there, uh, although we were talking about predominantly Malibu, uh, Santa Monica School, uh, Santa Monica High School, there's a great plan happening in Malibu, which we will actually uh, uh, bring back later. I mean, I'm excited of what's being developed out there. They've been engaged with CART teachers on a regular basis. Actually, they're probably a little farther ahead with the engagement with the CART teachers uh, about the design of curriculum and all that. And so, so I can't wait to be able to share that. So I want the Malibu families to, to know that your investment and your measure M, all that is, is coming along. So, uh, so I can't, we, we can't wait to share that. Uh, John alluded to this other part, this other bullet point is that this shift is not a zero sum game. And uh, uh, let, let me back up. When we talk about closing the gap in achievement, it's not a, a zero sum thing. Somebody is not going to lose something. And, uh, and, and unfortunately that, that term is what we have to live with, but this is really about um, a, a, an engagement gap or a relevance gap. And, and learning is a personal thing. It has context. It, has, it, it involves context, people understanding the world around them to be able to engage in it. And, and uh, I, I, and the, the archaic system that we've always used in education is doing what it's designed to do. I mean, uh, if you look at the inception of education and all that, a lot of the groups we're talking about weren't considered as a part of that plan. They, they just, it came in after the fact, but the, but the structure of it is still uh, is set up in that way. So this is just implementing this, our students, and, and I say this with fact because the schools that we visited whether it be at Dos Pueblos, with an engineering academy, with Amir, Shahi, uh, Amir uh, or a CART, you will see that you see artistic, uh, UT, uh, autistic students, special education students, uh, Latinx students, African-American students, AP uh, students, uh, uh, white students, all incorporated in problem solving about the world. And in fact, it is those students' experiences that make each project uh, worthwhile. If you have this homogeneous group that have this similar experience, they're not gonna ask the other question that somebody else might be asking for you to look into. So the more diverse you are, the, the more, the more this, this allows for everyone to learn. So, so, so I just wanna 
And so as we talk about achievement gap and all that, I just want to, I'm sensitive to people constantly thinking that somehow we're going to, we're, uh, we're going to impede the learning of uh, 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 white students or students that will need this, uh, that will be successful in a traditional sense. And we're not doing that. I think everybody, everybody learns from this. Uh, and then, um, and then I think in terms of what Laurie said, uh, said earlier, yes, this is good teaching. And uh, 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 Dr. Smith will come back and explain what we're doing to broaden this approach. I think if you if you go to Dos Pueblos, in which we'll take another trip to for those that haven't seen it yet, you will go in there. And I, I was there when Amir Shahir was starting his academy, engineering academy. He was in a box, he had a cl traditional classroom, stuff everywhere until he, they dreamed up of a facility and all of a sudden they have a full fledged factory in which students are creating robots. They're, they're doing all, yeah, it's hard to explain unless you see it yourself, but without that facility, they wouldn't be where they are right now. It's impossible. It would be impossible because they, they wouldn't have the infrastructure to do what they need to do. Same for CART, those, are, those of you that went to CART that saw the multimedia labs in which they incorporated art, English, and I think filming is somewhat, and they have all these different uh, places where students can do films, they can do uh, the drawing and, and, and coding and things that they develop. But without that facility, there's no way they can get to where they are there without those facilities uh, supporting it. So uh, so, um, so the teaching is essential, but uh, dang it, the facilities help uh, you know, catapult the, the, the product at the end of the day. So so the two, the two I think are, are um, and, and make it things just make it make it just much better. So anyway, I'll stop here, and uh, and I, I bring that up because uh, hopefully it's a transition to our next topic. Terrific. Yeah, so, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Johnny. Thank you for mentioning the Malibu aspect of that. I had written myself a note, and my handwriting is so bad I forgot to say it. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, just to let the public and my colleagues and staff know, we're looking at at least another three and a half hours to discuss this next issue because there are probably two hours of public comments. So I want people to be aware. If you need to grab a cup of tea or whatever you wanna do, plan ahead. Um, but that said, this is so important what we're talking about, which is why we're not rushing anybody. This is the education of our students. This is our mission. This is equity and access for all. So we're not gonna rush through this. So that said, I'm gonna to go to the next item on our agenda which is discussion item F1. I'm assuming it's F1, it's the only item we have. It's not on my agenda here. And I believe we'll kick it over to Carrie and Steve to lead this off. That's right. Uh, okay. Carrie and Steve, take it away. Let me bring up my screen and get it all set up. Um, okay, can you see the full uh, slide? Yes. Show? Okay, great. Good. All right. Uh, 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 Board of Education, Dr. Drotti, uh, uh, thank you for uh, giving us this time uh, to, to speak uh, and having this uh, special meeting uh, to work. It's really, really important. We, we, will, we have a lot to cover, a lot we want to discuss. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for this uh, time. Uh, I'm Carrie Upton, uh, Chief Operations Officer. Uh, and so um, I, I, we've heard so many great things in the last uh, few hours about the programs that are going to be going into this and education and practice. And now we're going to talk a little bit about education and physical space. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Drotti was just saying, you know, I mean, learning can occur under a tree, you know, with a teacher and students. However, if you give the teachers and the students the best tools, it really does make a difference. And it does change uh, the whole shape and quality of learning. And we feel like uh, the Santa Monica students really deserve, the Samo High students deserve and can use and will really make the most of the best facilities. Uh, so um, tonight, um, this is an update on what we've been doing. Uh, it's telling you where we're going, uh, giving you some looks at some ideas and some things that are moving forward. Uh, uh, the direction uh, that we uh, are asking for uh, is that you specifically tell us to move on and continue following the direction that you've given us or to change or shift that direction. Uh, uh, it is uh, 
in, in no way just us moving along in the way that we want. We are following your direction and telling us which way we need to go. Uh, so this, uh, it'll be uh, myself and Steve Massetti, our bond program manager. Uh, we will tag team as we always do. We also have a couple special guests uh, to come in and speak with us. And so I'll turn it over to Steve and here we go. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, as was indicated in the, um, the board agenda item, we're gonna review a few things. We're gonna first talk about our progress to date. Um, by the way, this reminds me of that uh, you guys have probably seen the memes going around of how it started and how it's going. Uh, so we're gonna do that. We're gonna talk about how we started and then uh, how it's going now when we talk about discovery building. And then we'll talk about where we're going in the future with our, our upcoming phase three project. So go ahead, Carrie. So first we, we wanna review some of our progress to date. This, this goes back to the inception of the uh, Samo High campus plan. Um, and the and really kind of starts with what we consider phase zero of the Samo High campus plan, which is the innovation building. It was kind of the, the first block in our tower of what became the Samo High campus plan. Um, so I, I know this is a lot of words. I'm not gonna go through all of these. Uh, we're going to see a couple of them updated, I mean, highlighted rather in a, a few slides. And of course, many of these you've seen in our, our previous uh, uh, presentations, but uh, th this is just the, the work that has been done on our uh, interim and miscellaneous projects since uh, the inception of the campus plan. Go ahead, Carrie. Oh, sorry. I should have said it was some of the work because here is some more of the work that's been done at Sam Ohio. Um, and you know, on, on this, I think, again, we'll see a few of these in a minute, but some of these have been things that have been around for a while. So the, the one I want to point out here is the music building flooding repair. Uh, that's a, an issue where we've had some, uh, some leaks in, I think it was both uh, choir and band. band. Um, and, and those have been happening for years and they, it leaks through the wall and, and had a hard time, we being the district has had a hard time for Quite a while figuring it out and fixing it, but uh, just last year we were able to uh, get those knocked out. The uh, the repairs look great, and the the rooms now look great, and we didn't have any flooding when it rained quite a bit uh, a week or two ago. Go ahead, Carrie. So we'll start with the innovation building. I'm going to uh, ask Catherine Baxter, who uh, is the was the dean of students at uh, Samo High to talk about this. Um, and, and of course, we have a few quotes here from when the uh, innovation building opened. I'm not going to read them all, but the one that stands out to me and, and I think kind of inspires me as we go forward through the, the implementation of our uh, Samo High campus plan is the, the last one on the page here um, from Brian, class of 2016, when he says, this building shows what Samo High students deserve to learn in and teachers deserve to teach in. And that really is, that's the feeling we want when our, our students and our teachers move into these uh, buildings and into these classrooms. Um, and I, and I, I think you should all be commended for that because that's what we're actually delivering. So with that, uh, I'd like to introduce Catherine Baxter uh, and go ahead, Catherine, take it away. Thank you. Good evening. I've had the privilege to be a part of Samuel High Construction for almost 30 years, and it has been a privilege. As Samuel High was about to reach her 100th birthday on this site, we changed our thought process of planning construction to look ahead to the Samo High of the next century. We did not want to just fix the facilities that were broken. We wanted to look forward to an entire campus build out to meet the student needs, um, not for yesterday, not for today, but for tomorrow. 15 years ago, we looked at our exceptional school with a hundred year old deteriorating facility and knew that our teachers and students deserved a plan to bring the entire school facility up to its instructional programs. First, we embarked on the innovation building that you see in the picture. We had so much fun designing this new building, the first one on the Samuel High campus since the 1960s. The students and teachers tested different types of furniture, our AP stats, class made a project out of gathering information, running surveys, interpreting the data. You should have read some of their questions. They were hilarious. Um, the Samuel High administrative 
as the Samuel High Administrator responsible for facilities, I always heard about every problem and everything that was broken school-wide. But I also got to hear some of the oohs and ahs when the Innovation Building was open, to watch our football team make snow angels in our first synthetic field. Blockers. As you can see on the screen, as Steve said, we've shared some of our student comments with you. I've watched math lessons using the architectural drawings and the room to teach similarity, ratio, and proportion. The choir has used the Innovation Building and Centennial Quad for Sweet Serenade since the first October we had opened it. Project Lead the Way has shared their project fair here. Back on campus with the Discovery Building and the Innovation Building, our College Center will want to host their annual college fair in the North Campus. Just last week, Mr. Halls was texting me, what about having afternoon tea and a song on the roof of the new Discovery Building? Our teachers are thinking about how to use the space in different ways. As a full campus approached to visioning the Sam High campus of the future is an investment in our community's future. While we work together with our maintenance and operations department team to incorporate the projects that need to be completed to keep Sam High moving forward, um, we will have um, our director of Sam High projects, Mr. Alan Bratbeck, to talk about uh, what we've been doing recently. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Kerry, we have operating slides. Can you click on the next one? Thank you. So, yeah, let's start with that one. So we've made a tremendous amount of progress in the land, you know, on various projects and a whole lot of different projects since innovation was complete. Um, a lot of these are not sexy projects. You won't see much of them. You know, we actually finished the project and nobody actually even knows it's there. But it, these, these different projects basically fall into three different categories. You know, the first one is a campus development. And all of these are actually being done for the, uh, the completion of the whole campus, the full build out of the um, Samo High campus plan. Um, so there's a lot of infrastructure and stuff that's gone into place to make that happen. The second one is campus uh, implementation projects which are basically designed to improve existing facilities. Um, and we'll get into a little bit more detail about that in a minute. Uh, the third one are repair projects. And these are projects that are beyond the scope of m and but projects that need to be, need repairs. So Steve actually highlighted one just now. Uh, that is a music building with those two leaks or leaks in the two different classrooms, which um, we very successfully uh, resolved. But uh, if we just go into some, some detail about some of those other things, Steve had a slide up there earlier on of all those li list of, of, of projects. But, and I want to run through just some of the highlights. So like, for example, down the old Michigan alignment, uh, we did a whole lot of um, backbone projects we put in there. We put in a whole new gas line, which is going to feed uh, Discovery Phase 3, Phase 4, and any of the other future, future um, developments. Uh, we did the same thing for the fire water line, which basically comes from innovation. Uh, we have a, a, a booster pump station in innovation, which can feed um, fire water to the whole campus. Um, we've got that installed. We've got uh, electrical. We've got data. We've got a whole bunch of different facilities that we've actually put into place in a number of different places in the campus, which is already part of the campus plan, the development of that whole long-term plan. Um, then some of the other projects, um, the demolition of the science and tech building, which obviously had to be demolished for uh, the discovery project. Um, we installed a new transformer, which is now going to be sufficiently large to be able to power up the whole campus. Um, we completed that uh, last year. Um, interim classrooms. I know that doesn't feel like a project because it's interim, albeit that there's nothing more permanent than interim. But um, uh, that's what we did. We put those four classrooms on the tennis court so that we could, we could go ahead of the development of the, of the campus. Um, hopefully, they are going to be interim and we will be able to get rid of them uh, before too long. 
um, we installed the Autocall uh, fire alarm system. Um, this is a, an upgraded system which is going to save the campus a whole lot of money in the future. Um, but we took the initiative to actually install that campus wide um, and it's now being installed in Discovery as well and will be installed in phase three. Um, we started a Salter pilot lock uh, system, which was a pilot project um, to put electronic locks into, we started off with business, I mean, with um, Barnum and Music, uh, installed locks through, you know, in those two buildings. So there's, it's a total keyless entry. Uh, that's going to be expanded now into the rest of the campus uh, and then ultimately uh, district wide. Um, PA's, P, the PA system on, on, at Samo High was, um, was really falling apart. Um, but we installed this whole new PA clock system uh, on, in, into the campus, um, campus wide, except for the buildings that are going to get demolished. We actually got a system where we put into place where we didn't have to um, um, take those out and we could actually adapt them. Um, campus wide cameras. We installed this, these campus, uh, we started off with perimeter cameras and there's some internal cameras. Uh, Discovery is going to continue with that process, but we put all the infrastructure and things like that into place. Um, we've done city water relo uh, relocation uh, down on Michigan as well. It's a sort of city water line. Uh, we started installing gates and things like that. Um, let's move on to the second category. So the second one is campus improvement projects. So like, for example, the, that uh, the new football field, you can see the turf in that picture up there. That's, uh, that was one of those we'd consider to be um, an improvement to the campus itself. Um, barn and blinds, those acoustical blinds, you can see they're difficult to, to see that they're actually the two, those two vertical things on the left-hand side of the picture. Uh, and they're basically to improve the, the quality of sound depending on the type of performance in Barnum, but it's to stop the resonance or to increase the resonance or to do whatever it is uh, to tune the, the, the sound so, so it improves sound. Um, we did the library refresh. It's actually in, in a, on another picture, uh, the next page, uh, next slide. That's, I think, in fact, uh, I think Dr. Shelton actually talked about it a little bit earlier on, but that there's a couple of pictures there on the left-hand side. Um, Campus-wide HVAC, HVAC. So every single uh, building in the whole campus that is not scheduled for demolition is now air conditioned. So it that became that is quite a quite a milestone trying to um, install retrofit all these buildings with um, HVAC systems, and uh, it's now working and it's all working very successfully. Um, replacement of the track uh, and the. The replacement of the, of the the track lighting and also uh, installing track uh, installing um, lighting on um, on on baseball field. We installed the new baseball field, the new or upgraded the the baseball field. We installed a new softball field. Um, we've another another thing which we did is we actually put a whole new data system in throughout uh, the campus. One of the reasons we put it in was because. We're putting in these new fire alarm systems. We're putting in the a whole lot of little low voltage uh, type of services. So we upgraded all of the the data system uh, on the campus, and we're now going to be adding to that. But at least we are up to speed, and we have the right sort of speed with with all the data that we need. Um, innovation. We we put a, a solar system onto onto elevation into onto the innovation building. There we have some pictures there. Uh, and we've got a bat battery storage system that was, was put in and as part of that. We also obviously going to be putting in solar systems, um, PV systems on uh, discovery, both PV uh, as well as water, um, solar water heaters. Uh, and then obviously in phase two as well, phase three and then. Uh, Olympic Spur, we reconfigured the Olympic Spur down what, uh, just off Olympic. Um, between 5th Street and the 6th Street entrance, or Viking Way as it's called now. Uh, that was a nasty little corner down there, and we've reconfigured it, and we're actually uh, able to utilize the space a whole lot more effectively, uh, including trash uh, and all that kind of stuff. So we've got, got that area taken care of. Um, there are a whole bunch of other things that we, we did, which were those campus improvement projects. Um, 
then to move on to the last category is repair projects beyond the scope of, of um, M&O. Uh, so the music building was the one. Another one, we had a lot of leaking in business building. And we, we had a, pro a project in there where we, we totally sorted the leaking out in the, in the business building as well. Um, and then another one was the, the reconstruction of tennis court number seven. Um, it was all over the place and cracked up and broken, couldn't be used. Uh, and we installed a new post-tensioned uh, slab in there and, and uh, re-established uh, tennis court number seven. So, so all in all, there've been a lot of these projects, a lot of which can't be seen. Um, and a lot of them has, have laid the foundation for the completion of, or the future completion of, of the whole um, summer high campus plan. Um, and in so doing, we've actually checked off a lot of things off the list. Um, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get to create the wrong impression where we think that there's nothing left to do. I mean, there are always going to be things left to be, to be done on the campus to upgrade them to do whatever has to be done. Um, but we really have made major master, major strides in, in our quest to get the campus ready for, for the future phases, as well as upgrading whatever we possibly can. So that's where we are right now. Steve? All right, great. Thank you, Alan. Uh, so the, the next couple slides are about our uh, Samo High campus plan process, how we got where we are. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go in, into much detail on this because, um, frankly, you've, you've all seen it before. It's been discussed ad nauseum, I think, uh, both um, orally as well as uh, all over um, social media. But laying out here our process, one thing I do want to point out, uh, one of the main um, uh, reasons that we're, we're talking about this tonight is about the history building and the removal thereof. Um, and I, I think it is important to, to point out that um, these plans were not done in secret. And uh, you know, if we were trying to keep it a secret, uh, we, we would have done, a, I think, a pretty awful job at it. Um, at every single public meeting, we, we included plans that showed removal of the history building. This has been a part of the project and a part of the plan uh, since the beginning. Uh, go ahead, Carrie. Um, and then this, of course, once we had got through the uh, development of the, the Samuel High campus plan, we went through the CEQA process. Um, again, I think that's been well detailed, uh, but just to kind of wrap this all together, um, the, the board uh, took official action to certify the EIR and approve the Samuel High campus plan uh, a little over, a little under two years ago. Um, and then, at, you know, after that, we started the process of uh, building the phase one project, phase one and two, which is discovery building. And that leads us into uh, our next section where we're gonna talk about kind of the big thing that we're doing now. And I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie, who's gonna finally get a chance to talk. As soon as he unmutes himself. As soon as I unmute myself, thank you. So uh, the cornerstone, the real uh, major project that we've been working on uh, with Measure uh, ES funds uh, is what we now call the Discovery Building. Uh, so the board directed us uh, as we were rolling out the campus plan, they asked the question, well, what if we did phase one and phase two at the same time? Uh, and then we were also looking at where we were with parking and the board said, well, what if we add another layer of parking? So this has grown to be a rather sizable project but it's also a major innovative project that's going to deeply impact uh, the school. And what I love about this slide is here you see what it was in imagination. This is something we showed uh, a, a few years ago as, as the designs were coming. And then as I change the slide, he tries to change the slide. Here you start seeing how, the, how it's changing, how it's actually coming into fruition. Uh, this building, uh, which is, uh, moving forward on schedule uh, to, to be open. Uh, it's, it's going to be heading towards what it's going to do. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what this building is and where it, uh, how it fits in the, in the whole campus. Uh, and I'm going to shift and Steve's gonna talk a little bit about the schedule to begin. Thank you. Um, so uh, at this point we are 77% of the way through construction on a cost basis, that's as of uh, our last um, period where we would have that number, which was the billing date of 1231. 
as of that date, we were 78% of the way through the uh, duration of the schedule. So in other words, we've used up 78% of the days. We've so far spent 77% of the cost. Um, that shows you that we're tracking pretty well, um, but it's also moderately coincidental that they're so close. Um, construction spending on a uh, on any project uh, generally follows a, a sort of bell curve. It may be a skewed bell curve that leans not right towards the middle of the project, but a little bit later in the project. And, and I think that probably makes sense on its face. You know, when we think about what are the things that are done at the beginning of a project? Well, it's grading. And, and really until the grading is done, you're not doing much else. So our expenditure at the beginning of a project is low. As you get toward the end, you end up with you know, sometimes 25 or more trades working at the same time. So naturally the, the spending uh, is higher towards the end of the project. And this is a, a kind of, it looks like a, about an inflection point. Um, we're gonna get to the point where pretty soon we will have spent more uh, dollars than, than we have days. Uh, and then eventually those will both uh, top out when we get to the, uh, sorry, they'll even out when we get to the end of the project. Our schedule right now shows we're about 26 days behind schedule. Um, that sounds scary. But I would like to point out that 18 of those days are an allowance for rain, which leaves a net eight working days behind schedule um, out of a you know, project that is a uh, year and a half or a year and a half or more long. Uh, that, that really isn't, um, it's really not bad. But more importantly, um, we've worked with the contractor and they've been able to resequence some of their critical path activities, which, get, which will bring us back on schedule. Uh, in addition, thanks to the fact that um, there haven't been students around for nine months. We've been able to get a lot of non-critical path activities way ahead of schedule. Uh, so at this point, we are confident that we're on track to be open for students in August. Uh, obviously, some, you know, th there could be issues that, that arise from that, but uh, we're, we're certainly on track for that right now. Administration areas. Um, three of the classrooms for the interim classes will go into this, 19 classrooms for history. So this essentially re replaces what's in the history building with the house offices and the classrooms. That was the plan was to get everything out of the uh, history building and into this space. Four classes from business, four from language, three from English, four from innovation. There's a little bit of other shifting around, but everything that that's goes into this space. So it creates 37 classrooms on an average size of 1,240 square feet. Now remember that the standard is 960, but a lot of our classrooms in other spaces are even less than that. So it really gives us room to teach in a lot of multiple ways. It means there's other ways to teach than just the, the teacher standing in front of students lined up in a row that just barely squeeze in. Uh, it also includes uh, three additional science labs, uh, the commissary kitchen, a large cafeteria with open space right outside of it so that all of the students can be engaged and connected during the cafeteria experience. Staff resource room, multi-purpose rooms, uh, the large courtyard, Parking, both subterranean and surface, which replaces us and gets us back to the parking that we had when we began the innovation building. So it means that we no longer need to rent parking someplace else. We're able to get everybody back on campus. Our rooftop learning space, uh, photovoltaics, thermal distribution, lot, and the pool, uh, Olympic sized swimming pool that will actually allow for uh, uh, a lot of water for swimming and that allow also for community activity. We're talking to the, with the city of Santa Monica about that very, that thing very today. Also a new campus wide MDF, which is our sort of electronic brain of the, of the campus that runs all of our computer systems. Uh, so it is a lot of things that go into it, but what makes this building really incredible is that it's designed and built on an open building concept. So one of the things we learned and as we were talking is education is changing and it's changing rather dramatically. And even as we were talking about this building, the question was how far and what could we do? You know, what's the right, you know, how can we be ready in three years when we're designing it for it to open? But more than that, how will it be ready for decades to come? So here's a layout of the second floor. What's important about this is to know that this is the configuration that we're opening with. Uh, larger classrooms, lots of common areas, breakout spaces, a lot of different areas for different types of learning, a lot of ways that students can both work independently and work in groups. But what's even really exciting about this is that this whole space 
can adapt and change. So it's very resilient. It's very sustainable. Over time, as we need to, we can go in and over a summer, after five, 10 years, 15 years of use, we can say, let's reorganize this entire space and actually change the rooms and make them different to serve how education is changing. In some ways, this is the adaptive reuse we wish we could do on the history building, but the history building is not built this way. But this is the first major K-12 open building that actually is built to grow and adapt with education. So how you see that, it, one of the thing, one of the major parts of that is that it's built with a underfloor uh, system where the ventilation and utilities are all on these floors, on this raised floor. You can see where it's open in the little checkerboard pattern. You can see on the top slide where all the things are underneath and then the finished floor. Then the walls are built on top of this floor, which is what allows us to shift and move everything because you don't have conduits, power, gas, water running through those walls, you have that able to shift around. That's what's going to make this building adjustable and adaptable, but it's also trying to meet the students where they are for where they are in education. So the Discovery Building, it's coming, it's moving. You see pictures of where the pool is getting put in. They're finally, fit, you know, they'll finally take off the scaffolding as soon as they finish the access points to get into all the different spaces. This uh, campus, this building will impact the campus in between innovation and discovery. We will have three fifths of the classrooms, the houses, the major sort of academic activities in new buildings. So the students will be in new spaces. And yet we move on. So as we've moved along, the Sam Ojai campus plan has adapted uh, and has changed. And the whole idea is we are always moving to adapt and moving to shift as education demands. So this was the original view of uh, the campus plan. You see phase one and two got put together. We were able to move the pool outdoors, which was able to give us a much larger pool and put those two and build those at the same time. And then we shifted to now as we plan for phase three, three A and three B. One of the things we did as we discussed this is we came back to the board and we said some things are changing. Uh, both there's some program programmatic changes and also we're looking at our uh, enrollment over time. And it's like, we might be able to shift and maybe lose one of the phases, which saves hundreds of millions of dollars over the time of the campus plan uh, and a lot of time. But we also had some ideas of how that would sort of shift and move. So we came to the board and said, here's some ideas. How can we move this? And you know how can we how can we shift? Also, another thing we've looked at is how there was a call to keep more of Prospect Hill. Originally, in the master plan, we were going to make it more flat for accessibility. But there was an idea that if we kept a little bit of that rise, it both respects it, but also we could figure out a way to get folks uh, over. So it, it so our phase five will change and adapt a little bit, which now will become the new phase four. Uh, and so we still know there are some changes occurring, but this is where we're going. So in that adaptation, as we started working with our designers, this was presented on 10, 17, 19, uh, and the board gave direction to move forward. We had a shift in phase three, which sort of took a little bit more expansion for what now is known as the exploration building, and also in a, a, a shift of how the gym would come in place. One of the things that we really learned is that was that if we could build the new gym, um, the gold gym and maintain the south gym at the same time and be able to continue using the south gym while we were building the gold gym, it was going to save us millions of dollars in swing space cost that we would have had to just throw away. We'd use it for a few years and then throw it away. So we'd rather have that money in the buildings that will impact student education and, and uh, recreation for years to come. So that was one of the changes. That also allowed us to create a lot more green space and open, and we'll talk about that in a, in a moment. So here's what we showed you on uh, 1017 of how we were shifting around the program to uh, adapt to that. Now we know that one of the things that we talked about in this was by moving phase four, phase three, the classroom library building out of that area was that we wouldn't need as many classrooms in the future 
but we also were deferring the library, which is one of the reasons why you gave us direction. And we've now gone in and updated uh, the existing library, gave it a refresh for an experience that would have a different uh, life and experience. So that's some, some of the things that have shifted. Also this bottom line, as we've been moving for swing space, we realize we don't need the swing space of the pool as a gymnasium. So it's going to be going out soon. Also the art building will be going out a little bit sooner, but the South gym will be a little deferred. But we always talked about, these were some of the things that were going to be uh, demoed. So uh, hang on a second, as I make sure that I am the next speaker. I am. You, Steve takes over. I was thinking this is where Steve takes over. Steve. Uh, so this is, we're showing the footprint of uh, the, the project here. And as you can see, it is a significant portion of the campus. We'll be working with the contractor to minimize the amount of that footprint that's taken at once. Uh, but in, in some ways, you know, a lot of it's going to have to be taken all at the same time. Uh, we'll be able to take down, uh, our plan is this summer to um, take down uh, Drake Pool the uh, cafeteria building, the history building, and the art building. Um, as Carrie mentioned, we're planning to retain a uh, significant portion of the height of uh, Prospect Hill. So if, if we're able to have the contractor um, bring that into a usable condition, uh, once, we, we obviously after we've gotten through demo, um, when we can open up that area and uh, give some of the open space back to students, we'll, we will do that. Um, but again, overall, this is the, this is the footprint of, of the project. Go ahead, Carrie. So, uh, th this is a, this is the original history building. Back then it was called the, uh, academic and administration building. Um, you can see it was built in, uh, 1913 originally in the, in the Renaissance re revival style. Um, some of the key elements here are the, those rounded arch openings. Uh, the, the pitched roof, the, the brick cladding. In fact, the, if you look at the picture on the left, that we included that so that you could, you could see the, um, the, the surface, the brick surface there. Um, as many people know, uh, unreinforced brick is not super great for uh, earthquakes. And so when uh, there was a Long Beach earthquake in 1933, uh, this building was effectively destroyed. It was built in 1937 uh, in, the, in the PWA modern style. Uh, and what we ended up with was uh, the history building as we see it today. Well, not as we see it today, but the history building. That was modified in 1960, and from that we ended up with the history building as we see it today. So, and the, you know, this upper picture, obviously, it's kind of a panoramic view. And, and one of the reasons we included that is to show that at that time when this was built, this was the school. I think the English building was built right around the same time, but it was the entirety of the school. And obviously the school has grown up around it. One of the things that we've seen is that this is the um, this was the front door. This was seen as the front door of the school, and and clearly it looks like it should be the front door of the school. Now it's buried within the middle of it. Go ahead, Carrie. Okay, I already did. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Um, so what we're seeing here is uh, this is the um, current view, and and um, we're dealing here with a lot of the modifications that were um, made in the 1960 uh, modernization. Uh, which included demolition of the auditorium wing, which I believe was on the right-hand side. All of the windows were replaced. Um, the, there, was, there were a few additions in there. Some of the more prominent things that would have uh, contributed to this building being a significant, uh, or rather to the significance of this building as a historic resource um, were the, the, the canopy that projected above the entrance with the classic lettering that was there. Um, and then we, we've also made some changes that were functional. So. Um, punching in the metal wall vents in, into the exterior walls, adding lights to the building, uh, which you can see in that picture on the left. And there's a few other things like cameras and so forth that have been added. Uh, and then of course that the, the front area, the formal approach has, um, has been uh, modified significantly. We've had to add a number of switchback ramps for, um, for accessibility and uh, we've added metal railings as well. So, okay, go ahead, Carrie. Here, what we're seeing is the, the two pictures we've got are the picture on the left, and I that is from the 1950s. And I know that not because I'm an expert in women's fashion of the 50s, but because that building hasn't looked like that since 1960. Um, and, and we can see that there are, are really two primary elements of the building um, aesthetically that remain. Um, that's the, those concrete tiles at the, uh, the curved entrance there. 
and the um, horizontal score lines in the parapet. Uh, I mentioned the windows have changed. You can see here that the doors have also changed. Um, most of the pictures that you, you've probably seen on uh, social media talking about, you know, preserving history, um, they, they, they're pictures from the 1950s. And one of those, you can see that, that old classic uh, con fluted concrete um, light standards with the, the large white bulb on top, or rather, I guess it's a, the, the glass diffuser on top. Um, those are gone. They've been replaced with, uh, as you can see on the right, anodized aluminum um, light poles. In fact, in the picture on the left, you can also see there, it's a little teeny square um, by, by the ladies there that uh, was a lighting uh, style that really, you know, it fits the time. It's no longer there. So Carrie, let's go on to the next one. So that is all, all of that has been studied. That was uh, as part of the um, EIR, there was a, a, a um, historic analysis of the history building as well as other buildings on campus. And without going through all of this, a lot of it is what I've just talked about. The bottom line is the bottom of the slide. Due to the cumulative effect of the alterations over time, the history building does not retain sufficient integrity to convey its significance. For this reason, it does not appear to meet the criteria for individual listing in the National Resource uh, National Register of Historic Places or the California Register of Historic Resources and therefore is not considered a historic resource, resource for the purposes of CEQA. Go ahead, Carrie. I think so, Carrie, you're taking this, yeah? I'm taking it. So one of the things that, that we, we looked into and it became relatively obvious at the beginning of the campus plan uh, was how the history building was unsuitable. In many ways, many of us already understood and knew this whenever we were, we were going into it. And so, you know, our, our goal is to provide the best education and best facilities for our students. And as education is evolving, the history building really is not serving the needs of Samo High. So one of the, so there are many factors and I'm not gonna go through this entire list. Uh, class sizes in the 1970s, pre-Prop 13 were 27. Now they tend to rise up to 37. Uh, you know, we need differing rooms and spaces for collaboration present, presentation. The seismic and structural deficiencies are, are significant in this space and, to, and, and they, they make adaptive reuse impractical. Um, and those things that would be significant have been removed. So we've looked at a number of these things. We have ADA issues that, uh, and you know, this is why the design contract was approved. We've been moving forward uh, and the campus plan sort of leads us to that and the EIR and campus plans were approved without objection. So just as a way to sort of look at that, this is a picture of the second floor uh, of the history building. And part of the challenge in the structure is that it, it's, it's what we call a double loaded corridor. So, it, you know, you see the hallway in the middle and the classes on the side because of the structure of the building, and particularly because this building was built on what remained of the 1913 building after the earthquake, shoring up or changing the structure is very difficult. One of the things you might notice is how small the classrooms are. Uh, 659, 689, 960 is the state standard, and we feel like in our EdSpec standard, it's actually up around 1,200 square feet. So you might imagine how hard it is to cram a number of students into these spaces. And you might take out some of the internal walls, but what you end up with is with classrooms that are long and narrow and are no, no longer functional in the same way that we need them to be. And they're certainly not gonna serve the need for the classrooms that we need for art, for, uh, for, the, for the academies, for the, for the more expansive spaces that aren't just tr traditional classrooms. Catherine. Yes. So as I think about my time at Samuel High, in every decade since I first entered as a student in the 1970s, I have many bright lights and smiles. I think about Mr. Kearsley's geography class in the 10th grade in H207. I think about the fact that, as Carrie just said, it was 27 to 1, and we never had a class that was 27 to 1. They were always less than 27. Presenting scholarship and honors information to Mr. Jimenez's class in H214, going every Friday morning to drop-ins with the resource staff 
in H120, having Mr. Escalera call me in and say, look, look, see the football field. I said, what am I looking at? He said, it's the first time the field lights have been on in the last three years since we've had the field light poles up. These are so many memories that will always be with me as I think about my time at Samuel High. As I got deeper into improving our campus facility, I learned that trying to upgrade a building never was as easy as you thought it should be. We tried taking three classrooms and turning them into two. We tried smaller furniture. We tried running conduit and raceway everywhere. When I became an administrator, one of my assignments was the campus safety plan. This task in partnership with facilities had me looking at this place that holds my heart so tightly with new lenses. The day I responded to a student having a seizure in Mr. Oakla's room in H210, where we had to evacuate the students and move all the classroom furniture before the paramedics could even get into the room, to have students have to enter their classrooms from the back of the room like loading an airplane, otherwise they're climbing over their classmates, as you can see from the pictures that are on the screen. Our students and faculty deserve classrooms where there is flexibility to the instructional space, the windows open, technology works, where we're not band-aiding to keep the building just standing. When I send out my, our project information updates or present to our faculty, there is an excitement and interest. We've used flex time to have students to visit and discover the, to visit the discovery site, as you saw in the uh, Dr. Shelton's video, instead of just looking over the fence. When we began our work on phase three, we brought together a group of excited educators and students to program the Exploration Building and Gold Gym. Even through Zoom focus group meetings, our students are insightful and don't hold back on what they, their needs are. You heard Ms. Snyder sh share her excitement in Dr. Shelton's video. Entire departments have come involved in looking at their specific areas. Those who are closest to our students, as well as the students themselves, are helping to create this new space that will make learning more accessible for all of our students. The planning stage can be energizing as we envision the next chapter in this book that makes Samuel High what it can be. Those of us of a certain age will remember and always have our fond memories of bygone times, but they are more about the interactions we had with the people than the building. We can be sad that the science and technology buildings are no longer on the campus, but the experiences that our Samuel High community will have in the new buildings will be stellar. They will make their own memories and hold them just as tight as we have hold ours. But we owe it to them to provide the best facilities we can. And sadly, sometimes that means buildings have to come down. Samuel High students, faculty, staff, and families deserve buildings that meet their needs for the next century. And that's what we're planning. I believe we're going to Steve. Yes, we are. Thank you. So this brings us to the near the end of, of this portion of our discussion. Um, but to, to kind of summarize it, the, the history building doesn't work. It doesn't work for the students and, and for the campus. Uh, the, the location of, of the building isn't practical uh, as part of the Samuel High campus plan. Uh, there was a push a few, uh, started a few months ago um, indicating that the members of the community thought that the building was historic and should be preserved for that. I, uh, we believe that was misguided. Um, as we know from the, the EIR that I discussed earlier and as we, as we just saw in those pictures, um, and now we'll hear a push that um, the, the, the nostalgia and, and the memories will make it a creative, I'm sorry, a cultural resource. Um, you know, we, we respect and, and, and truly value those memories and, and that attachment, uh, but keeping this building won't impact those. The, people will still have those memories and, and, and that attachment to their time there. 
Keeping the building, however, will detrimentally impact our students, uh, which leads us to our next project, which is the exploration and building, exploration building and gold gym phase three. And so for that, I'm going to ask uh, James Mary O'Connor, uh, who's one of our architects uh, here in town, uh, who's on this project, but also here in town, um, to start walking us through that. So James, take it away. Oh, delighted, Dan. Nice to meet everybody. This is actually a collaboration with two firms, uh, HED and uh, MRY uh, Architects. And just on a personal connection, um, I mean, my connection with Santa Monica is that uh, I'm a longtime resident and, um, and parent uh, in Santa Monica. My two boys attended uh, um, SAMO and, uh, and they got an, an amazing education and uh, went on to uh, Santa Monica College and then UCLA and Berkeley and, uh, and gave them an incredible foundation. But um, I think what's, for me, the kind of privilege here is that we spent so many years of, you know, uh, thinking about the teachers and our kids that I have an opportunity now to re reconnect. And uh, we know every building on the campus we know every space around here and uh, can rethink, um, you know, what the future of the 21st century um, uh, learning is for SAMO. Our firm, Moore Rubio Dell, is also a firm that's um, deeply rooted in Santa Monica. Uh, we've been there for um, uh, 30, 40 years. And we're very close to the campus. We're actually just a couple of blocks away. We're on um, Pico and 10th Street. Uh, it's our closest project to date. Um, our staff can walk over here and, and visit the site and, and we're doing that um, uh, right now. Um, we also come with a great deal of, of um, experience in, in education. We have been building um, future buildings um, and schools um, across the United States, uh, here in California, you see UCLA, you see Berkeley um, at the uh, higher education, but also at the community college level. And, um, and um, so we bring that kind of knowledge to it. Uh, historical preservation has also been a big area of our work. Uh, many adaptive reuse buildings like the Powell Library at UCLA or um, the Gloria Kaufman building or the, um, and for people who are listening, if, um, if you don't know our work, one way to think about it is, the Santa Monica Library. Um, we built the new Santa Monica Library and originally, you know, it was to be an adaptive reuse, but in close investigation on that building, we found it was absolutely impossible to expand it and, um, and cost prohibited. And um, it was going to cost far more to renovate it and to and keep it and, and end up something that just wouldn't fit the purpose. Um, so we look very closely at, at existing um, existing buildings, um, and throughout this, what was you kind of unique about this process is this is, project has been designed through COVID. What does that mean? It was actually it's actually a kind of unique time where we've had everybody's attention, um, unlike anything before. So starting with the kind of programming stage, working you know working with Amy. Yurko at Brain Spaces, working with all the SAMO teachers, um, Dr. Shelton, Dr. Ratti, um, and, and the board. We had everybody's attention um, and everybody was at home. So this project now is a really kind of integration of everybody's thinking, you know, uh, and bringing together everything um, that we have learned from all of the things that are, you know, that we brought, brought to this. Um, and this view that you're seeing here is, is the south, um, sort of the north, north face of the exploration building. And when you're on the campus right now um, on Pro Prospect Hill, you notice the, um, the hotel in the distance, and that kind of dominates the campus. Well, the future is that, that this large space here now that with the exploration building and gymnasium is going to be the new heart of the campus and it'll be the new internal face uh, of the campus. And uh, we'll kind of reorganize the way um, the space will work. Um, with the history building coming down, it really opens up 
the campus. Right now, it's kind of a tight campus, and it's not because the site is limited. It's actually because it's not organized in a kind of central way. And when, once that building is removed, um, it creates a new heart where everything is organized around this open space. This is a view from Pico uh, with the gymnasium, uh, the gold gym, uh, um, stepping down the hill um, uh, in an undulating way, it creates a new sense of gateway. And, and this will give a great sense of identity for the campus. Um, for a long time, it always felt internal, you know, that um, you didn't really see the campus itself, but this will be a new kind of signature uh, for the gymnasium. You know, as you're walking by, you'll see performances happening. You'll see athletics happening. You'll see the um, exploration building. You'll see activities coming true. So it'll be a kind of window for the community to see, you know, what's happening here and, and new ways of thinking about, uh, about the campus. And uh, as Kerry mentioned, this has been designed by the, uh, on the system of the open building concept. And actually our, our partner, John Dale, is actually a founding member of the, you know, the Council of Open Building. And for a long time, you know, buildings were built in a kind of 19th century way, like the history building, you know, double loaded corridors and rooms. And, um, and that, that, that is such an outdated model now. It's so difficult to, to do anything flexible in those kind of spaces. The open building uh, allows not only for the building to change, but for every aspect of it. And so when the building is built, it, the first day of the building is not the best day. It keeps growing and changing and it's adaptable and, and resilient. Um, the ground floor here of the, uh, of the exploration building um, is, is a series of, of creative kind of labs with uh, on one side, you have all of the um, academies and on the opposite side, you have the visual arts uh, portions of this, health and wellness, uh, on top of that, you have the uh, um, law, justice, and government, and on the opposite side, you have the visual, the visual arts. And on the lower floor, you have the project lead the way with the media arts. And um, with the kind of rethinking of the building, we have taken all the conventional air conditioning and equipment off the roof, and um, and it really works for this kind of, you know, climate right now creating open spaces for teaching and especially in Southern California. So we've been allowed, able to create outdoor uh, teaching areas on the roof. There, there, there is a light canopy above with photovoltaic panels generating electricity uh, for, for the space itself. Um, and right in the center of the building is what we call the pitch space. And that's that element that you see coming through and it's a, it's a super collaboration space. It's a space that, you know, everybody can present ideas, um, present uh, pitching um, the way you're thinking. Um, and um, and it's, it, it um, works for each of, the, each of the programs. This is a very efficient building. You know, every inch of it and every dollar that's going into this, we've looked at and how to maximize the space. And, in a way, a way of thinking about it is that these academic spaces are almost like creative factories, you know, very flexible, very open, allowing lots of things to happen. If the program changes tomorrow, it can be, it can adapt. Next. And then sustainability is really at the heart of the project, health and wellness, you know, we're optimizing, you know, natural air, light uh, connections, um, um, really opening it up to the space. We're looking at all aspects of health and wellness. Um, green architecture too, um, with the um, living walls uh, of the building, um, bringing in landscape, photovoltaic panels on the roof, uh, shade, the outdoor classrooms. Um, and I, as I mentioned, um, one of the real flexible ideas here um, is, is to take all of the uh, conventional earth conditioning equipment off and um, 
and have it as a separate element. So each of the um, each of the academies can have their own mechanical space and can adapt and change very easily. Um, on the right hand side down below, we have tested the, the layout here multiple ways in, in, in all kinds of ways that the building can be laid out. So when the building is built in a couple of years, it can change. It's not fixed. Um, and what we've been finding out, you know, number of years is that, that um, the buildings are lasting longer and longer because of technology and the way they're being built. And the programs and education and pedagogy is changing faster. It's and we have to build that change into what we're doing, into our thinking. So I think it's my turn. So, uh, so part of part of the flexibility of the building is right now we're building it for our three. You know, one side is built for our three academies, and uh, we anticipate that over the life of this building, uh, that. Uh, those academies, whatever those uh, areas of instruction are, will probably change. Uh, you know, right now students are interested in things and in particular subjects and a lot of the jobs that now exist today didn't exist 30 years ago. So we expect this building will adapt and change. And if suddenly we say, oh, wait a minute, this was a bad idea. Let's go back to the 19th century teaching model. This building could adapt to be that. Uh, so that's part of what, what really makes it special. Um, so here's a cross section. I'm going to give you some pictures of the building and just sort of talk about what it is. Here's some cross sections of, of the building of how it sort of layers up uh, with the rooftop on the, on the end. Right in the middle of the building, Viking Way or 6th Street goes right through. That's our access for our uh, fire truck, but it's also the access and the introduction to the students. Up above that is what we call the pitch space. So part of it is, is for the art, right now our art classrooms are in these small little labs in the art building. I mean, they are, you know, 700, 800 square feet. Uh, it just doesn't give any room to work and any room to explore or create. So we're expanding them and giving them larger rooms, larger spaces with outdoor learning, outdoor studio space for both ceramics and visual art and rooftops so that they actually have room to work. In film, you know, in the film room right now, it's in this tiny little room, uh, H123, and photography is in this little basement space. So giving them space with studios, with space to actually really create and work on their craft, on their creativity, and give kids the opportunity to make what it is they need to make. Uh, the Project Lead the Way, yes, you can teach Project Lead the Way in anything, but it's going to have both great class space, but also will have the tools to really work. Project Lead the Way, we originally planned to be in, dis in the Discovery Building, but one of the things that they came to us and said, well, we, we want to have you know, tools. We need to have the whole setup for a studio to build and make things. And we're going, well, that doesn't really fit in Discovery, but it's absolutely going to fit in Exploration. This is on the other side, you see the pitch space at night uh, with screens that can, uh, but then here's some really great views of what the pitch space is and what it can be. It's a very multi-use space, uh, but really allows for both presentation for the students to really show what it is they're trying, what they're attempting to speak to a large number of students. And it is the hallmark of this academy, of the space that allows for creativity. On the rooftop, we have space for classes, for painting, for creation. Uh, and then also we have some really great plaza and other outdoor learning levels all the way through the space as it goes down around and on both sides. The gold gym, uh, you know, the challenge was, you know, we have the south gym, which is falling apart, and we had to take down the ceiling tiles because they kept falling on students. So this was expanding that. So we have the, the, that gym, but we also needed another court space. So the idea was to use the hill to build this up so that we go from the main gym, to the auxiliary gym, to the dance studio and the pep squad studio on the top, and sort of linking all of these things with all the support areas underneath it. And on the basement underneath the main gym in the front would be the yoga room and the fitness rooms, and they pour out into areas so that yoga and fitness can be taught out on the lawn and out in the space so they have both an indoor and outdoor relationship that all works in relate in related to what goes on in the entire space. 
So this gives you a view of, of, the, of the gym. Um, it, it, we do have stands, bleachers that can come out for performance, but it really is more of our practice gym, but it is a space for physical education, uh, for learning, for recreation, and we'll also have a joint use capability. Coming to the end, uh, last couple slides is by removing the history building, uh, keeping uh, Prospect Hill, we actually are able to create more green space there in the middle of the campus, more open space, more space for learning, more space for students to be connected to something that's more natural, that's not just concrete or asphalt. And it relates to everything so that the, the campus has on one side what's going on with uh, exploration with the gym. And then on the other side, we having innovation and the discovery building. And that all links then to our Greek theater that goes down to our recreational areas. So all of this allows for both movement of students, accessibility, and also a little bit more green and connection. So this gives you another view of sort of that going down into the Greek. Once the South gym and the pool are gone, we'll be putting basketball courts and a temporary little sort of practice warm up space until we go back, go to the big field flip in phase seven, which brings the baseball fields to this area and the stadium being built on the other side. But Viking Way, Sixth Street running through the middle, through but next to uh, Admin by Barnum and the business building, which in phase four, the new phase four, the business building will go away and we'll be able to create the new library in the center of campus, which is one of the goals of the campus plans that we couldn't achieve, but now we're gonna be able to achieve, have that relationship of the library next to the academic wings adjacent and across from in relationship to Barnum and having a conversation with Barnum. So that is our presentation. Uh, I'm gonna go back just so you have something to look at. Are there any questions from the board before we go to uh, public comment? Hey, that's my thing that I say. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you want me to start presenting facilities, you know, that's fine, but well, let me do my job. Are there any uh, clarifying questions for anybody on this presentation from board members? Actually, you know what, Carrie? If you could stop sharing the screen so I can see if there actually are any clarifying. If there's a clarifying question, I don't see any right now. Okay, folks, we have a large number of public comments. This is a very discussed issues. So let's buckle in and I'll kick it over to board, to board Vice President Lieberman. Okay, before we, before I call the first speakers, I want to propose that we let two people who have zoomed in from the East Coast, who are alums who are in school, so they're three hours later, and then that we let our students who are current students speak as we usually do before others. I know that's painful for those who've been waiting, but I think it's in keeping with what we ordinarily do. I just saw four, th four thumbs up, we're good. <clears throat> Great, and every speaker will have two minutes. <clears throat> so without further ado, the first three speakers are Dylan Braun, Peter Harding, and then Jessica Brown. Good evening, uh, members of the board, staff, and community members. Uh, thank you for that thorough presentation and for letting me go first. I'm in Miami. <laughs> My name is Dylan Braun. I'm a graduate of Sambo High. Uh, and though I graduated over 10 years ago now, and I live in Miami, I have closely followed the news of the improvements being made to our beloved school. Um, I've been concerned that some members of the community are pushing for SMM USD to halt plans for this exciting modern construction in order to save a building that is, I think, ill-suited for 21st century instruction. As I understand it, the plan to move ahead was approved in 2018 and a great number of community members were engaged in that process. Uh, in addition, bond measure SMS was passed with the idea that this new construction in phase three would be completed. So I feel that it would disregard the will of the voters and it would dishonor all the teachers, administrators, parents, and students that took part in those community meetings if, if you were to turn back the time and, and undo their efforts. Um, from what I've read and, and now heard tonight, this personalized hands-on learning approach will be best realized within the spaces created within phase three. I'm uh, currently getting my doctorate in child clinical psychology. 
I often work with children that struggle to engage in traditional learning environments. And I'm, I'm convinced now more than ever that this construction will enable SAMOI to better engage all students, particularly those that have different learning needs. So I encourage you to continue to focus on students first. Please forge ahead with phase three and its innovative learning environments. Thank you for your consideration and your leadership. Thank you, Dylan. Peter Harding, then Jessica Brown, and then Mateo Marquez. Uh, good evening, members of the board. Uh, my name is Peter Harding, and I graduated from Sam High in 2012. I'm speaking tonight also to express my support for the Sam High campus plan. I personally care very deeply that Samuel High's diverse student body is educated in accordance with modern standards and is not unnecessarily harmed by misguided efforts to preserve the history building, the supposed historical value of which I frankly just do not understand as a recent graduate. Unlike many who are opposed to the demolition of the history building, I've actually stepped foot in it and taken classes in it this century. The history building is outdated, too hot or too cold depending on the day and filled with cramped inflexible classrooms. Samuel High is a functioning public school and as such must be updated to serve the needs of current as well as future students. If that means getting rid of the outdated nondescript history building, which looks absolutely nothing like the original at this point, then so be it. Educating kids, in my view, is more important than preserving a plain looking building where James Dean happened to film part of a movie over 65 years ago. This school year, the ongoing pandemic has forced students to suddenly adapt to online learning. In the midst of what is very justifiable worry over the consequences of that, there's seemingly very little awareness that when Samuel High students ultimately return to classes in the history building, they'll be smashed into classrooms which are less than two thirds the size that they should be to educate kids in the 21st century. District staff determined that any adaptation of the existing building could not feasibly support larger classrooms. This is where, again, I think some of our priorities are getting mixed up. Preserving a dull old building with no defining character is not worth harming high school students. Now, I, I should clarify, I, I love many things about the history building. I love the people I shared that building with, students and teachers alike. I became a better student, friend, and person in the history building, and I frankly cherish so many memories and life lessons learned there. However, I never once felt particularly grateful for the cramped, uncomfortable desk setup, and I certainly never looked up at the building with any sort of reverence for its architecture. I love the history building because in spite of its plain, boring appearance, my teachers and classmates made it into something that I won't ever forget in the rest of my, for the rest of my life. Let's make it easier for current and future students to have a similar experience and focus our preservation efforts on buildings with actual historical value that don't inhibit the education of high schoolers. And above all, let's remember that Samuel High is a school, not a museum for housing our memories, which we can all hold on to ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica Brown, Mar Mateo Marquez, followed by Christian Adera. Good evening, my name is Jessica Brown and I am joined by Alani Kanan and Nathan Costanaza. We're honored to speak on behalf of the sophomore class as well as our fellow students in the grades below in regards to the benefits of the Samo High Campus Plan. We feel especially qualified to speak on this matter as we have, been, as we have had the opportunity to experience the history building firsthand as students. Uh, I'm not sure if if you need to unmute uh, Nathan Costanaza, um, but he's speaking with me as well as Alani Kanan. Okay, I have all of you listed separately. So I didn't know it was a group presentation. Nothing showed that for me. Sarah, can you help me out with that? Um, yeah, Alina. so <laughs> how, do you, how would you like to hand Right now we have them each listed individually with two minutes each. Mm -hmm. um, what do you wanna, I, I've hit pause by the way. Um, how would you like to? Well, uh, you could just, if you could just order. include okay. them with me. I, yeah, I think you, I'm sure that collect, I'm not sure. I don't know what they will say, but I would guess that collectively they'll be less than eight minutes if we just unmute them all, it seems like. Is that? Okay, what were the names again? I'm sorry. Uh, Nathan Costanaza and Alani Kanan. Got it. Yeah, they're all on my list. And, and Mark, the students, I just didn't, I didn't know it was a group presentation, so. You're good. My name is Nathan and um, the exploration building is a great possibility to expand on the learning opportunities available to Samo High students. With more space and modern advancements, the planned state of the art exploration building will be a much more efficient environment for learning. While the current history building is important to the historical context of Samo High, it is not practical. 
The stuffy hot classrooms and outdated technology doesn't allow for optimal learning opportunities, not to mention the history building does not have ideal accessibility for all students. We are glad to be a part of the future of Samuel High and to be the first class to experience the, out experience the outstanding perks that the exploration building will provide. Thank you for your time and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. I, wait, I'm not, I, are they all, are you finished? Thank you, thank you all. Thank you so much. Now let's see if I can catch you all on this. So we still want Mateo Marquez. Christian is done and Nathan, uh, no, we still have to include Christian. We, we, we did Jessica Brown, Alani Kanan, and Nathan Castanaza. Uh, I'm, I'm confused now. <laughs> I think we have Mateo and then Christian up next. Okay, yeah, you're controlling the, I can't control the muting, so Sarah, why don't you? Help me out on the student group here. Mateo, you should be, you should be unmuted and ready uh, to go. Yeah, all right, awesome. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Mateo Marquez and I'm the student body president at SAMO. Uh, this school truly means a lot to me. Having been a part of ASB for all four years of my high school career, I've been dedicated to improving the high school experience for all my peers. In addition to that, I've had many relatives attend SAMO, like my 100-year-old great-grandfather who still manages to belt out the first few lines of the hymn of praise. <laughs> so while I agree maintaining SAMO High's historical integrity is important, we cannot do that in good faith without assuring that the needs of the current student population are met. The next generation design and technology in the new facility will allow for students to benefit from teaching and learning techniques that emphasize collaboration and exploration. And the many features that emphasize sustainability are an important step towards battling the ongoing climate crisis. Delaying this project anymore would be doing a serious disservice to all students. I think an effective way to acknowledge the history building's rich background would be to name the new facility after Cesar Chavez. This is because in 1990, a group of students gathered at the steps of the history building and proceeded to walk out to attend a pesticides protest in front of the Lowe's Hotel with Latino and union hero Cesar Chavez. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you. All right, Christian, I believe you're up next and you should be unmuted. Yes, I am. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Christian Adera. Um, I am part of the senior class cabinet here at Samo High. Um, I am the senior class president and I came here to voice my support for the continuation of the Samuel High campus plan, um, specifically demolishing the history building in order to create a more suitable space for Samuel High students and teachers. So, you know, as a student who is leaving Samuel High soon, I and others feel responsibility to urge for what's right for future students here at Samuel High. And while we won't get to, I mean, people in my grade will not get to experience the impacts of this building firsthand, I know it's the right thing to do. So um, I think moving forward with this plan will enhance the Samuel High experience. This will provide more opportunities for students with its engaging and innovative environment. So in a world that's progressing fast, whether that's through technology or through general experiences, I think that students deserve a place where they can equally grow. So this is the, the, the best thing that we can do and it's important to continue this action. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. So that, that catches all of that, we're in that group of students, right? I didn't miss anybody. Okay, so there, I think there are two more on the list. Uh, one is Hannah De La Rosa, and the other one is uh, Anna, Anna Ferries. And uh, Noah and Atsugu. Noah is not a student anymore. Oh, he graduated. Okay, my bad. <laughs> Let's see. Where's Hana? There you are, Hana. Uh, hi. Um. Good evening. My name is Hannah, and I'm a junior at Samuel High, and also a part of ASB. Um, today, I'd like to talk about how much this new building will help our students. Uh, I've been a part of SAMO. I've been, I mean, I've been at SAMO for three years and I've seen how crowded our rooms are, how messed up the restrooms have been, 
and how sometimes it just doesn't feel like a classroom you want to be in or like a place you want to be in at all. And apart from that, it's also not a very accessible building for students who have injuries or disabilities, which I've also experienced and have seen other people experience. And um, in addition to that, like we understand there's a lot of great memories. We've all made memories there, but I think we should remember them fondly and go on to create a better learning environment with the new building. It's for the best. Uh, this new building will open doors for all kinds of learning and opportunities that just don't fit inside of our old building. Uh, future students will feel inspired and driven to do their best when they see just how many opportunities soon your sister will be at SAMU in around three years and I really can't wait to see how much SAMU will grow and adapt. It's already such a great and it's only going to become so yeah thank you for getting it. Uh-oh. I don't know if, whether Hannah was done or not. I think she just finished when she cut okay. out. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next one is Anna Ferries. Hi, my name is Anna Ferries, and I'm a senior at Santa Monica High School. And here's what I have to say about the history building where I attended many of my classes for the almost three years I was on campus. I know some alumni would like to preserve the history building for sentimental reasons, and I understand that. However, the purpose of a school building isn't for people to drive by and reminisce their, high, their time in high school. Um, that's why they have yearbooks. Um, the purpose of a school building is to create a positive learning environment for students. The current building is very outdated. There are cockroaches roaming around the halls, and most classrooms are hot and humid all of the time. For those of you who don't know, we live in a chaparral biome where it doesn't rain for most of the year. Um, think about that. Uh, a new building um, with modern and, and updated facilities would, en would enable a better learning environment for all students, which is ultimately the goal for everyone here. Because of these reasons, I encourage the district to demolish and replace the history building. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Okay, I, people are sending me texts and saying that so-and-so is a uh, student. People who are alums, even if they're recent alums, I'm gonna leave them in the order that they signed up in because I don't think this is fair to all the number of people who, who have signed up and been waiting patiently all night. So those are the only ones I know to be students and to be on the East Coast. And so we'll move forward with Angela Scott followed by Richard McKinnon, followed by Debbie Mulvaney. Hi, good evening, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Good evening, Dr. Drotti and school board members. I'm addressing you tonight as the parents of an eighth grade student with special needs. I also sit on steering committees for STEPS, the Black Agenda, the Committee for Racial Justice, and a few DACs. So I see through an equity lens, and I believe all children deserve a high quality education. While I respect history building advocates, the history building is not included in the list of locally designated structures of merit or landmarks. Keeping the history building and its current model of broken, inflexible, cramped learning spaces is not conducive nor safe for student success, as Ms. Baxter, Mr. Upton, and former graduates and current students have already illustrated. So I ask you, are we doing our best as advocates fostering 21st learning, uh, learning models? For me and many other families of children with special needs, Improving SAMO campus must include providing accessible environment for mobility. Removing the history building is an ADA matter of accessibility. Students with respiratory issues and mobility challenges should not feel defeated or out of breath trying to navigate the campus. Landscaping the hill and incorporating ADA requirements throughout the space aligns with best practices. The campus plan and exploration building specifically speaks to addressing equity and closing the engagement gap. We know not all children learn the same way, and it's our job as parents, educators, and advocates to close the engagement gap. The digital divide is increasing the racial and social economic achievement disparities among students of color, English language learners, and students with learning differences. 
The exploration building promotes innovative learning spaces by supporting collaborative small group work, individualized study, and lends itself to optimal engagement through project-based learning styles, offering blended learning with technology are optimal ways to address the engagement gap. So I ask you, please forge ahead with the SAMO High Campus Plan, because what we do affects our future, and our future is our kids. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Richard McKinnon, Debbie Mulvaney, and then Jason Islas. So school board members, tonight you get a chance to make a decision, which is rare in public life, that for decades affects thousands of students and thousands, tens of thousands of their families. It opens up educational opportunity for all of those students and it provides equal outcomes for all of them. And it's simply a matter of social justice because we run schools not based on what you arrive at the school system in terms of your skin color or where you live or what you earn or your social status, but on what we can guarantee to you to develop your talent and your abilities and your skills. And that's what a good school should do but that building is not fit for function. It's not fit for purpose. It hasn't been for decades. It's not flexible enough. It doesn't allow the teaching in small groups or large groups. It doesn't allow the technology that's needed. And when we go back 20 years, we knew that our school system didn't have enough money in it to teach people or for the facilities. There was a pink parade at the promenade that started a negotiation with the city. There were endless bond measures and there were parcel taxes and there were use agreements, all heavily scrutinized and passed overwhelmingly by our community. The Samo High Coalition proposed a revamp in 2009 and 10, and it won development money taken away by the state. There was a facilities master plan. There was a Samo High master plan in 2015, an EIR, community participation, all overwhelmingly scrutinized and all coming to the same conclusion. This building needs to go SAMO needs to be rebuilt. Tonight is your moment to ensure that the forward progress of the last two decades is finally realized and the passion that all of us have had to have this school, the high school of Santa Monica, developed to its fullest potential is realized. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Debbie Mulvaney, Jason Islas, and then Sarah Braff. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My name is Debbie Mulvaney. I have served the Santa Monica Malibu education community for over 25 years in multiple roles from being PTA president at Samo High, serving on the bond oversight committee, serving for six years on the district's financial oversight committee, including two years as its chair, serving as a member of the steering committee of SEPS, as well as being treasurer on most of the district's bond and parcel tax campaigns that have brought the money into the district that allows these improvements to occur on our campuses. Professionally, I am a business manager. So in all, I spend most of my waking life watching people's money. I am here tonight to urge you to move forward with the Samo High Campus Plan. Doing otherwise would be a complete waste of taxpayer funds. Some of the buildings are over 100 years old and aside from nostalgia, they no longer provide an appropriate learning environment for students. There is nothing wrong with nostalgia, but it needs to be recognized as just that. It cannot be the basis for making important decisions about the educational futures of students in the coming decades. In the years when the Semo High Campus Plan was being developed, there were countless public meetings where anyone who had an opinion could have come forward to address the board, parents, and staff members who were developing the plan. Since 2016, there have been many public meetings to address the developed plan and no one raised serious concerns over tearing down the history building until now. The cost to now halt the plan, spend $300,000 on researching the possibility of retrofitting the building to make it usable in the 21st century, available to disabled students and appropriate for student learning is a colossal waste of resources. Not to mention the cost and time and money of redesigning the rest of the campus plan to accommodate leaving a history building in place. The district has already verified that the building itself is no longer of historical significance because it was built and then rebuilt after an earthquake and updated again in 1960. It has lost most of the features that gave it historic integrity. Please move forward with your plans and let's make the Samo High campus a centerpiece for learning in the 21st century and beyond, which is what the taxpayers were promised. Thank you. 
Thank you, Debbie. Jason Islas, Sarah Braff, then Lourdes Maria Mack. Good evening, school board. Um, thank you for listening. Um, and thanks for the thorough presentation. My name is Jason Islas. Um, I graduated Samo High in 03, um, which is longer now than I care to admit. Um, and uh, I have many fond and not so many fond memories in the history building myself. Um, I have to say, I thought uh, the presentation was, was more polite about my, uh, how they described the history building than I would be. Um, it was a leaky ship when I was there. Um, I actually have distinct memory of like, if we ever, uh, hoping not have to take a bathroom break while in the history building. And if we did having to go, like making a point to go to like an adjacent building, um, because like, frankly, <laughs> it, it was, it was, it should have, I would be happy if this plan was implemented a decade before I showed up to Samohai. And I think, um, the reality is, is that a lot of thought and planning um, has been put into this plan. It seems, I guess, a small handful of people want to call an audible in the middle of a, of a, what has been a long community process. And I think I have to echo everyone's, you know, concerns. I, you know, I, this is nostalgia has no place in planning the future. I'm sorry. Um, I live in Santa Monica. Um, I'm a first generation college student and I credit that to the fact that um, uh, that we have an excellent school system here. And I think that the next generation deserves the best facilities we can give them. You know, the school district is more diverse than the city itself. And a lot of people benefit from, um, you know, how much investment we put into the school district. And I, I see no reason to not allow the next generation to benefit from that. So please, I support 100% moving forward with this plan. Um, and I'm glad to see some of my old uh, administrators here, Dr. Kelly and, uh, and uh, Ms. Baxter. <laughs> anyway, have a good evening. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Sarah Braff, followed by Lourdes Maria Mack, followed by Claudia Bautista Nicholas. Thank you. First, I just have to take a second to say how proud I am of all our st students, both present and past. Santa Monica High School is a great school on the path to being even greater with the district's renovation plan. This includes demolishing the history building and replacing it with a building designed for 21st century learning. There were no numerous meetings with regard to this plan, including four public meetings between October 2017 and December 2018, in which the demolition, demolition of the building was specifically discussed. Not one objection was raised. While the outside of the building might conjure up memories for some, they have clearly not spent time inside the building. It is inadequate in every way. The bathrooms are decrepit, there is insufficient power, and the classrooms are simply too small. It is cramped. We now recognize that all students have not been well served by traditional education in traditional buildings. We must move forward. And if 2020 taught us anything, it is that teachers and students should not be pushed into cramped spaces. The plans, permits, environmental review, and financing are in place now for us to move forward. Do not force the district to spend money we don't have to fight what was already decided. Enjoy the nostalgia of times past, but do not compromise the 21st century learning needs of our students. I urge everyone to allow the renovation plan now in place to move forward for our students' sake. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Lourdes Maria Mack, followed by Claudia Batista Nicola, followed by Ted Winterer. Hello, um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Lourdes Mack. I'm a recent Samo High graduate. Go Vikings, class of 2020. During my time at Samo High, I experienced many challenges with accessibility. One of the more complicated buildings to maneuver around is the history building. I had a few classes on all floors of the building. Every day I would have to take multiple ramps or hills just to get to the first floor 
Then I would have to use an elevator. Many times I would make it to class late or exhausted from taking the ramps. And there were even times where I couldn't go to class because the elevators were broken. On multiple occasions, the elevators would be broken for months at a time, preventing me from going to class. At times, peers or staff would help me out with the ramps, but at 15 to 18 years old, I wanna be as independent as possible. The modernization of Samo High and removal of the history building from, from that inaccessible hill will be beneficial to all students. Public education should be accessible to all students in every way possible. Thank you. Thank you, Lourdes. Claudia Bautista Nicholas, then Ted Winterer, then Victor Kamlos. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, good evening, board members. I am here today representing uh, all the teachers at Samo High in support of the Samo High plan. I was motivated to speak to to you here today because I know that you have gotten divided responses from the community to the Samo High campus plan. Although it is fair for all to provide their opinions, I do want to remind the audience that our children are listening to the way that we approach discord. We need to model decision making based on what is best for our students and future generations who will inherit our school. I have been at Samo High now for almost 18 years, and I can tell you that I love every corner of our school. When I first heard about the demolition of the history building, I too was saddened because it marked the end of an era for our school. However, in my freshman seminar class, I teach the history of Samo High, and we remind our kids that the first site of our school was located on the land that is now Santa Monica Boulevard and 6th Street back in 1876. It was a schoolhouse for various levels. Our first high school graduating class was named the Immortal Five and they graduated in 1891. It was not until 1911 that we moved to Prospect Hill where we are currently located. However, due to the earthquakes and population growth, our school has been constantly transforming to meet the needs of the community. Change is part of our history. As a teacher who has taught in the language and technology buildings prior to moving into the current innovation building, I can tell you that the older buildings are not ideal places to teach. They are too small to hold 36 students, our average class size, and they have many structural issues. My colleagues who teach in the history building describe how difficult it is to learn in the classroom, which can be close to 100 degrees during the first three months of school. They tell stories of crowded classrooms with walls that are separating from the floor, mold, and rain seeping in through the roof. Earlier tonight, you heard the benefits of project-based learning in small classes. Many of our teachers at Samo High currently do civic action projects at the end of their semesters as summative projects. In fact, some of you have attended my immersion presentations in the past. Having the space to work in small collaborative groups has been extremely helpful for me as a teacher as I guide my students in their projects while in the innovation building with the ample amenities. So I ask you to please embrace Samo High's history of change to improve our schools for our kids and to move forward with phase three of the Samo High campus plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ted Winter, followed by Victor Kamlos, and then Yolanda Lewis. Uh, good evening, board members. Uh, I'm an avid supporter of historic preservation. Uh, during my years on the city council, I voted to designate numerous landmarks in historic districts. And once my public service ended in December, I rejoined the Santa Monica Conservancy as legal considerations have precluded my membership while in office. I am, however, also an advocate for education and our children. As I've seen over the years, our kids lacking in political influence suffer when adults argue among themselves. Jackson. When adults bicker over DACA, it's the dreamers who endure the fear and uncertainty. When grownups debate whether or not to take swift action to mitigate climate change, it's our kids who will have to withstand the worst impact of a warming planet. And most germane to this discussion, when political infighting leads to a piecemeal and ineffective response to a pandemic, it's our children who have lost months of invaluable time in the classroom. For even if distance learning is 100% effective, 
our youth have missed out on the social and physical development, which comes from time on campus with their peers. Delaying and revising the Samo High Campus Plan would mean that the next tranche of high school students already set back in their academic progress by COVID-19 will not have the 21st century facilities required for 21st century education. After having been denied a year of classes on campus, let's not also deny them the opportunity to thrive in modern, accessible, and sustainable facilities, which can help to overcome the achievement gap and to prepare the next generation for the challenges ahead. Let's put aside the differences between adults and do what's right for our children. Please move ahead expeditiously with the Samuel High Master Plan as it's been transparently vetted by the public and the board in numerous meetings. Thank you. Laura, you're muted, sorry. Sorry, I'm talking away. Um, thank you to Ted. Um, Victor Conlos, followed by Yolanda Lewis, and then Joel Corey. Thank you, board members, Dr. Drotti, Carrie Upton, Steve Massetti, and James O'Connor, and community stakeholders that have been involved in the modernization plans of the campus beginning in 2015. I'm here to ask you board members to give direction to staff to move forward with the Samo High campus plan, which involve, includes demolition of the history building. A uh, number of stakeholders have recently suggested uh, some alternatives in an attempt to save the history building uh, and change the approved campus plan. Though I'm sympathetic to their reasons, the time to share those suggestions has long passed and it was publicized between 2016 and 2019 before this plan was approved. Current and future students and our Samuel High teachers deserve state-of-the-art campus over, overwhelmingly supported by voters through bond measure SMS. Please avoid second guessing yourselves about your decision made in 2019 and avoid those rabbit holes and landmines of revisiting the campus plan and attempt to change the planning process of the future exploration building. Please separate the emotion and nostalgia of those that hope to salvage and repurpose the history building and move ahead with the modernization plans described so well tonight. I was excited by the presentation given tonight and noted the future Prospect Hill space is open and flexible and could become a place of tribute, perhaps a walk of honor or a gathering place to honor the history of the students and the school. Thank you very much for your consideration and your work. Thank you. Yolanda Lewis, Joel Corey, and then Chris Harding. Wow, I love hearing from all the students. I just had to say that. Good evening, everyone. My name is Yolanda Lewis, and I have a Samo High grad and a Samo High senior. And I just um, wanted to add my voice to the growing chorus. I have really enjoyed serving on our PTAs in many different capacities and working in uh, a whole host of different volunteer groups. And I'm so proud of our educators who are focused on addressing the engagement and achievement gap. And I'm very grateful that our district has been moving towards project-based education for all students. And it's really exciting that our generous community is so invested in building more innovative spaces designed to support that. Um, the benefits of collaborative learning extend far beyond academics. I know you know. Um, my students thrived much more and were much more engaged with this style of learning. So, and also it closely reflects our evolving work world and prepares our students more effectively for the future. The beautiful new discovery building that's still under construction and the planned exploration building have flexible and innovative learning spaces with lots of light and tech integration and modularity for the next generation of teaching and learning. Um, a tremendous amount of time and effort has gone into creating the Samo High campus plan. 
uh, as we can all see, and the education specifications, as well as the, um, the campus assessments, and all with staff and teacher and student and parent input. And while I'm the first to admit, I only attended a couple of meetings, um, I appreciated all of the announcements and invitations. And while it's great that more people are able to participate like myself at this time in all of these meetings, further costs to look backward will result in significant time delays and are just not prudent. Um, our students deserve great learning spaces without delay. So proceeding with the Samo High campus plan is best for all students and I urge the board to move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yolanda. Joel Corey, Chris Harding, and then Sarah Paulus. Thank you. I'm a parent of a Samo High student and for the last 12 years have coached the Samo High mock trial team. I would urge the board to move forward with phase three construction immediately. When possible, I support protecting noteworthy architecture, but not when it negatively impacts the quality of education for generations of kids to come. Our focus should be on creating a space that maximizes our children's educational opportunities, <clears throat> not overspending finite tax dollars to save a building that had cameos in a bunch of overrated movies. Replacing the history building with a modern facility will create a functional and better learning space so our kids can keep pace with those schools that have already made those improvements. Every year when our mock trial competes, our team is at a distinct disadvantage because other high performing schools practice in designated mock trial courtrooms. Something that'll only be available if the history building is removed and phase three is completed. Having practiced in the history building, our team has experienced how hard it is to learn in a classroom that was designed for 1960. The history building has poor internet, Utility access, poor ventilation, poor ingress and egress, cramped classrooms that can't accommodate 18 team members, let alone the 36 that we normally have on the team. And the longer a construction project gets delayed, the more costs increase. Additional plans cost money. New plans require new environmental impact studies, which often lead to lawsuits, which is a great way to enrich shady lawyers but a lousy way to spend tax dollars that are earmarked to improve our kids' schools. If anything, with the remote learning that's going on right now, we should be expediting construction rather than debating how to turn a poorly designed building into a slightly less poorly designed one. The plans are drawn, the study is done, the money's been approved. The sooner we start, the sooner our kids can develop the skills to solve the problems that we adults never got around to solving. So thank you. Thank you, Joel. Chris Harding, followed by Sarah Paulus and then Sarah Orgill. Start my video. Your video is off, but you can turn it on or speak without it. There you go. Can't, you're muted, you're muted. <laughs> Sarah, can you unmute him? There we go. Are you ready? Yes. Uh, hi, I'm Chris Harding. I'm speaking tonight as a graduate of Samo High, a bit earlier than most of those who have spoken tonight. I'm in the class of 1970. I'm the parent of two Samo High grads, one of whom spoke earlier tonight. And uh, I'm also the child of two Samo High graduates in the 1940s. Uh, my dad was student body president in the mid 1940s. Needless to say, I feel a lot of nostalgia about Samo High and uh, tonight's hearing is uh, indeed nostalgic. I don't feel nostalgic about the history building though hearing the presentation tonight. I feel jealousy for future students who have the benefit of going to school on the new Samoy campus and I hope I'm around to see it and experience it uh, as a grandparent or just a graduate and a, and a friend of Samoy. I think it's really important that you move forward with the plan uh, most of the points have been made by earlier speakers. One point I'd like to emphasize is this. You have an outstanding staff and group of consultants who've worked on this plan. I know most of them quite well, Dr. Grotti, Dr. Shelton, Dr. Smith, who taught my son in the fifth grade. Uh, Mark Kelly's on the screen. I know he's involved in all these issues as well. And then Carrie Upton and uh, Steve Mazzetti. And then of course, my friend, James Mary O'Connor, the architect I've known for decades. and 
He's just one of the most outstanding architects you could possibly hire for a project like this. I think it's important when they make a presentation of the caliber they've made, that we respect their expertise and we move ahead mm. as they've recommended. I also think the process point bears repeating. The district had a multiple year process, many public hearings, opportunities for comment. And for the first time, a year and a half or more after the approval, when the project is being implemented, we hear for the first time that the history building should be saved. I think they're wrong on the merits, but more importantly, they're not timely and that should matter to you. And lastly, I wanna raise an issue about keeping faith with the voters. I was on the campaign committee for Measure SMS. We told people, clearly this was meant to help fund the Samuel campus plan, which was then only a few months away from its final approval. And the voters responded by approving it with 72% of the vote. That's a primary number. In short, please move forward as you have been. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sarah Paulus and, Paulus and Sarah Orgill. And then I've been reminded that, I, and I apologize for doing this. I'm gonna put, we have two council members who are on the list and they didn't sign up early, so I didn't notice it uh, right away. So I'm gonna, after Sarah, Sarah and Sarah, I'm gonna have Oscar De La Torre and Gleam Davis speak because we ordinarily would have put them ahead of everyone else. That's all right. So without further waiting, Sarah Paulus, are you here? Yep. Hi, you? my name is Sarah Paulus and I'm the Samuel High Student Activities Director and ASB teacher. I'm here asking the board to move forward with the previously established construction plans. So much time, energy, money, and resources went into making this happen and delaying the plans would be harmful to students. I taught in the history building for one year. It was super hot. I was in a full sweat by 8.15 a.m. and it's completely um, miserable. So I don't wish that upon anyone and I really urge the board to move forward. I also have um, a statement from Ms. Bryn Boyd and um, she is a teacher at Samuel High as well. I will read it now. To whom it may concern, my name is Bryn Boyd and I'm a history teacher at Samuel High. For the past 16 years, I have called Samuel High my home. I've truly come to love the school and its people with all the rich traditions and uniqueness. How many people can say their classroom view is of the Pacific Ocean just four blocks away? I sure do miss the views of the history building, but that is about all I miss. There's no air conditioning in the building and the ocean breeze doesn't cut it with 37 plus people crammed into a tiny classroom. I also don't miss the lack of heat in the winter or the fact that the windows won't open all the way or even close all the way. I also want to note that the floor is separating from the wall in my classroom, which I can only imagine will get worse over time. I know that part of the reason why Samuel High is so special is its history. However, keeping a dilapidated building for the sake of history is a backwards way of thinking. I know change is hard, but it is necessary for growth. Um, I was sad when we lost the softball field where, we, where I watched the team make it to the CIF championship, tech building, science building, and parking lot side. But look at what we have gained from it. It isn't the building or the field that we miss. It is the memories made in them. But that is the great thing about memories. You can keep them and always make new ones. I look forward to coming back from distance learning and being in a classroom that is in a state-of-the-art room with all the bells and whistles. I'm aware that there are people who are pressuring the board to keep the history building, but I urge you to consider the future of our school. I wanna ask that as the Board of Education, you allow for the growth of our campus as we embark on a new and exciting chapter for our students. Thank you. Sorry, whoop, I'm sorry, I'm muted again. Um, thank you, Sarah Orgill. And then Oscar De La Torre, and then Gleam Davis. All right, uh, good evening, Dr. Drotty, school board members, Dr. Shelton and community members. Uh, my name is Sarah Orgill and I'm an English teacher at Santa Monica High School. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight on my experiences teaching in the history building. Um, and let me first say, I love old buildings. I appreciate the desire to maintain the history of our wonderful school, but the history building is simply not an appropriate facility for a modern forward thinking school, one that our students deserve. My current classroom is H122. I like to call it HOT 122. I have taught for 20 years in a variety of schools and facilities. My current classroom in the history building is really without doubt one of the worst working environments of any kind I've had to work in. The 
south facing wall of windows turns my room into a sauna and with no air conditioning and little airflow, the room is unbearably hot from August to early November. There were many days when I was teaching with sweat literally running down my back. Many times I had to relocate to air conditioned, air conditioned rooms, but that's not always possible or really practical. And it definitely affected my own morale and definitely that of my students. Um, there were times where I had to reconsider um, giving a timed essay, considering how hot the classroom was. Was it really fair to the students to expect them to write a rigorous and already stressful essay in those conditions? I don't think it was. And of course, in addition to the heat, my classroom is much too small uh, for 36, 17 year olds. As was mentioned, the history building was appropriate with smaller classes, uh, the smaller classes of the 60s, but simply not reasonable now. I frequently have my students work in groups and I can barely squeeze the, um, them into the classroom and the acoustics make group discussions, which are so important to collaborative learning, extremely difficult. So I love the history of our buildings. We'll still have um, Barnum and the Greek, um, but our students deserve modern, innovative and comfortable learning spaces. So thank you for letting me speak. I look forward to moving into a new classroom in the Discovery Building soon. And I urge you to continue forward with the Samuel High campus plan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now we have our, hopefully our two council members, um, Oscar De La Torre and Gleam Davis. Yes, uh, can you hear me? There you are. Yes. Okay. Uh, good evening, uh, fellow board members, um, and also uh, residents and parents, teachers, everyone who's uh, students, everyone who's on the uh, Zoom call tonight. Uh, I'm calling to, you know, to urge the board uh, to vote, to do a study, to look into how we might. Um, you know, implement very strong sustainability measures uh, and looking at adaptive reuse for the history building. Um, you know, I'm a student, a former student of Santa Monica High School. I graduated in 1990, class of 1990. I uh, served as student body president. And I recall back in 1990 when uh, a friend called me who told me that uh, Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers were organizing a demonstration uh, in front of the Lowe's Hotel and about 300 students, uh, most of us from the student government from ASB, we organized the walkout during fifth period and we met Cesar Chavez in front of the Los Hotel. That walkout started at the history building. I know people talk about nostalgia and how that's not important. I, I disagree. I mean, every time I go to the Santa Monica Pier, I always remember my dad. I remember the first time I went fishing. When I step on a Santa Monica High School's campus, it is the history building that brings back so much uh, memory, so many good memories. It's sort of the center and the soul of the high school in many ways. Um, so it, 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 it would be very important for us to make that building work. I mean, the technology exists in engineering, you know, there's great architects, you know, we have bond money that our residents have uh, supported, you know, and are taxing themselves, you know, to, to enhance the, the learning environment. And I think that um, it's possible, you know, for us to, to practice adaptive reuse, to practice and implement these sustainability uh, measures and, and policies that uh, Santa, the city of Santa Monica is known for. We need to make sure that the school district also uh, follows in line with, uh, with, uh, with those values uh, for our community. So um, I just, I'm calling for, uh, for the board to take a, a step back so that we can all move forward together as a community and, and look at how we can make the building work, practice adaptive reuse, and also to uh, keep and, and, and protect our, our history. You know, it's very important. You know, it's more than just nostalgia. It's real uh, events, real events that have occurred there, real feelings. You know, there's a lot of alumni that I've talked to that, that feel that it would be a better option if we could make the building work. You know, it, it make all the improvements that we need to make, but keep a good portion of the building so that we can uh, protect our history. And the speaker's time is up. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Oscar. Um, Council Member Gleam Davis. Good evening. My name is Gleam Davis. Uh, before beginning, I want to make clear that uh, I'm speaking in my individual capacity and not as a Santa Monica City Council member tonight. I firmly believe that local governmental agencies should not try and substitute their judgment for the judgment of sister agencies. 
However, as a member of several bond campaign committees and the former co-chair of the BB Bond Project Committee, I feel compelled to speak tonight because I've come to understand the important role that the built environment plays in the education of our students and the quality of teaching. I've been struck by the level of vitriol and misinformation surrounding the district's plans for the history building. I've seen numerous calls to action and I'm appalled at the viciousness of the attacks on duly elected board members, all of whom have donated countless hours of time to promote the primary purpose of the school district, namely providing a quality education to our community students, a task at which, according to numerous independent reviews of our schools, they and district staff excel. In terms of misinformation, let me simply say that virtually none of the entities to say the history building that I have received include a his picture of the history building as it looks today. They uniformly include a decades old picture of a building that no longer represents how it looks on a campus that, is, that has significantly changed in terms of both appearance and function. I understand that apparently some groups are claiming that the multi-year process of developing a plan for the Santa Monica High School campus was conducted in secret. Although I no longer have a student in the district, I follow the district and the brilliant principal of the high school, Dr. Shelton on Twitter. In doing so, I have been regularly informed of the development of the plan and progress towards the plan, as well as the astonishing accomplishments of the high school students. So I find it hard to believe that if people truly were interested in the infrastructure plans for the high school, that they somehow were uninformed. While I understand that not everyone is on Twitter, I'm confident that the Twitter feed is just one of numerous communication streams that the district has utilized to maximize participation in the planning process and keep genuinely interested parties in the loop. As a city council member, I understand that this community is passionate about preserving our built history, but you were elected to preserve education for our students. I implore you not to be distracted from your mission of education. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now we'll go back to where we were on our speaker list. Johanna De La Rosa, followed by David Milner and then Susan Jane. Hello. Uh, I can't see, but I hear you. <laughs> Hi, so Johanna, yeah. Rosa. <laughs> I want to say hello to everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to hear what I've got to say. Uh, one of the first things I'd like to start with is um, well, the words of Albert Einstein, who said, look deep into nature, and then you will understand everything better. Then I asked myself, why are you having to defend this exciting plan, this incredible gift. Why? Why am I having to think about the memories that have had at Samo High? Well, Samo High was founded in 1891. When I walked through its gates in 1985, that's a fun fact, by the way, don't do the math. My dear alma mater had already seen changes from the first day it opened its gates to the Santa Monica community. Changes that were necessary for the advancement of the generations coming through. Conservation is achieved by the memories we hold dear in our hearts and minds. Let's take the charge of conserving Samo High as a whole in the way of ancestors taught us by telling and retelling the stories of our time at Samo High. Who here can tell me the story of the seal or not the Viking outside the history building? Those who know, know. This plan is an opportunity, a gift to our community, not a shun on the history of Samo High or our community. Please move forward with the Samo High campus plan without delay. Give respect and honor here in the now as we are present for the future generations. We are charged with leaving a place better than how we found it, with integrity, authenticity. Times have passed. Let's engage the dwindle alumni to participate in creating a museum, a gallery, a space that supports the life the Samo has been, is the not forgotten. I do have a question. Which of you 
who opposes this plan would oppose this plan if it was a plan for your own house. With all the love I have for Sam Ahai, I affirm the move with forward of this Sam Ahai campus plan. Any efforts to delay the next phase I must be rejected. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, David Milner, followed by Susan Jane, and then Brian O'Neill. Let me see if I see David. Don't see, let me search by last name. Hmm. I don't see David Milner on the call. Uh -huh. He did send an email earlier and said he would be coming to say his remarks publicly, but the board members all have got an email from David Milner in support okay. of the, um, uh, the, the campus plan. Okay. Okay. Then Susan Jane, Brian O'Neill, and Abby Arnold, although I think she may have dropped. Hello. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for um, allowing me the opportunity to speak to the school board this evening. Um, and I'll make this very brief. I just want to start out by saying I came here to speak about moving the plan, the campus plan forward. But I sat through the presentations by Dr. Shelton, Dr. Drati, um, Dr. Mora, and I just want to say I am so blown away by your vision of education moving forward in our district with the, um, the project-based learning, your academies. My I'm a Santa Monica resident. Both of my kids graduated from Samuel High um, 2012 era, so I'm a little bit out. Um, and these are, what you're talking about are, are ideas and, and um, issues of equity that I was advocating for when my kids were in school. And to see it now coming to this point, um, I work at UCLA, I work a lot with um, integration of the, the UCLA campus with K-12 education. So all of those points that you talked about, project-based learning, standards-based education, small learning communities, diverse way, modalities of expression, spot on. These are cutting edge research. So I'm just here to say, I believe when my kids were back in, in Samuel High, we were beginning the whole discussion about redesigning the campus. I mean, there are some wonderful buildings that are um, at Samuel High, but I always felt being there that it was like locked. It has been, it, it doesn't, the building does not express the creativity that is of that campus. And it was so exciting to see this new plan developing where you're tearing down that, that gym and opening it up to the campus and bringing having the campus finally reflect the beautiful place that it is in Santa Monica. So I just think I, I urge you to move forward on this, um, the, the development plan, hearing Catherine Baxter uh, talk to on the subject from an alumni from the Dean of Students um, um, is really impressive and all of these wonderful students who spoke tonight. So uh, we've been informed, we've known of this for years and why are we waiting? Please move forward, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian O'Neill, Abby Arnold, if she's here, um, Judy Abdo. Uh, yeah, good, good uh, evening, uh, getting late in the evening. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak, board, Dr. Drotti. Uh, I am uh, an historian, I'm a history professor, but more importantly for this discussion, I'm a parent of two district uh, children. And I wanna urge the board to just hit pause, uh, a brief pause on this decision. Um, I'm not an architect, uh, but I've seen some plans put forward that, that could uh, reuse uh, in a sort of adaptive reuse way the, the history building where you would have a 21st century learning space while also preserving the, the historic resources uh, of the building. I realized there were meetings uh, years on this subject a few years ago, I was not engaged and uh, I didn't know until just a few months ago about this, but um, uh, I think it's worth a brief pause. Uh, there's been a false dichotomy, this whole discussion that, that uh, if you don't vote for this now, you're somehow anti-equity, anti-accessibility, anti-students. That's not the case at all. Um, uh, these are big, big construction projects. And um, I suggest that you just do a brief pause Look at the money. Uh, we could maybe even save money with an adaptive reuse uh, project at this point. So 
I uh, thank you for, for the time and um, uh, I'm excited about the new innovations in education as well. And um, uh, I know we can all move together, um, but a brief pause in my opinion is, is warranted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I understand Abby Arnold has dropped off of this. So Judy Abdo, Melissa Goodman, and then Kevin McEwen. Hi, it's wonderful to be on this call and to see so many of the people that I've known for many years and uh, felt like I was a co-worker with you. Um, I am particularly struck by the earlier sort of study session that you had about um, the future learning plans in the district. And I'm just thrilled with with the work that's being done to make sure that there are new and different ways of teaching and uh, educating students. Um, I, I think there was, there've been a couple of uh, references to factory learning and the old style of training uh, kids in a factory model so that they could work in factories and uh, I think that, that that thinking that's going on right now to change that model is so important. And it's so important to have buildings that work for the new ways of providing education for students, which is not at all the way I was taught when I was in school at Hollywood High, I will say, or um, that when I taught in schools, in Burbank and other places, um, certainly I had to teach in a sort of factory-like space. I want our students in the future to go to school in facilities that work for them, that, that um, increase their ability to be creative and, and restoring a building that is, is not really a restoration project and then and trying to make it be sustainable when it couldn't be and the new building could be very sustainable. Uh, I think it's really important that this plan go forward and I really um, I just I want to say that the district has been getting better and better and better on climate change issues and one of those is to have a building that really responds to the needs of our, our world, our the earth, time is our up. students. So please stay with the plan. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Uh, Melissa Goodman, Kevin McEwen, and then Joseph Cortell. All right. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, I am uh, a parent of a first grader at McKinley Elementary. I am on the school site council and I'm also a steering committee member of the Committee for Excellent Public Schools. I ask that you please move forward with the Sam High campus plan, uh, that you don't delay the, the plan. Uh, it was adopted, as many have said, you know, full two years ago um, after a robust and transparent process. And I really want my son and his peers to enjoy the best and most cutting edge and most functional facilities and teaching approaches when he gets to high school, uh, which is some time away. Uh, but I really also wanna see the district fulfill its goal to teach with 21st century methods and spaces and to implement real equity and close achievement and engagement gaps, which the plan is designed to do. Um, some folks today, you know, and, and before have raised ide the idea of adaptive reuse or retrofitting for the history building, which I think would be very costly and very wasteful. And I strongly believe that the district should not be spending its money this way, especially in this difficult pandemic moment, and instead should move forward with the thoughtful, carefully crafted original plan that was adopted years ago to ensure that our kids have the best chance of success for the future. So thanks. Thank you. Uh, Kevin McEwen, followed by Joseph Pertel, and then Mario Fonda Bernardi. As usual, I'm following people who will put this in a much better 
say it in a much better way, but I want to say uh, this uh, watching tonight's presentation has been eye opening and exciting. And I would, I would, if I could give a recommendation, share this out in, in a in a, in, a, in a way. I know Carrie's smiling about this, but I think everyone should know about every detail of this because it's exciting. And the reason why I'm here tonight is to speak as as an alum, uh, a graduate from Santa Monica High School in 1992. And I and I was thinking about the people who are really passionate about saving this building. And I wanted to just take a second to think about why that's important. It's probably not because of the actual structure. It's for the people who actually taught in those buildings and made a difference to students. So I wanted to have a quick shout out to Mr. Escalera, uh, teacher that I had, Mr. Jimenez, uh, uh, Mr. Beecher, who was like an Indiana Jones, and Mr. Vincent, who taught me the seven words you can't say on TV. Those are great memories. But that being said, as a parent and as, as a somebody who teaches and a great band room, made even better recently by Carrie Upton's team in the band room, is that that is something that I want to see for, for the students when they leave our, our music building, for example. And I'm here to, to ask you to you know, con, you know, continue moving forward with this plan. Again, I mentioned being in the band room. Not once have I taught in that band room and thought about, you know what, I would really love to go back to the days when we had one room that we shared with the orchestra and the choir upstairs and we were all cramped. Those days are not there, and we have facilities that um, are are really nice and, and something that I would like to see shared. I also teach at Santa Monica College, where students there have access to the broad stage, and I see students and their self-efficacy when they see a building that they think is this. Do I belong here? Do I belong in this stage? And the answer is yes. Where a Madison campus would not have provided decades ago. So I just wanted to, to say it really short that I support my colleagues um, who teach in that history building. They deserve the best uh, in honor of those teachers who made do uh, when I was a student. So that's all I have to say. Thank you so much for your time. Please affirm and, oh, please affirm and move forward with the Samurai plan and reject any effort to delay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Joe Pertel, Mario Fonda Bernardi, then Pam O'Connor. Hi, everyone. Um, I wanted to echo some of the recent remarks just about the impressive, and I mean, really mean that, the impressive nature of the presentation by Dr. Drotti and others regarding the project-based learning. Um, it is really an incredible innovation, and I just want to applaud. Um, I also want to, also want to mention, too, how Unfortunate it has been the attacks that this administration and the board has had to suffer. Um, I see the attacks on social media. Um, I think the people who've made those comments should be ashamed of themselves. Um, it's not how you should be modeling behavior for your children. We're all in this together. We should all be supporting each other, meeting together, working proactively, not calling each other liars, which is something very common that you see in social media. Um, but putting that aside, um, I cannot tell you how strongly I support the efforts that you folks have made. Um, even though I'm not a particularly involved parent in the school district, I don't think I've ever been to any of these meetings. I've watched it online. I see it on the websites. Um, the amazing work that you've done, in my view, it's been incredibly transparent. I talk to parents, even when my kids were in junior high and I have a daughter who's a junior in college. I remember looking at those plants and thinking, wow, wouldn't that be great for my kids to someday have facilities like that? And that was like 10 years ago. So I believe that this has been a transparent, cooperative process for the people involved. With respect to the history building, which I think is an unfortunate ginned up controversy by a couple of people who decided to use that for political purposes, um, for all the reasons that have been discussed, I don't think the history building should remain. I grew up in a small town in New England. Buildings where I grew up were very, very important. And this is just not one of them. It was built on the foundations of a building that was destroyed in an earthquake in the 1930s. Most of its characteristics have been removed over the last 50 or 60 years. It is essentially a shell of a building at this point. I don't think- Time is up. And with that, I, I strongly encourage you to continue with the Sam High Campus Plan. Thank you. Thank you. Mario Fonda Bonardi, followed by Pam O'Connor, and then 
Cameron Leventon. Mm -hmm. Leventon, I'm not sure of the pronunciation. You laughing at me? It's Leventon. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mario Fonda Bernardi. I would like to speak to the restoration of this building and bringing it back. Every great school, and ours is a great school, has its legacy buildings protected, preserved. We have Barnum Hall, and this is another one of those buildings. You may argue about whether it's natural registry worthy or not. But the important thing is that it is an important building in the history of our campus, the history of our students. I think the problems of bringing it back have been vastly overrated. This building has a very simple framing system. It can easily be adapted. All the walls can be moved, except the ones running down the corridors. We're going to keep it those. Uh, the problems about the size of the classrooms are easily solved because the partitions between the classrooms can be moved easily and have been moved easily historically in the past. The fact that this is a building that's about to be demolished in a time of global warming, we should not be demolishing buildings and then rebuilding them somewhere else if we can adaptively reuse them. And this one can be adaptively reused. It can be made into a truly sustainable, even a net zero building. And the art building would be a great library because it has two floors. It can be opened up with skylights connecting the two floors instead of some phase in the future building another library somewhere else. And finally, I'd like to point out that there's tremendous disruption involved in this, in this whole campus project. Essentially, at the end of the day, when we've moved the Rubik's Cubes in all different directions, we're going to demolish every building on this campus, except the English building in Barnum Hall. And I wonder if people really understand that. And that's all coming in our pockets. And efforts are being made, obviously, that could be going into software, which is really all the exciting work on PBL, et cetera. But instead, all this money is going into hardware, rebuilding the whole campus. I'm not sure that's needed. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to say that there's a time factor here. We could adaptively use this building much faster than we could rebuild the new uh, building that they're talking about, the exploratory building. We could provide a library much faster than we could provide a library uh, in the phase five or whenever it's supposed to happen. So if you respect all these things, you understand that tearing it down is not the best solution. It's the least imaginative solution. Restoring it would be the best solution. Thank you. Lori, I think you're muted. Were you calling on Pam O'Connor? <laughs> yes, could you read my lips, Pam O'Connor? followed by Cameron Leventon and then Wes Larmore. Hi there, hopefully you can hear me. Hello? Yes, we can. Oh, great, thanks guys. Anyway, hi, I'm Pam O'Connor. And for almost 30 years, I served in Santa Monica city government on the Santa Monica Landmarks Commission, the Planning Commission and City Council. And I reviewed and certified many EIRs. And for 30 years, I've been a historic preservation professional, and I've worked on historic resource assessments for EIRs and historic projects at UCLA, USC, Cal State Channel Islands, LA Community College, and for the LAUSD. The historic resource assessment of the campus and history building was conducted for the EIR. It presents evidence, analysis, and findings that the history building has lost historic architectural integrity and as a result, does not meet eligibility criteria for inclusion on the National Register of Historic Places or the California Register. The building has not been identified as eligible for local designation. The decision before you reminds me of one that I had while on the city council regarding the RAND building. And that EIR found that that building actually was eligible for the National Register because it had retained its architectural integrity. The council voted to demolish it and replace it with multifamily housing, including affordable units and with Chongba Park. And while the historic grand building no longer exists, the story of the Pentagon Papers remains part of our history. And Chongba Park was created. The park has provided playgrounds, open space, and public distance of the Pacific Ocean 
for our city's residents and will continue to do so for generations to come. The history of Santa Monica High has one of looking forward, of respecting and recognizing the past, but envisioning the future and evolving so that current and future students will have the best learning facilities possible. The proposed plan for the Samuel High campus continues this tradition by allowing for demolition of the history building while keeping those historic buildings that do retain their historic architectural integrity and integrating them with new facilities. I urge you to continue to support the Samo High campus plan. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Cameron Levinton, followed by Wes Larmore and then Esther Hickman. Uh, good evening, community and members of the board. I come from the class of Samo High 2013 and seeing so many of these students and community members speak to the current challenges and frustrations almost sounds as if it's a rite of passage. And at this stage in our history, it should not be that way at all. And seeing these plans are an absolute breath of fresh air. And I'd like to just remind this group that we need to look at this through the individual lens of the student. This is their day-to-day -day lived experience. And making classrooms more hospitable and more human is an essential and critical tool for keeping them engaged artistically, academically, and communally. I can't imagine what it would be like to move through this type of space in my day-to-day -day life. And for future students, the best thing we can do is arm them in that same way. And by optimizing a space like this, we're honoring the history of the landscape around Sam High. We're bringing in the natural air and light and ocean and, and views. And that is what makes Santa Monica so beautiful in and of itself. I um, can say from personal experience as well that kids are absolutely siloed in the current space. It is not conducive. And while so many people have made that so clear, I can only continue to reiterate that same point. And, it takes a lot of generations to undo a lot of this type of challenge and why not stop here, you know, make it a space that is coexistent and I will put it very respectfully and plainly, we are so past the point of adaptive reuse. This is most certainly an issue that extends beyond simple partitions and the current students who've spoken have spoken so beautifully to that point as well. So. Let's not continue to jeopardize their time and their children's time and our children's time in this type of space and inhibit them in their day to day. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Wes Larmore followed by Esther Hickman and then Nikki Kohlhoff. Good evening, uh, community, board, community and board members. My name is Wes Larmore, Samuel High class of 94. I'm here to speak in support of the school board's efforts to modernize the facilities at Sam High. The new plan, I, honestly, it looks incredible. Uh, like several others, I wish it was like that when I was there. And, my, and I'm happy that my children will avail, eventually be able to take advantage of it. Uh, I know there are those that feel it is important to preserve and reuse the history building, but if it was really that important, the time to share those concerns was over the last five years. And I think the fact that that didn't happen speaks to the issue here. If the school board had proposed, you know, demolishing Barnum Hall or tearing up the Greek, someone would have said something a long time ago. Conservation needs to be balanced. And in this case, the benefits to the school and the future students uh, seem to greatly outweigh the costs of losing the history building. I urge the school board to move forward with their plans. Thank you. Thank you. Esther Hickman, Nikki Kohlhoff, and then Matthew Espinosa. Hi, um, can you see me? We see you. Um, so I'm Esther and Hickman and I'm an alumni and I have a three-year-old child and I didn't know about the history building. And, um, and that's not to say that it was because of a communication failure, but I just learned about it. And so did many, many others. Um, I would like to thank the board um, 
and Carrie Upton and, Ms. and Steve Massetti for continuing to work with the Santa Monica Conservancy to agree upon a historic resources policy. And it's actually very, very nice to hear everybody come out and talk about something that they really care about and really feel passionate about. And the buildings are beautiful and the plans for 21st century learning is, it's a wonderful thing to see happening in real time. Um, and there has never been any opposition to phase three or creating new learning spaces and giving state of the art buildings to our future generations. It's more about that the district never did an adaptive reuse study to study costs and possibilities around the historic buildings. And it's fine for people to say that the history building isolated because it was it was altered is no longer historic by definition, but it is a part of a greater cluster of buildings. And I, if the Conservancy had had an hour to do a presentation for all of you, um, perhaps it, you might see it a little differently. Um, I think that one of the biggest concerns that I have as a parent is that um, the bond money is running out and based on um, the track record with the JAMS Auditorium and with the Innovation Building, um, they have been going, uh, the current team has been going over budget. So the JAMS could, uh, was estimated to cost 19 million, now 44 million, 230% over budget. Innovation was supposed to cost 55 million, ending up at 93 million, now 169% over budget. And so before spending all of the remaining bond money on phase three, it would be good to just press pause and reset and study costs and possibilities because Palos Verdes and California recently failed um, to pass their school bonds. And so when we run out of money, a lot of the elementary schools and the middle schools will be left in disrepair. And we don't have a guarantee that Santa Monica voters are going to pass another bond for our future generations. So this time is up. Really about just having the funds manage for equity among all the different campuses. Thank you. Nikki Kohlhoff, followed by Matthew Espinosa, and then Amy Bisson. Okay. Hi, this is Nikki Kohlhoff. Um, I uh, really appreciate Mario's plans and I hope everybody takes a chance to look at those because they show how the building can be successfully adaptively reused and that's what I'm asking you to do. I also agree with Brian O'Neill that there are so many issues that have been conflated here tonight, which we've come to expect, but wanting fiscal responsibility and sound construction plans is not anti-education or anti-kid. It's about making sure our dollars stretch as far as they can to help more kids. The buildings are not necessary for this program. I'm guessing that the staff never visited a school that had academies in their existing buildings, which we know exist. Um, a few of the, the statements I just find more hypocritical, why we're taking an approach with learning that anything is possible except for adaptive reuse of the history building. Why is a so-called sustainable district unable to teach anyone about adaptive reuse? The statements made by many commenters, although I'm sure authentic to them, show that they have no idea uh, from a teacher's perspective, they're already gonna be moved into a different building. They're not even teaching in the history building. All of those rooms are replaced in the discovery building. We're not even talking about normal classrooms here. So they don't have anything to complain about. The students and teachers complaining about it being hot. When you adaptively reuse a building, you install air conditioning. These are all non-issues, but clearly they've been conveyed to the staff and students as, as issues falsely. Um, the plan's been set in stone, except for everything that the district wanted to change. Phase three was the library. It didn't even become the, the, the academies until 2019. Everyone speaking in the presentation tonight is getting paid to tear it down. The Conservancy has not been allowed to present the other side to the school board or the teachers or the students. Um, all the labs were supposedly built in 2015 when we had opened the innovation building and that was going to accomplish our 21st century 
lab space. If the uh, academies require labs, that should just be shifted to the innovation building because- the speaker's time is up. I urge you to support adaptive reuse because uh, residents are not wanting to fund another bond after you destroy our historic resources. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew Espinosa, followed by Amy Bisson and then Tom Larmore. Hi, um, my name is uh, Matthew Espinosa. I graduated Santa Monica High School um, in 2017. Um, I am here today to speak um, on behalf of a student perspective. Um, personally, uh, I was a I was very heavily involved in the music program at SAMO, um, which I benefited from a lot. I'm at UCLA now, actually um, still working with Kevin McKeown um, since elementary school. Um, and I think that moving forward on the history building project is beneficial to our students um, because we are trying to adapt to the future. Um, like I said, I was very heavily involved in music, but I think it's beneficial to have as many opportunities for students as possible. Um, like uh, Dr. Shelton was speaking on earlier, having um, programs for you know mock trial, uh, engineering, the arts, like as much as we can um, is very beneficial. And I think I, I urge everyone to think about what our legacy can be from this. I don't personally think preserving a physical building outweighs excelling our students with uh, their academics. Um, so thank you for allowing me to come and speak. Thank you very much. Thanks for waiting for so long. Um, Amy Bisson, followed by Tom Larmore and then Zachary Geitzik. Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Amy Bisson and I wear many hats. I'm a parent of an 11th grader. I'm a Sam High alumni and I'm a teacher at Sam High year 23. Um, I'm also a member of the Facilities District Advisory Committee and the Sam High Campus Planning Committee. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to address the removal of the history building and the Sam High Campus Plan. I wanna start by saying I heard the plan to remove the history building, I was heartbroken. I uh, taught in that building for over 10 years I have fond memories of, as a student of Mrs. Grant's English class and Mr. Jimenez's economics class. Um, it's where I first met my husband. Um, <laughs> all sentimental issues and do not relate to education today. The history building is really old. The rooms are tiny, which means you cannot move desks around or find common areas in which to do cooperative learning. The building is simply not conducive to education in the 21st century. As a teacher, I am excited about the Discovery Building and the planning for their exploration building. The removal of the History Building will open up, open up campus to make it more cohesive, uniting the many areas of campus. There are going to be additional outdoor spaces, both for congregation and for educational purposes, and lots of green spaces. Our classrooms will be larger, providing the students with opportunities to work in groups and to engage in the curriculum engage in the curriculum in different, more meaningful ways. Furthermore, I'm super excited about um, the mock courtroom that is being designed in the government pathway. Students will participate in panel discussions, debates, mock trials, and so much more. This makes the curriculum more meaningful to students, which increases engagement and improves student skill building. So while I will be sad to see the history building removed, the new building will provide opportunities for generations of students that our current students do not currently have. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Tom Larmore, Zachary Geitzik, and then Naomi Seligman. Good evening, uh, board members. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak on this matter. Um, I've been a supporter of the district in a variety of ways over the last uh, 30 or 40 years. Uh, as uh, members of the Financial Oversight Committee and um, uh, co-chair of the Measure YY campaign and other bond and parcel tax campaigns. Uh, I did not attend Samo High, but I had two children who did about 30 years ago, one of whom just spoke just a few minutes ago. 
and uh, the history building was not uh, adequate then and it certainly hasn't improved with age. Uh, more importantly to me, I have two grandchildren who by my calculations will be class of 2032 and 2035 at uh, Samuel High. And uh, it's, I'm very excited to see these plans for improvement of the campus. And uh, for all the reasons that the supporters of this master plan have raised tonight, uh, I urge you to continue with phase three and one thing I might suggest to you is that when these buildings are complete, that you have a public open house for them so that the people who voted for the bond measures can see what their money is buying. And I think that's a, a bit of a, uh, it's a bit of a black box to the community. And even though they're very generous and always have been and probably always will be, I, I think it would go a long way to um, improving the district's image with people who don't know uh, who don't have kids in the schools. So I would uh, urge you to consider doing that uh, when it's appropriate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Zachary Geidzik, Naomi Seligman, and I believe Teague Waybright, I think what ran out of battery and couldn't stay on, but Teague, if you happen to be back, you're next, you're the third speaker. Good evening. Uh, my name is Zachary Geidzik, um, and I am a Santa Monica, a Santa Monica High School alumni and also a current Santa Monica resident. Please ignore the flying sharks around me. Um, the background's a little bit messy, and I thought this was slightly more festive and would bring a little bit of levity to the situation. Uh, so I hope you enjoy. Um, with that being said, I want to, full disclosure, I'm a um, member of the Ocean Park Association Board of Directors. I'm also field deputy at LLA County Supervisor Sheila Kuehl, uh, and I'm also a former board member for, of Climate Action Santa Monica. So I wanna touch on a few different things. First of all, the idea of adaptive reuse. I wanna commend the district for having an incredible adaptive reuse plan, because if you think about it, that's what we've been doing with this building for some 60 odd years. Um, since the most recent remodeling, we've been making it work. And it's not because the uh, building itself is so wonderful and so great and so amazing. It's because the teachers, the administrators, and the students have found ways to make it work. Uh, I was an M House student. I was actually part of the initial uh, class that you know, had redesign for the first time. And so M House meant that I was in uh, that building every single day, multiple periods a day. And I wanna show you, I have a little show and tell, this is the fan that every single kid in every single one of those classes made because it was a thousand degrees in those rooms. All the, It was awful, it was so hot. And somehow when it got colder, it was freezing. And it's incredible when you think about it because we live in Santa Monica, it doesn't even get that hot or that cold, but somehow that building made it that uncomfortable. Still, we were able to learn. Um, we were able to make that work because we had such amazing teachers and because Santa Monica Unified School District cares so much about its students and is so forward thinking in making that happen. Um, when I first heard about uh, this project and that uh, it was gonna be torn down, I thought, great, you know, I, I went there. I had all my classes there. I had my formative memories there, but it wasn't good for teaching students. You know, and I, I hear the uh, arguments that it could be adaptively reused, but when we actually look at the math, what's actually going to take to adaptively reuse it, it's not gonna save anyone any money and it's gonna cost a lot more. And in the meantime, it's the kids who are gonna suffer because of that. Uh, and so I urge the, the uh, board to go ahead, tear that building down and build a better one. Thank you. Naomi Seligman, Teague Waybright, if you happen to be here, then Nina Fresco. Good evening, Santa Monica board members. Um, my name is Naomi Seligman. I am a member of the SEP steering committee. I have spent my career fighting for the underserved, working with educational agencies um, and a whole range of other progressive, aggressive advocacy movements to ensure equity in our country and our municipalities. Um, I am asking you, urging you to please move forward um, on the SAMO High campus plan and reject any efforts to delay it. I am dismayed and disappointed that our community members are spending their boundless energy 
to help our, instead of helping our students to make history, they're really fighting for this historic adjacent building. And I find that um, depressing in this moment of COVID when none of our students are actually in any of these buildings. I feel confident that Santa Monica um, has the best <laughs> intentions um, with our school district and that these buildings must serve those who most need it. Um, we must serve differently abled students that need easy and legal access. We need to make sure that our buildings are earthquake ready and that it is ready for any kind of climate change consequence. And that these are usable classrooms for the 21st century. I grew up, um, also I heard another speaker talk about growing up in a small New England town, a historic town. I did as well. And I grew up in those historic dilapidated public school buildings that I did not look forward to going to, that I was cold in the winter and hot in the spring. And I have, I'm a Santa Monica parent. I have three, um, three students, two who have been through um, the school system and one who is out of college and one currently in. And I have a third grader, Will Rogers, who will be going to SAMO. And I am enthusiastically sending him to our public schools. But I urge you not to move backwards, but to move forwards. Speaker's time is up and to affirm Sam Ohio's campus plan. Thank you. Oops, I'm muted. Thank you. Um, I'm assuming that Teague is not here. So I we'll don't move. don't see Teague. I don't see him, okay. Nina Fresco followed by Aaron Inetsugu followed by Ralph Metcher. Um, <coughs> don't see Nina. Let's see, let me search by last name. No. Who was after Nina? Sorry. Aaron in Itsugu. I do see Aaron. Hello. Thank you. Um, I've been a parent in SMMUSD since 2004. My oldest son graduated from Samuel High in 2016, and my youngest will graduate in the year 2032. I attended middle school at JAMS and my husband attended Will Rogers, JAMS and SAMO. We have deep roots and a deep appreciation for the educational experience our family has had as part of this community and I speak with this in mind. It's important that you move forward with the already approved plans for the SAMO High campus and replace the history building. Educators who care for our students tell us this is what's best for learning and makes 21st century instruction possible. We should listen. Many who are familiar with the building and the campus now would agree that it's long, decades long past due. Green space for our students will be maximized and the accessibility and flow through campus will improve when the history building is removed and the amazing but currently difficult to navigate Prospect Hill is revitalized. New teaching methods recognize that not all students learn in the same way and the planned exploration building is flexible and modern for the next generation of teaching and learning. One piece in the plan that's already in place as illustrated in real life now by the innovation and discovery buildings which already exist on campus. Nostalgia and the obvious disdain for positive change to the status quo which serves the elite and is a convenient excuse to continue blaming inequities on things out of our control. These things should not keep you from pursuing this plan and how it demonstrates innovative thinking by our educators and the vision that accompanies these plans in order to reach those students for whom the traditional schooling system does not effectively work. Please do what you already did when you voted previously to approve this plan. Do what is best for students and educators in this 21st century learning environment and move forward with the Samuel High Campus Plan with no further distraction or delay. It's the right thing to do for all students. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ralph Metcher, followed by Sherry Davis and then Claudia Sizer. <coughs> Excuse me. Good evening. You can hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, good evening to all of you. As most of you are aware, uh, but I assume not all, I recently stepped down after serving 13 years on this uh, Board of Education. And while I was a member, uh, because of my experience as an architect, I was part of the board's facilities subcommittee that met regularly with staff on projects as they were being organized and progressed through design and construction. So I'm very familiar with this project. It has been through a rigorous and open design process since 2015. 
This project is designed to provide all students with a phenomenal educational opportunity. You know, good architecture solves functional problems, but it also instigates creativity. This project will do just that. It is an open and flexible design that will engage students in their own education and futures. The alternative to maintain the history building would limit the ability of our students in the 21st century. It was built in haste after a natural disaster to provide a minimum level of enclosed space. It is the antithesis of what is before you tonight. This district's and the community's goal is to provide an equitable education for all of our students, to allow all of our young people to revel in what Martin Luther King called in his The Other America speech, the sunshine of opportunity. That opportunity includes the best facilities to enhance learning. Please vote to build this project. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph. Sherry Davis, Claudia Sizer, and then Louise Jaffe, if you're not gone. Um... Good evening, Board President Keene, Vice President Lieberman, Honorable Board Members, and Superintendent Drati. I'm Sherry Davis, proud parent of three Samo High grads and proud chair of Community for Excellent Public Schools because for the past two decades, Community for Excellent Public Schools, also known as SEPS, has been steadfastly dedicated to doing all we can as a group of passionate volunteers to bring resources to the public schools in Santa Monica and Malibu, including fighting hard to pass the facilities bond measures that allow you to envision how to transform our campuses to meet the needs of students. SEPS supports the Samo High Campus Plan because it was created by educators and innovative designers and experts in educational facilities to bring Santa Monica High School into the future. It has been approved multiple times over the past five years, fulfilling the accountability and required processes that the community expects and demands. With this in mind, we urge you to proceed with phase three, including demolition of the history building to enable the full realization of the exploration building. We are almost a quarter of the way through the 21st century. We need facilities that encourage equitable, creative, uplifting learning experiences. The spaces where students engage in education matter. The new dimensions of the Samuel High Campus in phase three will meet the educational needs of students in myriad ways the existing building just can't, and trying to do so now would be a waste of time and taxpayer money. Students in the envisioned Samuel High buildings and outdoor spaces will be inspired in ways that will help them imagine and prepare for their futures. Please continue on the path you have already charted. It is what is best for students in Santa Monica and for our community today, tomorrow, and far into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Um, that takes us to Claudia Sizer, and then I believe Louise Jaffe had to leave. So after Claudia will be Joan Krennic and then Noah in Itsugu. Don't see Claudia. I saw Daniel about 30 seconds ago, but I don't see either of them on now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me see if Daniel Louise. further down the list, but I have Claudia now. Yeah, I don't, I don't see either. And let me look up. Louise, Jaffe, I'm not seeing either. Yeah, I think Louise had to go. Okay. Um, Joan, why don't we, while you look for others, let's see, uh, Joan Krennic, Noah Inetsugu, and then Patty Braun. Okay. Hi. Um, it's been a long night and I don't want to repeat everything that's been said. I, I do want to clarify a couple things. Um, you know, I've very been, been very frustrated by a lot of the comments that are on social meeting with regards to our school board and uh, their, what have they done with $1.3 million kind of comments that it's so frustrating. Um, in the last 20 years, I've been a parent in this district and I've been really impressed at all the things that have been done over the last 10, 15 years. It's been a lot of movement. Obviously there's been major improvements at Malibu, middle and high schools, Jams and Lincoln. We've got the innovation building um, and soon the discovery building, a complete rebuild of Edison Elementary School, windows, paint, floor and door projects at all campuses, fire alarm and accessibility upgrades at all campus and HVAC installations almost gonna be completed in the spring. So. 
the school board has done a lot. They've committed to a lot and they've moved us forward in a lot of ways. And I'm really excited about that. Um, it also can't be said that the school board hasn't been um, very transparent with what it's been doing. These things have been voted. The Samuel High Campus Plan and the EIR were both approved unanimously by the school board. And that's very important to know. Um, with regards to whether this would be a brief pause, it's not, I don't think it would be a brief pause. I think it's gonna be a, a long-term project to look at what would, how this would work and whether the history building could be adaptively reviewed. We would then probably have to completely redo the Samuel High Campus Plan and resubmit the ER, which would result in a big delay in implement, in implementing these phase three projects, which I think are so important for our school. So it's not just a little, let's just check this out and that's not being fair because you're not checking it out. It's a complicated process. So I urge you, we, this has been done, it's been adopted, plans have been designed, a lot of time and effort's been put into it. These are fabulous projects. Trying to save this building that is questionable whether it could even be saved could delay this for a long time and years. So. I encourage you to move forward clearly. A lot of people tonight agree. These are great programs. These are our kids. And I don't think this building, particularly with the footprint and where it's located in our campus is a smart thing for us to try to save. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Uh, Noah Inatsugu, Patty Braun, and then Eve Dubin. Hi, uh, I'm Noah Inatsugu and I'll be speaking on behalf of my grandmother, Barbara Inatsugu. A well-functioning democracy is based on community engagement. And we know there will always be people who agree with your decisions and people who don't. That's democracy. As some of you know, I worked in the superintendent's office for almost nine years. During that time, when I saw something questionable, I questioned it. The Brown Act was my passion, and I became known as the Brown Act Monitor. So when I hear arguments or accusations about public process that are questionable, I feel compelled to say something. I've reviewed materials related to the Samo High Campus Plan. Press releases, news articles, agenda items, work, workshop agendas, superintendents' messages, and plan summaries. I believe that the information was available and it was public, and there were a variety of opportunities for public input over time. The fact is that the Brown Act comes with both rights and responsibilities, as does democracy itself. When the school district makes important information available, that is part of the public's right to know and part of the district's responsibility to provide. At the same time, it is also the public's responsibility to proactively inform themselves and speak up when they disagree, while the issue is in process, not after when decisions have been made. The Samo High Campus Plan was developed in 2015-2016. Plan development and design were well publicized, presented to the board in July 2016, and at multiple public meetings, and clearly included the demolition of the history building. The environmental impact report was given to the city, sent to the State Office of Historic Preservation, advertised a newspaper, presented at a publicized community meeting, and after a year-long process was certified unanimously by the board in February 2019. Throughout the review process, no formal complaints were received, yet now there is an outcry. This is, plan, uh, this is a plan based on the learning needs of our children, cognitive and physical, and the teaching needs of our teaching staff. Tonight's discussion item has become part of your due diligence as a board and provides another public forum to present, clarify, and discuss. My family and I look forward to the Samo High Campus plan moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Noah and Barbara. Uh, Patty Braun, Eve Dubin, and then Sonia Fox Sultan. Thank you. 